and welcome to nearly 8 hours of MERNstack tutorials and instruction. This video is made up of 13 tutorials that build upon each other much like the chapters of a book. Throughout the lessons in this video, I will mention links being available in the description below. I've compiled all of these links into one GitHub resource that you will find in the description. Hi, I'm Dave Gray, and I'm the creator of these MERNstack project tutorials. You can subscribe to my YouTube channel for more tutorials like this one. You can also follow me on Twitter, and if you're feeling generous, you can even buy me a cup of coffee. Let's get started learning the MERN stack with Chapter 1. What is the MERN stack? MERN is an acronym that uses the first letter of four complementary technologies. M is for MongoDB, E is for ExpressJS, R is for React, and N is for Node.js. So if the MERN stack is full stack, that leads us to ask, what is full stack? And why is the MERN stack considered to be full stack? A full stack application means it requires code that runs on the server and code that runs in the browser. The code that runs on the server is referred to as the back end, and the code that runs in the browser is referred to as the front end. The front end and the back end are typically two completely separate code repositories. In a large enterprise full stack project, there may be a team of developers that work on the front end and another separate team of developers that work on the back end. As a full stack developer, you should be able to work on both the front end and the back end if needed. The back end for the MERN stack is a REST API. A REST API, also known as a RESTful API, is an interface that two computer systems use to exchange information securely over the internet. The back end will receive requests from the front end. Those requests can be classified as CRUD operations. CRUD is another four letter acronym like MERN. The letters of CRUD stand for create, read, update, and delete. These terms also indicate which type of HTTP request methods will be used in the application. For example, POST relates to CREATE, GET relates to READ, PATCH and PUT requests relate to UPDATE, and DELETE has an exact match. Hopefully, all of that information was not only an intro, but also somewhat of a review, because this is not a beginner's tutorial series. I already have many beginner's courses available, and I recommend those courses as prerequisites to this series if you have not already completed them. Specifically, I suggest my Node.js course before the first lessons of this MERN series, where we're going to build the backend REST API. I also suggest completing my React course, my Read course and my React login series playlist before the lessons in this course where we build the front end React app. I'll put links to all of these suggested prerequisites in the description along with any links to resources and source code for this MERN series. We're going to build a Tech Notes app for a small computer repair shop, specifically Dan D's repair shop. So our stakeholder is Dan D, or full name Dan Davidson, but he goes by Dan D. And this isn't the type of project where I'm going to give you a tour of the full project before we begin. We're more taking a real world approach here for this project. And to do that, we start by gathering some user stories from our stakeholder, Dan D. I've got VS Code open, and I've already done a preliminary interview with Dan D, our stakeholder for the TechNotes project, and I've come up with 20 user stories that Dan wants. Now, if you've never done an interview for user stories, you need to think that the person you're interviewing with will probably describe what they want as a user, but they're not that technical. So it can be difficult to get those technical requirements out of that interview. And of course, that does take practice. So I definitely wanted to start the project with this, just so you can see the highlights that I've organized for this. And we can derive our technical requirements from the descriptions that I have received from Dan D. So the main goal for this application, the first thing Dan told me is he wants to replace his current sticky note system. He has a small computer repair shop, and right now they use yellow sticky notes to write the problem and they slap it on the side of the computer or whatever other technology, an iPhone, whatever somebody brings in, and it goes on their shelf. And that's their whole system. And he knows they need to get a better system than that. So that's what this TechNotes program's main goal is, is to have a 
local database, something they can refer to and everybody knows what everybody else is working on and Dan can manage the whole thing. Uh, the second thing he wants is just a public facing web page with basic contact info. Again, he's from a small town, small computer shop. He doesn't need anything extra for his website. He just basically wants it to be a business card. And we're okay with that because we want to focus on building this back end application for Dan. Okay, he wants to add an employee login to the notes app because he doesn't want just anybody to be able to access it. He just wants his employees to access it. And then he wants to provide a welcome page after the login, thinks that would just be nice to, uh, of course, show the username, maybe the current day, time, and of course, what they have to work on or what's available to them, and maybe their current uh, level of the administration, whether they're an employee, a manager, Dan has at least one manager, and then he's the admin, of course. He wants easy navigation. He wants to display the current user and assigned role at any time throughout the application. And then he wants to provide a logout option, of course. Uh, he wants to require users to log out or log in at least once per week. So that is a big requirement that we need to think about when it comes to authorization. Again, it's not a public facing site. It's not a financial site. It doesn't need ultimate security, but he wants some security, but he doesn't want his employees to have to log in all the time either. So we need to think about that with the authorization. He wants to provide a way to remove employee access as soon as possible, Possibly he fires someone and needs to remove that access so they do not disrupt the notes application. Uh, notes are assigned to specific employees, so everybody has their own responsibility. Notes have a ticket number, title, note body, created and updated dates. Notes are either open or completed. Notes can be employees, managers or admins. Notes can be deleted by managers and admins only. So that's a consideration when we're applying the roles and permissions of the application. Anyone can create a note because a customer may come in to check in and uh, Dan doesn't know who may be at the counter, but they all need to be able to check in and create a note for a customer. Employees can only view and edit their assigned notes. However, managers and admins can view, edit, and delete all notes. So that's another thing. Thing with the roles and permissions. Only managers and admins can access the user settings and only managers and admins can create new users. And then desktop mode is the most important because that's where they'll be using it, but it should also be available in mobile. Now notice this is a markdown file that I created a checklist in. If you're not that familiar with markdown files, they end with a .md and that's also what the readme files for GitHub are usually created with. Now in Visual Studio Code, I can preview this file by pressing Control Shift and the letter V and we can see this markdown file as it would appear possibly on GitHub or somewhere else and the nice thing is we can also use it as a check well it's not checking right now let me go back and if we put an X in here it would check but then also we can preview this a different way with Control K and then just press the letter V and now let's look at this and we have this on the right and the edit on the left. And now if I check this, yes, it does check. And we see the X over here. So you can work with these markdown files within Visual Studio Code. And they're sometimes very useful for checklists. So I just wanted to highlight that fact as well. But those are our user stories. And we'll create our technical requirements from these descriptions. Go ahead and create an empty folder for your backend code for this MernStack project for TechNotes. And then if you do not already have it, I sure hope you do, but if you don't, install Node.js from nodejs.org and you can download that right on the homepage. And they have currently, as of the making of this video, 16.16 .16 LTS is recommended for most users. Of course, get whatever the most current is. That should give you NPM and Node. I already said I hope you do because again, this is not for beginners. You might get through today's lesson but I don't feel like you will be comfortable and get that far if you're an absolute beginner. Go back to that Node.js course if you are. Now, after you've installed Node and NPM, or maybe you already have them, you can control backtick inside of Visual Studio Code, and it should open up a terminal window. You can check your versions as well by typing node-v, 
it says I have 1616. I can type npm-v as well because that also installs and we need that and it's currently 8.15.1. So today we're going to build the back end or at least start building the back end REST API for this MERN TechNotes project. And that will use Node, Express, and Mongo. So three of the four technologies in the stack. So what can we take away from these user stories already? Just the basic general thing that we would need for our server is we need to be able to create notes. And as we mentioned in here, view, which would be read as related to CRUD, edit, and that would be update, delete, and then there's also the ability to create notes as well. So we need to perform all CRUD operations for notes and also for users as we read through that. So we know our basic REST API is going to need to complete the CRUD operations for both notes and for users, and it's eventually going to need to support authentication, although we'll do that last. We want to get the application working first and then apply the authentication as the last step. So we're now ready to get our server up and running in Node.js. And to do that, I'm going to once again open up the terminal window with control and backtick. Then I'm going to type npm init and dash y, which will help it avoid all of the questions it usually wants to ask. And we can see some of that being completed here. And after we did that, we get a package JSON file. Now this is where our dependencies will be listed. And I need to install two dependencies today. So I just opened up the terminal window again. I had it full screen. But inside of the terminal window to install these dependencies, I'm going to use npm and then type i for install. And then I want to install Express, which is one of our MERN stack technologies. And then I'll just press Enter. And I will let that install, and we should see it listed here as a dependency inside of our package JSON. After that, there's a dev dependency, which is different from a normal dependency because we'll only use it during development. So I'll type npm i for install again, and then I want node mon, M-O-N at the end, dash capital D, and that makes this a development dependency only. Nodemon will let us run our code, and as soon as we save the changes, it will continue to run our server with those updated changes, so it's very useful. Okay, after we've applied both of those, we should be able to close out the terminal once again. I'm going to scroll to the top of the package JSON, and you can see it probably named your project, whatever you named your folder. Mine's in lesson one. It's version 1.0.0, that's fine. Let's go ahead and put a description in here and say tech notes MERN project. After that, we're going to use a server.js file. This is really just kind of preference. Uh, Index.js is what it defaults to. And then for scripts, I'm going to go ahead and remove this test script. And instead, I'm going to put in a start script and there I'll have node space server. A comma after that, because this is an object, I'm going to type dev, and then I'm going to have node mon space server. So we'll use node mon during development, and that's the script that will go ahead and let us start node mon. One other thing I like to do right at the beginning, so I don't forget, is create a git ignore file. We haven't initialized git for our repository yet, but we could at any point. And this is dot git ignore. And inside of the git ignore, we list the node modules because we do not want to send those to GitHub or wherever we might keep our code repository. That is this huge folder here that installed when we added some dependencies. And there's no reason to send that up to the code repository. So we create this git ignore file so it's ignored and not sent along with the other code. Okay, now that we've completed those things, let's create our server.js file. At the top of our server file, we'll define express, and we'll set this equal to require, and we'll just require express right inside of there. Underneath that, we need to define the app. So we'll say const app, set that equal to express, and we'll call express. And then I'm going to define a constant called port. And this will help set what port we are running our server on in development, but also when we deploy it somewhere. So here we'll get a .env port if the place we would deploy it 
would have a port number saved in the environment variables, then it would grab that. Otherwise, we're going to run it here locally at port 3500. Okay, that's the initial imports. Now let's just tell our app to start listening. So we'll say app.listen, and then we'll pass in the port, and then we have a function, and in this function we'll say console.log, and we'll go ahead and make a template literal here. We'll say server running on port, and inside of this we can pass in our value for port. Let's go ahead and save our server file. Let's press control back tick to open up the terminal window again. And now we can type NP, let me get lowercase, npm run dev. And after I press enter, notice our server has started running. This is the console for Node.js and it says server running on port 3500. It's not really doing anything. If we sent a request there, we wouldn't have any luck but the server is up and running with just those few lines of code. Let's not stop there though. Let's go ahead and make our servers uh, serve a few bits of information to us. And the first thing we need to do for that is import path from the Node.js uh, system. So there we'll say require path. And after we have path, now we can go ahead and use it here in the body of our server file and we're going to say app.use, and we're going to listen for the root route, just the slash, which would normally be the root or the index of a web page. And here we'll say express.static, and then we'll use path.join, which is a method of path, and then we have two underscores and dir name, which is a global variable that uh, Node.js understands, and it says look inside of the folder that we're in. After that, we'll put a comma, and then say look inside of the slash public folder. We're telling Express where to find static files like a CSS file or other resources like an image that we would use on the server. Now if we save this, it won't be able to find that if something was looking for it because we haven't created it. But notice Nodemon went ahead and restarted and we're still running on port 3500. So now let's go ahead and come over here to the file tree and create that public folder. And inside the public folder, I'm going to create a CSS folder. Now normally with our REST API, we're just going to be receiving requests and sending back JSON data that would be requested and we'll be receiving JSON data. However, a REST API can still have a splash page. It could still also return information about requests that cannot be fulfilled. And so we can at least set that much up as we start. Now inside the CSS folder, you might guess, we'll go ahead and create a style.css file. Not being a CSS tutorial, I'm just going to paste in some basic styles here. I'll close the terminal quickly so you can see everything on one screen. We're importing in a Google font. We've got a basic reset and just some styles on the HTML and body. Nothing big, but just a few styles there so we could have something on the splash page for the REST API or possibly a 404 page when a resource is not found. Let's go back to the server JS now and let's put in another line of code that says app.use and we'll once again look at that root route and now we'll say require and we're going to look for a routes folder and then a root file. And now we crashed the app and you can see Nodemon said that because we do not have a routes folder and we required it in the file. So let's go ahead and create that routes folder. And then inside of routes, we're going to need to create a file named root.js. Inside of root, we need to require express again. So we'll say const express, we'll set this equal to require express. Now after that, we need to define a router. So we'll say const router and we'll set this equal to express.router with a capital R to start the word router. And then we need the path once again. So we'll say const path and we'll require path from Node.js. And then after we have required those three things, we're ready to say router dot get. So this would be a get request that relates directly back to our HTTP methods. 
And the nice thing about Express and these routes is they recognize regex. So we can use a regex here. And the first thing I'm going to type is the caret, and that says at the beginning of the string only. And then we'll put a slash, and then the dollar sign, which says at the end of the string only. So that means this will only match if the requested route is only a slash, and that would be for the root. But then I'm going to put in a pipe, which is an or for regex, and then I'll have slash index, because maybe they would request more than just the slash as they put that in. And after that, I'm going to have Oh, I put in a quote. That's the reason we're seeing red right now. I want to remove that quote because all of this is going to be inside this string. So the quote comes at the end. But then after the index, here I'm going to make the HTML optional. So they could request just the slash or maybe just the slash index without the .html or the user could request the full index.html, which would also work. I got an extra parentheses in there. Let's put the comma there. Then we'll have a request and a response for our function. And then inside the function, we will send a file back. So it'll be response.send file. Then we'll say path.join, and we'll use that dir name, directory name, a uh, variable that Node.js recognizes. And now we need to tell it where to find the file. And the file's going to be up out of the routes folder, so that's what the two dots indicate. And then we're going to tell it to look into a views folder. And then we're going to have it look for the index.html file. And that's quite a bit there, but that should wrap it up. And I need that parentheses there at the end. So there I've got the syntax correct. And we've got our router.get, and it will get the index.html file if it matches any of those three. We just now need to create the views folder and the index.html file. But before we leave this file, we need to say module.exports and set that equal to router. And now this file is complete. Also notice our server is once again running. Nodemon restarted it as soon as the errors were fixed. And it's not crashing even though we're telling them we have a file that we don't because nobody's requesting it right now. So we can go ahead and do that. This is not a require. The require is actually what crashed before when the required thing was not available. But now this does not, of course, crash the application. Okay, now we'll go over here to our file tree once again, create a new folder. We'll call this views. And then inside of the views folder, We'll create a new file and call it index.html. I'm going to type an exclamation mark, which is an Emmet abbreviation in VS Code. Then I can press tab and we instantly get the foundation of an HTML page. Here I'm going to replace the title where it says document with TechNotes API. And then inside of the body, I'm just going to use an H1 element and type tech notes. And then we need to bring in the CSS. So that is a link. Rel is a style sheet. And then the href is going to be set to CSS slash style dot CSS. And then we close out that link tag. And actually, I think I need the slash close. There we go. And after we save that, now it can find this CSS because that is a static public file that we set up earlier with our route back here in the server. So we didn't have to put in the full file path for that. It's just one of those things that's available inside of this public route. Our server is still running. Let's drag VS Code to the left. I'll go to my new tab. We want to go to localhost colon 3500 and press enter. And there we get our TechNotes homepage at the root. However, we could request something that doesn't exist and we might not get the best results. If I put in slash Dave, we just get the basic express response, cannot get Dave. So let's fix that by going ahead and taking care of basically 404 errors, and those are for resources that are not found. Let's start by creating a 404 page inside of the views since we're already there. So another new file, I'll type 404, dot html again with the emmet abbreviation to get the foundation here and we'll just say 404 error or we could say 404 not found i think that's a little bit better than error but then inside of an h1 we'll just say sorry 
and then we can put a paragraph as well and inside the paragraph we'll say the page or let's say the resource you have requested does not exist and of course we once again need to bring in the link and that would be rel equals style sheet and href equals css slash style dot css and close that out and save let's go back to the server and let's handle anything that's not found we want to put this after all the other routes and of course i'll put it before the app listen for this server but here we'll just say app.all instead of app.use and now we'll listen for this asterisk which essentially means all everything that reaches it to app.all will be put through this instead of being routed to anything that's above so that it's the catch-all that goes at the end so then we'll once again have our request and our response and we'll have our function now. And the first thing we know is the status is a 404. So we can set that right away, although we're not sending the response yet. And now we can look at the headers from the requests that come in and determine what type of response to send. So we can say if the request has an accepts header that is HTML, then we can base our response on that. So here inside of this, if we'll say res.send file, and now this will basically be what we did before to send our index.html, but we're going to send our 404. And of course we have to route to it correctly. So now we're at the server level, so we don't need to go up out of a folder. We're just going to go down into the views folder. And from there, we're going to get the 404 HTML file. After that, we can put an else if, and here we can say request.accepts, and let's look for JSON, which would be very common sent to a REST API. So if there's a JSON request that wasn't routed properly and didn't get stopped by any of the expected routes, this would be the response. We'll say response.json. And now inside of this, we'll have a message, and then we'll say 404 not found. Very basic, generic message. I guess I was using single quotes before. Control D to select both of those. Switch those to single just to stay consistent. And finally, we'll have our last else that will be sent no matter what if uh, HTML or JSON was not matched in the accepts header. And here we'll say response.type text is fairly safe just about everything can receive text and we will send once again our 404 not found now we'll test this out in the browser and as you might expect we should get HTML back so if I'll highlight this and just press enter again now we get sorry the resource you have requested does not exist so we got our 404 page when it didn't match any of the other routes we are well on our way to having our rest api up and running for our full stack mern stack application what is middleware middleware is just one or more functions that are placed in the path of requests that are received by our backend api middleware can add additional functionality to our backend rest api Middleware can also apply some preliminary processing to requests before they get to the controller where the request processing will be completed. We'll be adding three types of middleware today, built-in middleware, custom middleware, and third-party middleware. Let's start today with a couple of quick corrections. I'm on the nodejs.org site. In the first tutorial, I said the latest version of Node to use, and really what it stands for, LTS, stands for long-term support. I had latest on the brain from installing the latest packages, but I just wanted to highlight that as I've been asked about that a couple of times. Also, in the code from lesson one, which is our starter code, by the way, for lesson two, just always go back one previous lesson, and that completed code will be the starter for the next. I just wanted to highlight that in path join, as you see that I'm using right here, path.join, 
you do not have to use a slash. And notice I didn't do that when I talked about the views directory here, but I did it with public here. So I was just a little inconsistent. You can remove that if you want to. And if you see me using a slash some other time inside of path.join, well, that just means I'm not really thinking about it. It won't hurt either way, but you do not have to use it, and I will try to stay consistent. Okay, with those corrections out of the way, let's get started by talking about middleware. And again, we're in that starter code, which is the completed code from lesson one already. So we already have our server set up and now we're going to add middleware. And we've already added one piece of middleware that we really didn't discuss, and that was built-in middleware. Express.static is middleware, and it's telling our server where to grab static files. And I was explicit here when I put this in. We put in the app dot use and then we said slash and then we have express dot static and I used path join to get the directory name which is this global variable and then I said in the public folder which we created over here you might see this used without quite so much explicit information which you can also do so I'm going to show you that right now you might see it without the slash here and you might see it without the path join so it might just be like this and then I can remove one of those parentheses, I believe. And this would still work because it's relative to where your server file is or your index.js if you didn't rename it to server.js like I did. But public is relative, so it can find the public file right here. And this will work if you want to do that. I like to leave mine with a little bit more explicit information like you see right here and like I did in the first tutorial. So I wanted to highlight that. We've already added one piece of built-in middleware, but now we can add some more. And the other one that we need is the ability to process JSON in our application. So we're going to say app dot use, then we're going to have express two s's dot json, and we need to call that. And that will let our app receive and parse that JSON data, and that's what we expect to use. Now with that complete, you can see how easy it is to add built-in middleware to your application. But now we need to go ahead and create some custom middleware. So I'm going to create another folder, and let's first, well, I'm going to create two folders. Let's first create the logs folder because a server needs to be able to log some things, errors, possibly requests, and uh, whatever we want to log. So we'll have that logs folder. We're also going to create, not inside the logs folder though, so I need to make sure I'm out of that. Let's create a middleware folder as well. And then while I'm thinking of it, inside our git ignore file, let's add the logs directory because we don't want to send those logs up to GitHub. They'll be development logs, but even in the future with another repository, the logs wouldn't really help our code base, so they don't need to be sent to the repository at all. So I'll include that in the git ignore. That said, let's go to the package JSON file. I'm going to change the name here to lesson two, but now we need to add some dependencies that we're going to use as we write some custom middleware. So I'm going to press Control and the back tick. Then I'm going to type npm i and date dash fns and also uuid, so two separate packages, and we can add them on the same line like that. And they will install shortly, and when they are finished, we should see them listed in our dependencies. And now we do. So we have date fns, we already had express, and now we also have uuid. And now inside our middleware directory, let's create a new file, and I'll name this logger.js. At the top of logger, we need to destructure, so I'm going to destructure format, and I'm getting that from our date FNS dependency that we just required. After that, I'm going to do one other destructure here, and this is going to be v4, and I'm going to rename it uuid, and that's going to be coming from UUID, but I know that looks a little weird, but that is the at least the last I looked, that is what they were currently recommending. So we're getting V4 when we destructure and then we're renaming it UUID. After that, I need the FS module for the file system. So that comes directly from Node. It's already built in, so we'll have require FS. Now I'm going to do Shift Alt and the down arrow, but I'm not going to leave it the same. This needs to be FS promises, 
And at the end of our require, we also need to put dot promises. And then I need that path module again. So const path equals require path. Now we have everything imported. Let's start by creating a helper function called log events. And this will equal an async function that receives a message and also a log file name. Now inside this function, I'm going to copy and paste a couple of things I typed earlier just because they are template literals that have several different variables in here and it's easy for me to create a typo. So I'd rather just go over these with you. I'm creating a date time variable and I'm using that format function. Notice this is a template literal and inside this template literal, I've got a new date object, and then I'm formatting it, and this goes from the docs of the date FNS package that you can find at npmjs.com, I believe, is where you could search that up and find those docs, and it will also link to the GitHub repository. But there are different ways you can format the date, and I'm going with year, month, day, and then I've got hour, minute, second. So anytime I'm creating a log message, I'm getting not only the date, but also the time. And then I have a log item here. And for this log item, I'm passing in this date time that we just created. And notice the slash T's. Those are tabs, which will make the logs easy to import into Excel or something similar if I wanted to. I'm calling UUID here, which creates a specific ID for each log item, which might be handy as well if we were to export that. And then we have the actual message that is passed in. This last slash in creates a new line. So each log item gets its own line in the log file. Okay, let's go ahead and create the rest of this function now. So we've got a try, and here we're going to check if the directory exists first. If not, and we try to save there, we'll have an error. So we say not, which is the exclamation mark, then fs dot exists sync. And then inside here, I'll use path dot join, and we'll use the global dir name variable, and then we'll go up out of the folder with two dots, and then we'll look for a logs folder. And we're saying if that doesn't exist, then we'll need to create it. So we'll say await fs promises, and then that's dot mkdir for make directory. And then we'll just need that same directory that we we're looking for. If it doesn't exist, that's what we're creating. So I'm just going to copy that and paste it right in there. So now we have either created the directory or it already existed. And now let's say await fs promises and we'll append file because we are appending to our log file or creating that log file as well if it doesn't exist, which is what will happen here. This is once again that same path. So I'm going to paste it in again, but we're not finished after that. I need a comma after logs, and I need to say the log file name, and then we can have the parentheses, and then we need to specify our log item. I'm going to press Alt-Z because that's a longer line, so now we can see it wrapped down. So here's the append file. We provide the path. Oh, I've got two path joins. That's why it got a little longer. Let's go ahead and remove that. So now we provide the path, the directory name, two dots to go up out, logs, so we're in that logs directory, then the file name itself, and then the item to log to the file. Now after this, we'll just put the catch here, and I'm catching an error, and right now I'm just going to say console.log error. Now I'm going to scroll up, and we'll write the actual middleware here, so const logger. Middleware has a request, a response, and the ability to call next, so it can move on to the next piece of middleware. And here we'll put in log events. And actually, I'm going to copy this as well. I am just too susceptible to typos when it comes to those template literals with several values. So let's look at this log events, which is what we just created above. And we're passing in this template literal here that has the request method, a tab, the request URL, another tab, there should be tabs between all, and then the origin, what the URL, where the request originated from, and we're writing that all to the request log 
log, which is like a text file, but that's the convention for writing logs, and you can open it like a text file as well. So this would log every request that comes in. You might want to put some conditionals in there that would say, okay, only log it if it's not coming from our own URL or something like that, or only specific request methods, because this would get full very fast if you left it like this for your entire application. But I'll leave it there and leave that part up to you. Now we'll say console.log, and here I think I can manage to type in this template literal. It'll just have the request method, after that a space, and the request dot path. We'll see that in the log of Node.js here as we're running our server, and that could help us during development. After that, we just want to call next. So it moves on to the next piece of middleware or eventually the controller where the request would be processed. The logger, of course, would come first before those other things. And now let's add the module dot exports set that equal to we want to export both of these because we might use log events inside of an error handler as well. Now let's go back to the server.js file and we can import the logger we created. So we'll say const, we'll get the logger and that comes from our require. We'll look in our middleware folder we created and there should be the logger, there it is. Now we really want this logger to come before everything else. So we'll say app use logger. And we should be able to save that. I'm going to press control and back tick to get our terminal open. And then I'm going to type npm run dev to get our server up and running. It should start on port 3500. And you can see we're using nodemon. So as we make any changes, it should go ahead and restart. And it will give us this message. This is our console for Node.js. I'll drag this to the left and we'll go to the browser. We've got our local host 3500 where we should at least get our home page when we put in a request and we do. And we can now see the requests log here in the console. So we had two requests come in, both get requests, one for that root route and the other for the static file that we specified that was available in the public folder. So both of those were logged and now we should have a request log inside of our logs directory as well. I'll drag this over and we can see how this was logged. We have the date, the time, the specific ID of the request and the request and then the origin is undefined as we're here in our local development environment. Now we're ready to add one more piece of custom middleware. So let's create another new file inside of the middleware directory and we'll call this error handler.js. I'm going to close the terminal just so we don't have to look at that right now. And we'll start out by importing in that helper function that we created called log events. So that will equal require and we're in the same directory. So it should just come from logger. From there, we can create our error handler. And this is going to overwrite the default express error handling. And we can do that just by creating this middleware that starts with an error and then it also has the request, response, and next. And now inside of this function, this middleware, I am going to once again paste in a line that's just a little bit difficult for me to type without typos and we'll go over this but we're calling that log events function and it's a big template literal here I'm including the error name and message and then there's a tab and then it's just like the previous log events that we were logging so it has the request method the URL the origin and this is going to the error log file so error log dot log otherwise basically the same I'm also going to put console dot log and log the error dot stack. This will be a pretty large message inside of our console, several lines worth, but it will give us a lot of details about an error and tell it specifically where it is, which is always helpful. Then I'm going to define a status, and this is going to look to see if the response we receive up here as one of the parameters already has a status code set, and this is a ternary. So if it does have that status code set, then we'll just return that status code. If not, it's going to be a 500, which is a server error. And then we'll set the status to whatever our ternary determined, and then we'll have a response that is JSON data, and we'll say message, and then we'll have the error.message.
Let's not forget to do the module exports at the bottom. So we'll say module.exports, set that equal to error handler. And now back in the server.js file, we can import our error handler as well. So we'll say const error handler, and this will come from that middleware folder also. And this is from the error handler file. But now instead of using it at the top, like the logger, we want to use it at the very end, essentially, at least right before we tell our app to start listening. So here we'll say app use, and we'll pass in that error handler right there. Now we will test this out in a moment, but I also want to get started with our third party middleware now that we've written custom middleware. So let's go to the package JSON one more time, bring up the terminal. I'm going to press control C to stop the server temporarily. Type npm i and I need cookie parser. Our REST API is going to need to be able to parse cookies, and that's because we're going to use them in this MERN application. We can see we've added the dependency right up here, so I am ready to once again type npm run dev and keep the server running, and it will restart with changes. That's good, let's go back to the server.js. I'm going to scroll back to the top for the imports. So once we get up to the top, I'm going to import that cookie parser. We'll call this cookie parser in camel case. We'll set this equal to require cookie dash parser. And once we have that, it's just about as easy to apply as our built-in express JSON middleware. So we'll say app.use, and then we'll say cookie parser, and we call that. And now we'll be able to parse cookies that we receive as well. So that was very easy third-party middleware to add. However, I want to cover something a little more complicated that must be added every time, or at least a consideration, every time you create a REST API. So I'm going to drag the code to the left. I am going to go over here to the browser, and we're at google.com. I'll just press Enter to pull that up and then open up DevTools, clear out whatever warnings they have. And what I'm going to do here is type in a fetch right in the console and type in our development REST API. So localhost 3500. And now when I press enter, we get a cores error, a cores policy. That stands for cross origin resource sharing. And it says no access control allow origin header is there. This sends an options request, which is another type of HTTP request, much like a post, a put, a patch, a delete, and so on. And that options did not detect that header. This is really the first line of security. Also, Google should not be able to request information from our API, another resource at another URL, essentially, unless we say it's okay. So we have to enable cores for that to happen and pass this what is called a pre-flight request. So let's go ahead and do that. And we'll do it as if we were creating a public API first and then we'll secure it afterwards. So it's very easy to set it up as if it were a public API. So we'll go ahead and control backtick, control C to stop the server again. We'll type npm i cores, and it should install quickly, and we should be able to see that listed in the package JSON now as a dependency. So that's good. We'll control backtick again and npm run dev to start the dev server back up with nodemon. After we've done that, let's go back to the server.js and we need to import cores. So we'll say const cores equals require cores. And after we have that, it's just about as easy to apply as these others when we just want everything to be available to the public. We'll say app.use cores and we call cores. And now if we pull this back over to the left and we go back to Google, and we do control shift i to open up dev tools we've got our error here from the fetch let's try the fetch again and see what happens we get a promise pending because we're not really processing anything from the fetch and we expect the promise but there's no error that's because our api is now essentially available to the public so those that are 
at other origins can request resources from our API. Now what we want to do now is secure it so we only allow the origins that we want to access our API. And we can do that with cores options. So I'm going to control or close the dev tools, drag this back to the right, Visual Studio Code, full screen, and we need to create some cores options. We're going to do that by creating first a directory over here called config. And inside of config, we're going to create two files. The first one is allowed origins.js. Here we'll define our allowed origins, set this equal to an array, and now these will just be strings that will say what origins are allowed. And the first one we'll put in just for development will be where our React app will eventually be at and requesting data, and that's usually localhost 3000. After that, I'm making up a couple of uh, fictitious URLs here. I didn't register them. I don't think anybody else has either, but you never know. So I'm just saying https colon slash slash www.dandyrepairshop.com because that is our stakeholder for this project is Dandy and his repair shop. And then we'll also say HTTPS colon slash slash, and we'll just do this without the Ws. These are strings that need to match. So you would typically want to do both of these for any URL. So you'd have dandyrepairshop.com as well. These would be the local hosts that we would accept to access our REST API. And now we'll say module.exports equals allowed origins. And now we can use these when we create the cores options in the next file. So we'll create another file, coresoptions.js. I'll start by importing in the allowed origins that we just created. And it's nice to have those in a separate file unless we, if we want to refer to them somewhere else inside of the API as well. So that's why they're in a separate file to begin with. Now we'll say const cores options and this is going to equal an object. This is, again, third-party middleware. So we have to follow the rules they have set up for their options. And this is like a lookup object where we have the origin method here. And this is going to receive the origin and a callback function. And now inside of this function, we're going to check that allowed origins list. And then we'll say dot index of, and I said list, it's an array. Then we have the origin, and then we'll say if it's not equal to minus one. Now this would limit it to where only those in the array, only those origins, would be able to access our backend REST API. But then that would screen out other software like Postman that we might test our API with, or possibly desktop applications or anything else that didn't provide an origin. So you might also want to say or no origin. And this would go ahead and allow Postman and some other things to possibly access our REST API. So here, this is if it's successful, we'll say callback. The first uh, argument that is passed into the callback is an error object. So here we'll just say that's null because we don't have an error. The second is the allowed Boolean, either true or false. And yes, this is successful, so we'll say true. And then here we'll have the else where it fails. And now we'll have a callback and we'll use that first argument, which is an error. So we'll say new error and we'll say not allowed by cores. There's also some other options we can set inside of cores. One is credentials and we'll set that to true. Now this sets the access control allow credentials header. And if you did my Node.js for beginners course, we actually created separate middleware to set that header, which is kind of taking the long way around, but we learned a little more. Here, you can just set this option to true and it handles that header for you. So that's a great option to go ahead and set to true there. And then say options, success, status, and we'll set this to 200. I believe the default is 204, but there are some devices that have some problems with that, so you might just want to set that to 200. After that, we'll say module.exports, and we'll set that equal to cores 
options. Now I know I might get asked what devices would have a problem with the 204, but I believe in the documentation it says smart TVs, older browsers, things like that. We probably wouldn't run into it, but just setting it to 200 makes so we will not have any problems. Let's head back to the server JS and go ahead and apply these options now. So we need to import our cores options. So we'll say const cores options, set this equal to require and then we'll have our config folder, and then we'll have our cores options file. And then for cores options, we just pass them right into cores here. So once we've done that, our cores options are now set up. Let's go ahead and make sure the server's running. And yes, it's on port 3500 and running as expected. I'll drag VS Code over. I'll drag our browser back over and go ahead and open up DevTools once again. Let's go ahead and put in a fetch once again. And now we're blocked by cores as expected. And the reason is we're not allowing Google to access our resources. We're only allowing those URLs that we put in our allowed origins to access our resources at the REST API. So that's as expected. I'll close this. We'll come back to our server and let's see what happened with that error. And we did log the error stack to the console now. So let's look at this. It's fairly large here, but it gives us quite a bit of detail. We got the error not allowed by cores. So we logged the full error stack and then it gave all the other details, which can be quite a bit. But let's look at what else happened. We now have an error log because we had our error handler and let's look at what was logged in our error log. And now we had our error not allowed by cores there as well, and it came from google.com. Well, that's great. Everything's working as expected. We have added built-in middleware. We have added custom middleware, and we have added third-party middleware. It's added extra features to our REST API, and it will even do a little bit of preliminary processing to those requests that are coming in. So we are well on our way to completing the back end for our MERN stack project. MongoDB is a NoSQL database built with collections of documents. My Node.js course gives a deeper explanation of MongoDB, and I highly recommend that course as a prerequisite before you complete this tutorial. Our starter code today is available in the course resources. It's the completed code from Lesson 2 as we now begin Lesson 3 in this MernStack project series. We will be integrating MongoDB into our REST API today, but before we do that, there's a dependency that I want to set up in our existing code. You can see I've got the package JSON file open here. I'm going to change the name to lesson three and go ahead and save that. But afterwards I'll press control in the back tick and I'll pull this down a little bit so we can still see the dependency list or at least some of it there. I'll scroll that up. There we go. And I'm going to type npmi.env and hit enter. This is going to install the .env package. It doesn't take long, and now you can see it listed in the dependencies. This will let us use environment variables inside of our REST API. Now, environment variables are values that we want to use on the server when we deploy as well, but we will not want those stored in GitHub, so we'll set all of that up. Let's first start by going to server.js, and I like to put this right at the top, the very first line, and I'm going to put require.env, and then after that, I need to put dot config. And that allows us to use .env throughout our package. We won't need it in every file. We'll just put that right here, and we'll still be able to use environment variables in all of the files where we need them. Okay, after doing that, let's create a .env file. Now, it needs to be at the same level as the server JS here, so I'm just going to create that file, and it starts with a period instead of the word dot, and then it's env. Now you can see I'm using VS Code icons extension, and then it gets this little gear symbol here. And now we can put variables inside of here that we'll be able to pull out as environment variables. So just as an example of this, I'm going to type node underscore env and set this equal to development. 
Note, I don't need any quotes around development or anything else. This is just how you set them. You typically set these as all caps for these environment variables as well. So I'll save this and now back in the server JS somewhere here and I'll just put it right towards the top. I'm going to say console.log and now to pull a value out of the environment variables I'll say process.env and then we put the actual name of the variable. So I'm going to log that value to the console when we start up our server. So let's go ahead and start up the server. I'll do control backtick, then npm, I want lowercase here, npm run dev, and I'll pull this up. And let's see what we get inside of our console. And I had to scroll to see it there. So the development was printed before we got the server running on port 3500. But there is our environment variable printed to the console, just like we expected it to be with the console log statement. So now to keep this value or any values we store inside of the .env out of GitHub, we want to make sure to list that .env file right here inside of the git ignore file as well. Okay, now as we set up our free mongodb.com account, we're going to get a database URI string back that will let us connect to MongoDB and we'll want to store that in this .env file. So I'm going to put database underscore URI equals and this is where we'll put the connection string that we get from MongoDB. So the next chapter of this video is about five and a half minutes. I've got timestamps in the description and it's going to walk you through setting up a MongoDB database at mongodb.com. Now this clip is taken directly from my Node.js course because the process for setting this up hasn't changed at all. So just as you go through realize this about this MERN stack project that we're creating creating. You can name your project whatever you want, but please name your database TechNotesDB, and I'll type this out just so you can see it. So remember to name your database as you set this up as TechNotesDB with a lowercase t at the beginning, at least if you want it to match my code. So you'll have that, and then create your first collection and call it users, all lowercase. Now I'm going to go ahead and share that clip so you can go ahead and create your MongoDB account. If you already have that, if you already know how to do it, just skip this chapter in the video and we'll come back and we'll put our database URI right here inside of the .env file. Okay, we're at mongodb.com and I already have an account, so I'm going to choose sign in. If you don't have an account, you'll want to sign up for a free account, so you can just click try free. I'm going to click sign in and then it will take me to a page that probably uses my Google ID or allows me to log in with an email address. Yes, there it is. So you get those options. I'm going to log in with my Google email address or my Google account, and then we'll meet back up after you have your account or you've signed into your account. Okay, I'm signed into my account and I'm on the projects page where I can create a new project. And you see I already have one project here. Now if you're not on this page once you're signed in, just click the little leaf in the top left and it says view the organization home because that's where this is. So once you're there, you'll want to create a new project. And now you want to name the project. I'm just going to name this one Mongo Tuts short for tutorial and click next. And then it asks you to go ahead and set permissions or members. And it'll probably assign that to your default account to start out with. As you can see, I have project owner right here. So I'm going to click create project. With the project created, you can see I now have Mongo Tuts up here above database deployments. We need to build a database. And of course it gives you the big shiny button right in the middle to do so. So please click that. And then it gives you choices. And we're just going to go with free today. If you want to get one that you pay for, that's fine. I'm going to choose free over here on the right. And then it will say create a shared cluster. And right now, I'm just going to keep all the defaults. So free, shared, it has AWS, it has one of the USA regions for me because I'm in the US. You may want to pick a different one if you're not, and maybe it already defaults to something close to you. 
and then it just has these other default settings. And I'm going to go with all of that, even the default name here, cluster zero, and click create cluster at the bottom. Now it says new clusters take between one to three minutes to provision. So I'll come back when this is finished. My cluster zero has now been created and we're given this screen. So what we wanna do is click browse collections. We don't have any collections yet, so we get this and it says load a sample data set or add my own data. We're going to choose add my own data. With that, it asks for a database name and a collection name. So let's just call this company db and then we can call the collection name let's go with employees and i'll just keep that all lowercase company db is capital company and capital db at the end and i'll click create and with that mongo has created our company db database and our empty employees collection right here what we should do now is concern ourselves with database access. So let's create a user that can access this new collection and database that we have. So create a database user. We click the big button that says add new database user. And then it gives us password, certificate, and all of that. We'll just stick with password. And it put in some old information for me. Let's put in something different here. Let me go with uh, Mongo. Tut once again, and then for a password, I'm just going to, and we'll go ahead and show whatever the password is. I'll go with testing one, two, three, kind of like a mic check. Okay, so we've got Mongo Tut testing one, two, three. I think we'll keep all of the default options here, and we want the read and write to any database. And of course, I'll come back later and uh, delete this user, but for now, We'll use it for the tutorial and we'll click add user. And once we have the user, we need to go back to our cluster. So let's click Mongo Tuts. And that takes us back to our cluster. And it says we are deploying your changes, current action configuring MongoDB. So I'll give this just a second and then we're going to click connect. With the configuration now complete, let's go ahead and click the connect button it tells us we need to set up some security. This part is required, and what we're going to do is allow access from anywhere. We don't really know where we're going to host our back end yet, so this is good for development right now until we actually know what IP address we had. So let's just add in the zeros, and that means it's good from anywhere. We already created a user, so now let's click choose a connection method, and we're going to connect our application. This gives us a connection string, and this is what we want. Notice it's already put in the Mongo Tut user I created. Now I'm going to have to put in the password, including getting rid of the less than and greater than around the password. And then also I need to replace my first database with the company DB, which was the name we gave the database. So I'm going to copy this and we're ready to close out of this now and open up Visual Studio Code. Okay, you should now have your connection string from MongoDB. I'm going to paste mine in here, except I'll show you a difference. I'm going to press Alt-Z to get this code to wrap. You should have your username right here, and then you should have your password right here. Of course, I'm not going to show you mine, but here just in a second as we go away from the screen, I'll put mine in so mine continues to work as well as we connect to MongoDB. Notice I also have the tech notes database name right here inside of the string as well. So you can just match that pattern up to yours to make sure you have a proper connection string from MongoDB. We're back at the package JSON and we're almost ready to create our data models. But before we do that, we need to go ahead and import in one other package. And that package is called Mongoose. It's a library that really helps us communicate more easily with MongoDB. So I'm typing npm i mongoose and installing that as a dependency as well. It won't take long either. I can close out of the terminal and we'll now see mongoose listed here amongst the dependencies as well. So now in the file tree, I want to create a new folder and we'll call this folder 
models. This will store our data models. And now inside of the models directory, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call this use, I, I said new folder, a new file, and I'm going to call this user.js with a capital U. And this will be our user data model. The first thing I need to do is require mongoose. So I'll say const mongoose equals require mongoose. After that, we'll start creating a schema that will allow us to have a data model. And so we'll say const user schema, and we'll set this equal to a new mongoose.schema. And now that schema has a capital S when you put it after mongoose and the dot. Okay, inside of our user schema is where we'll have our data model. So we need to think about the different types of data that a user needs to store. Let's go back to our user stories quickly and we can look at some of these points in here to see or get an idea of what data our user needs. Now, of course, we need a username and a password, but let's talk about the rest. Let's look at number 13, for example. It says users can be employees, managers, or admins. So we also need user roles. And then let's look at number nine, and it says provide a way to remove employee access as soon as possible if needed. And really we should switch this to user access. And then underneath that, number 10 says notes are assigned to specific employees. That's true, but employee refers to a role really. So let's also say to specific users. Now this won't impact our data model for user, but it will for notes but we just got the terminology defined a little bit better by switching employees to users there. So what we do know is we need roles, as we see here in number 13, and also for number nine, provide a way to remove user access ASAP if needed. Let's give an active status, and that means users might be assigned to different notes, and we wouldn't want to delete a user if they still had notes assigned to them. So what we can do is disable a user by having an active status, basically Boolean data if they're active, true, and if not, false, and that would allow the admin or manager to remove user access ASAP if needed. Okay, with those changes made to the user story, and we've gone over that a little, now we're ready to define our model. So we'll say username, that's the first thing we need, and then this is an object as well, and here we'll say type, and this will be string type data. And then we can say it is required, and we set that to true. Now after that, let's put a comma, and then I'm just going to highlight this and do shift alt in the down arrow, and I'm going to switch this to password, and it's also string and also true. Now let's do that once again, shift alt in the down arrow, and we can put roles. But now we'll make another change here. Let's wrap this object that we have in an array. So we'll put our opening bracket and our closing bracket, and now we're saying roles is an array, and the data within the array will be string. But instead of required, let's put a default value. And we'll have the default be employee. So even if a role is not assigned in our front end application as the request is sent to create a user, it will assign the default role of employee. Now, as an array, this indicates that a user might have more than one role and more than one value could be stored, of course, in the array. Now we could copy this down one more time. So let's do this again with Shift, Alt, and the down arrow. And here we'll have an active status. Let's go ahead and remove the array from around this. We could remove that final comma because this would be our last one. Now the type here, will be boolean, and then we'll have a default to true. As we would create a new employee, they should immediately be active. Without us even needing to send that data to the API, this will just allow any new employee, or I should say any new user created, will automatically be active. Now before we finish with this file, we need to come underneath the definition of our schema and just say module.exports, set this equal to mongoose.model, and then we name it user, 
and then we pass in the user schema that we just created. And now we should be finished with our user model. And now we need to create a note model. I am going to just control A to select everything in this file and control C to copy and then create a note JS with a capital N, and I'm going to paste everything in from the user model and just make some changes. But before we make those changes, I guess I could make the first one just so we know we're working with the note model. We'll change this user schema, and I'll press Control D to select the second instance of that. And then I'll move to the front, arrow over four, and change this to a note schema. Other than that, let's see if we need to change anything else quickly. Just the name here of the model we can change to note. And now as we come in and make changes to these different types of data, we once again want to refer to the user stories. Let's look at 10, 11, and 12. So notes are assigned to specific users. So we know in this note model, we need a reference back to the users. And then notes have a ticket number, title, a note body, you could say the text of the note, and then created and updated dates. And then notes are either open or completed. So this is another status here. We could basically say it's completed or not. And if not, it would be open. So those are things to consider as we look at what data we want to store in the note. So let's start out with a user because we know it needs to refer back to the users that we have. Now this data type is going to be just a little different than string or number or any normal type of data that you would think of. This is related to mongoose. So we'll say mongoose.schema. So we're referring to the other schema we've created. Then we say types, then we say object ID. Well, we're not specifically referring to that other schema here, but we're saying what type of data this is. It's an object ID from a schema. Then required is true, but one more comma after that, and now we have a ref here. Now this is where we're referring exactly to which schema, so this is referring back to that user schema that we created. After that, let's change password to title. This would be type of string and true. After that, we could change this one. Let's call it text, because it is the text of the note. And this would be string, and let's put required true again for that. But we also need to remember to remove the array that is wrapped around this one, as this was roles in the one we copied from. Okay, after we get text, oh, I've got an extra quote there. Okay, after the text, now we have the completed, and this is a Boolean again, but the default will be false because when we create any new note, it will be open and not completed. So we needed the opposite right there. Now those are our basic data types, but notice it's not all of the data types we needed. We also said we needed dates, both created at and updated at, and we need a ticket number. So there's some other things we're going to do for those types of data. I'm going to move the curly brace off this top line, likewise off this bottom line, because for the timestamps we need to add, that is an option. So I'll put that on a separate line, and then inside of here we can just say timestamps and set that to true. And MongoDB will actually give us both created at and updated at timestamps just by setting this option. And when I save, you'll see it gets formatted just a little differently. But this is easier for me to read, to know that this is one object and then this option here is another object. So now we have everything except our ticket number that we need for the note. And really there will be an automatic object ID created with every record, and that's what we're referencing here for the user. And the note will have one too, but as you may see this as we work through, 
the MongoDB object IDs are very long strings and it wouldn't be too practical to use that for a ticket number. And in fact, what our owner Dan D wants is a sequential ticket number. Now he doesn't want it to start at zero because that makes it seem like his shop just opened up. So he said started at 500 or higher and that's what we'll do. But then every note created will be in a sequence of ticket numbers. We can do that once again by installing a package that will help us. So let's go back to package JSON so we can see it installed and control and backtick. And then let's say npm i mongoose dash sequence. And this will install and then it will help us issue those ticket numbers in a sequence. Okay, we know we have the dependency now. So now let's go back to the note JS model. And at the top of the file, we're going to define auto increment and we're going to set this equal to require mongoose dash sequence and then after that we need to follow it with another set of parentheses and pass mongoose in. I know that looks different than some requires you may have seen but that is what is documented for this package. Okay now we'll scroll down to where we have created our schema here already. So right after the schema we need to say note schema dot plugin and then we pass in auto increment put a comma curly brace and we set some options for this so now we tell it what the increment field is going to be named and we're going to name it ticket this will create a ticket field inside of our note schema and that will get the sequential number this also gets an ID called ticket nums we won't see this inside of our notes collection. What will happen is a separate collection named counter will be created and we'll see that ID inside of the counter collection. And then we need to tell it what number to start the tickets at. So we'll say start sequence, which is just SEQ for this option, and we'll tell it to start at 500. Now that's all we need to do. And once we start creating notes, this plugin for auto increment that we're using from Mongoose Sequence will create a separate collection called counter where it tracks this sequential number and continues to insert it into our notes. We have now created our models and we have our connection string inside the .env file so we are now ready to create our connection to MongoDB. Let's go to the file tree and the config folder and let's create a new file in the config folder and I'm going to call this db and then a capital C O N N so database connection dot js we'll start here by requiring mongoose once again so we'll say const mongoose require mongoose after we do that we'll just define a function called connect db this will be an async function and inside this async function we'll have a try catch Inside the try, we'll await mongoose.connect. And then we just pass in that environment variable. So process env.database underscore uri. And then we'll have our catch. And here we'll just catch the error. And then we'll console.log the error. That just should be ERR. There we go. After that, we can do the module.exports, set this equal to connect DB. Now we're ready to go back to the server JS, and we'll start here at the top with a few more imports. We need to import connect DB that we just created. So this will equal require, and then we'll be looking at the config folder and then we should be able to look at dbcon. There it is. We'll also need to require mongoose here. So we'll say const mongoose equals require and get mongoose. There it is. And then after that, I want to go ahead and bring in that log events function that we have inside of our logger file. So this will equal require and then it's inside of our middleware folder, and then it's inside of logger. 
So now we have our three imports. We're ready to apply these to our server.js. We don't have to scroll far. Let's just go right under this console log where we log the node env value. And let's call this connect database function. And then we can scroll all the way to the bottom where we're listening for the port and saying the server is running on port and providing the number. We're going to wrap this in a listener for the mongoose connection. So here we can say mongoose.connection dot once and we'll listen for the open event. And then this has a callback function. And we'll put our app.listen right inside of here. And then we can put another statement as well. So first I'll paste this one in. But also, let's go ahead and console.log connected to MongoDB. Now I'm going to scroll for just a little more room. And we can put one other listener here. So this will be mongoose.connection.on instead of once and we'll listen for an error. So if there's an error with our connection, then we'll pass the error into this callback. And then we could console.log whatever the error is. But let's also use our log events. And I'm going to paste this in once again, just so I don't have typos. It's a template literal, and it just always creates some typos as I try to type them out. So I'll spare you that. But what we can get from this is the error number, the error code, the error system call, and the error host name. All of that should be provided through a MongoDB error. And then we can create a new file called mongoerrorlog.log. And I'll save the file here. Now one way you could test this is to go ahead and stop your internet connection and then start the server. Remember you would type npm run dev and you should get an error here. I believe it doesn't provide an error number, so it'll only do that if it's available. It might say undefined there, but I have tested that out and you get everything else written in your error log and the log will appear in your logs folder as expected. Now we're going to test out all of our user models we created and everything about our MongoDB connection as soon as we create controllers to process the rest of the CRUD events, the requests we'll get, the create, read, update, and delete. So that is coming up next. For now, let's just open up a terminal once again, type npm run dev, and we'll make sure our MongoDB connection is working as expected. Starting the node server, we've got development from our environment variables. It says connected to MongoDB and the server is still running on port 3500. Everything is good to go. Our starter code today is the completed code for lesson three and that's available in the course resources for download or for cloning in Git. And what I'm going to do here inside of the package JSON now is change lesson three to lesson four and save the file. And that's all we need to do. No new dependencies right now. Let's go to the server.js file and we'll start by adding some routing for the user model. We created a user model and a note model in the previous tutorial. And now we need to create routing and controllers for both of those. So we're going to start with the user model today. I'm going to scroll down where we already have some routing and you can see we are routing to the root file and that is how we display that index page when we go to our local host and then port 3500, which we've done in previous tutorials. So now just underneath this, I'm going to have another app use, so app.use. And then I'm going to say slash users. So this would be the endpoint. And if the request goes to this route, we're going to then require, and then we're going to look inside of the routes folder as we do with the one above. And then I'm going to look for user routes, which does not exist right now. So let's go ahead and go to the routes directory and we can add this user routes JS file. So it's user with lowercase and then routes with a capital R dot JS. Now if we look at the previous file that we had inside of routes, which is root dot JS, we can see we required express and then created a router from express router. We will not need the path, but we do need these first two. So I'm just going to copy them and then go to the user routes file and paste these in. After this, we can do some preliminary setup here. So I'm going to say router.route 
And now this will match the slash users. So now we're saying we're already at slash users, and now this is just the root of that. And we can chain different methods here. So what we're going to do is first say dot git. So any git request that comes to our REST API at slash users, and then we would have a response we would put in here, which will direct to a controller. But we're not going to provide that yet because we haven't created it. So we're also going to look for a post method and we could have a different controller or response for that. And then we could say patch. This would be related to update. So if you're matching these up to crud, git would be the read, post would be the create, patch would be the update, and then we'll have a delete method. Notice how all of these are truly chained together. We could put them in one line, but then once we started to insert our controller functions here inside the parentheses, that would become difficult. So I'd rather have them all on individual lines. After this, we just need to put module.exports, and we're going to say equals router at the end of this, and we'll save this for now. Now currently this won't do anything, so we need to create our user controller. So now in the file tree, let's make sure we're at the top level, and let's create another directory, and we'll call this directory controllers. Inside of this directory, we'll create a new file, and we'll call this users controller.js. Notice the lowercase and then the capital C on controller. We need to require the user model at the top of the file. So we'll say user equals require. And now we'll come up out of this folder and look in the models folder. And then we'll find our user model. And then I'm just going to copy this down with shift alt and the down arrow because we need to do the same for the note model, even though this is the user controller, we may have to refer to the note model at some point inside of this controller. So we need both of those. And then I'm going to save because now we do need a couple of new dependencies. So let's go back to the package JSON and I'll scroll so we can see our dependency list here. I'm going to open up the terminal window and pull it down so we can once again see our dependency list. And now we have two dependencies. So I'm going to type npm i express dash async dash handler. And then we also need b crypt. And we can install both of those on the same line, just like that. And it shouldn't take them long to install. And we should see them both in our list of dependencies. So here we have express async handler. And then at the top, we have bcrypt because these are listed in alphabetical order. So now let's go back to our user's controller file and underneath the models that we have required, let's bring in these other dependencies. So let's say const async handler and we'll set that equal to require and this will be the express dash async dash handler. And then we'll say const bcrypt and we'll set this equal to require bcrypt and we'll need that to hash the password before we save it because we don't want to just save a plain text password inside of any database and the async handler will keep us from using so many try catch blocks as we use async methods with mongoose to save data or delete data or even find data from MongoDB. And now we can create our controller functions and it is common to label those with comments. So I'm going to paste in the first label and we'll follow this pattern for each controller function. But it has a description and the description of this function will be to get all of the users. The route will be slash users and the method will be get and the access to this route will eventually be private, but we're not setting up any authorization right now. We just want to get the REST API up and running so we can create the front end, and then we'll come back and lock it all down later. So we'll say const get all users, and we'll set that equal to a function that is async, then we'll have a request and a response. Notice no next. The controller here should be the end of the line, essentially, where we're processing the final data and we're sending a response back. And after we do that, we have to consider something else. The async handler that will keep us from using the try catch block and still catch those async errors needs to be wrapped around this function. So then we'll say async handler, and we'll put a parentheses there, 
and a parentheses at the end. Notice we haven't created the function yet, but I'm just going to leave it like this. I'm going to highlight this function, even though it's empty, and do Shift Alt in the down arrow to create another one. And now we'll create our post. So this, instead of get all users, will be to create a new user or just create new user to keep it brief. And this will be the post method at the same endpoint slash users. It will also be private. So let's call this create, I get lowercase here, new user. And it will also have the async handler wrapped around it. So that's good enough to start out there. I'll once again highlight this, do shift alt in the down arrow and give another space. Let me scroll for just a little bit of room and this will be to update a user. So we'll say update user or I'll say a user and then this will be the patch method and it will still go to that same user's endpoint and it will still be private. So now let's just change this to update user. And now one more time I will highlight all of this, shift alt and the down arrow give a space, and this will be to delete a user. This will be the delete method. It will still go to the same user's endpoint, and now we can change this to delete user. And then we have our module exports at the very end. So I'll come down a couple of lines and type module.exports. We'll set this equal to an object that will contain all of these functions. So we'll have git, all users, and then we'll have create new user, then we'll have update user, and finally we'll have delete user. And now all that is left is to actually create the logic inside of all of these functions. But before we do that, we can go back and complete our routes. So let's go back to the user routes .js. Inside user routes, let's import our users controller. So we'll say const users controller, set that equal to require, then two dots to come up out of this folder. We'll look in the controllers folder, and then inside of the controllers folder, we have a users controller. And I should have just pressed tab right there, so I wouldn't have to type it, but there we go, users controller. Now that we have the users controller, I'm just going to copy that users controller, highlight these parentheses here at the end, control D to select all four of them, arrow to the end, and then one to the left to be in the middle and paste. And I've got the user's controller now inside of each method. And now individually here, we can use dot notation to pull in these methods, the functions that we created inside of the user's controller. So this will be dot get all users, and we can see that right there. And then we'll have dot create new user, and then we'll have dot update user. And finally, we'll have dot delete user. And now our routing is complete and it's pointing to the correct method inside the users controller for each one of these HTTP methods that could come into this user's route. So let's go back to the users controller and make sure we're scrolled to the top and now we'll start putting the logic inside of each one of these methods. Inside of get all users, I'll start by defining users, and then we will await, and then we'll take our user model and call the find method. And after the find method, we can chain a select here where we're actually going to say, please do not return the password with the rest of the user data. There's never a reason to send the password back to the client. After that, we also want to chain the lean method. Otherwise, Mongo would actually give us, or Mongoose, I should say, would actually give us a full document that has methods, including the save method and others attached to it, which is more than we need. Lean will tell it to basically give us uh, data that's like JSON and it won't have all of those extras. And especially when we're just getting the data and we're not going to call a save method or need that, that's the way to go. Okay, so then we need to check to see if we have users. So we'll say if we do not have users, then we're going to return a response and that status is going to be 400. And then I'm going to chain JSON here and give a message and then say, no users found. We could use an else here and then not use 
the return because then we wouldn't have to say that's the end of the function. But I'm not using an else. Just after this, I'll say response.json and there I'll send the users if we have the user. Another thing to note about this is if you have larger functions and several responses, I believe adding the return statement here is a little bit more of a safety feature. Otherwise, you could get an error about client headers already being set or something like that. And so I like to add the returns. Then of course, at the end, the final one, you don't really need to. And some may prefer not to do that, but you could get in a bit of a problem with your logic if you don't literally end the function with a return statement. Okay, moving on to the next function, we have create new user. This is going to take a little more space, so I'm going to scroll it right up to the top if possible. And when we create a new user, we'll be receiving some data from the front end. So let's destructure that data from the request body. We'll get a username, a password, and a roles array is what we should be receiving. So we'll have to confirm all of that. We'll have request.body. We did set a default value for roles to have an array with an employee, but really we want to make sure they're set. So let's start out by confirming data. I'll say confirm data here. And now we'll say if there is no username or there is no password, or let's use the array dot is array method and pass in roles. So if roles is not an array, that's an issue. Or we could say if roles doesn't have any length, so it's an array, but it doesn't have anything inside. Any one of those should cause us to reject what we have received. So then we want to say return response status 400, which is a bad request. And then we'll say JSON and have a message and we'll say all fields are required. Now these are specific responses we are sending back for specific situations. If there are other errors inside of any one of these functions, then the error handling will take place and our async error handler should kick that out and it will go to our error handling middleware that we already have. But we don't always want that to be the case. Sometimes when we know we might get a specific response, we want to send that back and we'll be able to show a message like all fields are required inside of our front end application that will actually help the user. And now we need to check for duplicates. So we'll say check for duplicate because we don't want to have two users with the same name. So here we'll say const duplicate and we'll set this equal to await and here's our user model. Now we'll use find one because we're passing in a username that we have received above as one of the things we received in the request body. And now after this, we need to use lean again because we're not going to call save on this duplicate or any of the other methods. But then we also need to call exec. And Mongoose really says if you're passing something in, not like we did with find above, let's look in this other one here, find, we didn't call exec, but we didn't pass anything in. And that's what I see in their documentation. But they're saying if you're using async await and want to receive a promise back, you really need to call exec here at the end. I do think it may work without it, but you do not get the error reporting either. And we could Google some more on that. I have read a couple of Stack Overflow reports as well, just to see what others were thinking along those lines. But I'm following the documentation, especially if there is any doubt. So that's what I'm looking at there. Once we have the exec added, we can say if we have a duplicate, if that's what we receive, if it finds one, then we're going to return response status 409, which stands for conflict. Then we'll have JSON and this message will say duplicate username, which could also be very useful for our users. Okay, we're already getting close to the bottom of the page. I'm going to scroll up so we have some more room. And now we need to hash the password that we have received. So let's say const hashed password. We're going to set this equal to await and then use bcrypt that we have imported. Say hash 
And now we'll pass in the password that we received from the request body, and we'll add 10 salt rounds to that. And you could look at the documentation for Bcrypt if you're interested in that, but I can just put here as a note, salt rounds. That's what those are, and that's when it hashes the password. So I couldn't look at the database and know what your password is if I was the administrator. This keeps passwords secure even in the database, even when they're seen, you won't know what the password is without decrypting it. So that's also very useful. Now let's define our user object before we save it. And let's set this equal to an object that has the username. Now we don't have to say username, username, since the field in the database and the variable is the same. This is just like destructuring. We can just say username. But now I do need to say password, and I'm going to set this to the hashed password. And then we'll pass in roles, which is the same name, so just like username. Okay, after we've created that user object, we're then ready to create and store the new user. So let me put that note in here, create and store new user, and we'll say const user equals await user.create, and we pass in the user object that we just created. Now we can say if we have a user, so we've received that back, which means it was created, then we can do something here, or we could have an else afterwards if not. So we'll say response.status 201. Notice I'm not using a return because I know I'm at the end here, and I'm going to use an if else instead. So message, and then I'm going to use a template literal, say new user, pass in the username value, created. And then after this, we'll have an else, and here we'll say response status 400.json a message, and here we'll say invalid user data received, so that did not save. And we can save that, and we should be finished now with our create new user function. Now let's scroll up and add our logic for the update user function. It's going to have some similar logic to the create new user function that we have, but it's not the same, and it's not identical to where I wanted to create little helper functions along the way. So you'll just see some logic that is almost the same. First, we're going to bring in a little more data with this. So we'll be receiving an ID, a username, roles, an active status, and possibly a password, all from the request.body. After that, let's once again confirm data, but we've got just a little more data to confirm as well. So we'll have if there is no ID, or there is no username, or there is no array with our array dot is array, and we pass in the roles, or the roles dot length is not there, or we have one more type of active, which is the active status, now we'll say not equal to boolean. I'm going to press Alt-Z to wrap this code as well. So now we've checked all of the data, and if it doesn't check out, we will return res status and set that to 400, which is bad request. Then we'll have our message that once again says all fields are required. Let's hit return a couple of times and define our user. And we'll set our user equal to await user.findbyid. And now we'll pass in the ID. And we need to call exec at the end of this because we are passing in a value here and we do need to receive that promise. After that, it, we're also not calling lean because we need this to be a mongoose document that does have save and the other methods attached to it. So now that we are checking the user, we can once again say if we do not have a user, then we have a return response status 400 JSON and our message is going to be user not found. Okay, after the user, I'm going to scroll up for some more room. We're once again going to check for a duplicate, but the logic is a little different. So here's our check for duplicate. We'll start out by defining our duplicate. Set this equal to await user.find1, 
and we're passing in the username. And then after that, we need to go ahead and chain lean as we do not need the methods returned with this. And we'll chain exec as well. And then let me put another note here because this is where the logic is different. We want to allow updates to the original user. So if we just looked for duplicates and didn't allow an update at that point, it would also catch the current user we're working with. So we need to avoid that. So we'll say if duplicate and duplicate, I'll use optional chaining here and use underscore ID, which is the ID that's created by MongoDB. Now we'll send that to string, so we'll call the to string method. And if it is not equal to the ID that was received as a variable in the request body, then we have a duplicate. But if it is equal to that ID, that means we're just working on the same current user. So we didn't find a duplicate, we found the user that we're working with. So now let's say return response status 409, JSON with our message, and here this would be duplicate username. So we're trying to change a username to something else that already exists, and we do not want that. Now we're ready to update our user object with some of the information we have received. So we can say user.username, we'll set this equal to username. User.roles, we'll set this equal to roles, and user.active should be equal to active. Note that since this is a mongoose document, if we tried to set a property that didn't exist in our model, it would reject it. So we can only do this with properties that already exist in our model. Now notice we didn't update a password because we don't want to require someone to always send in a password update when they update something else. So here we're just going to say if we have a password, then we can go ahead and update that password. And we're going to do that by hashing the password again. So I'll say hash password. And here this will be user.password is going to equal await bcrypt.hash, like we've seen before, pass in the password, and give it 10 salt rounds again. And I'll put that note here once again that those are salt rounds, and you can look in the docs for more details if you're curious about bcrypt. I need to scroll for just a little more room, but we're almost finished. We just need to say const updated user equals await user dot save. Now this is where we absolutely needed that document because if we requested the lean data in return, we would not receive that save method that we could call right there. And then of course, if there is a problem with that, this will be caught by the async handler, even though we didn't use a try catch. Now after that, we can send a response. So response.json, and then our message. And inside of our message, we'll use a template literal. And here we'll say updated user.username. And then we'll say updated. And we should be finished with our update user function. We are ready for the final function, which is delete user. And this should seem fairly easy compared to the last two. However, it's still got a little bit. We're only going to destructure the ID from the request body. That's all we really need to reference a user and delete that user. So we'll say if there is no ID, then we'll have that similar response. So return response.status 400, which is bad request, JSON, a message, and this message is user ID required instead of all data is required. If I could spell required, it'd be better off. And now we need to use the notes model because we do not want to delete a user if they have notes assigned to the specific user. So let's check the notes. So we'll say const notes equals await note. We've already imported that above and we'll call find one again. And now here, each note in the note model has a user. So we'll pass in the ID, which should match that user ID. And then we need lean, as we won't be calling any methods, and we need exec at the end. After that, we'll say if the notes, and I will use optional chaining here, have length, then we'll go ahead and return response.status 400 for bad request, JSON, and the message, 
that could help our users, which would be user, I need a capital U there, user has assigned notes. So we do not want to delete that user if notes are assigned to the user. Okay, after that, let's define our user and we'll set that equal to await user dot find by ID that we have received and we'll call exec after that because we do need those other functions and we're going to actually delete instead of save this time. But we'll say if there is no user, then we need to send another response. So return response status 400 JSON. And now our message will be user not found. But then if there is a user is where we will be after this, let's go ahead and define a result. And this result will actually receive the full user object that is deleted. And here we'll just say await user dot delete one. And when we do that, the user will be deleted, but the result will hold the deleted user's information. So now we can define a reply instead of sending all of that deleted user's information, which we could do. I'll just create this reply and I'll use a template literal for that and I'll say username. Here we can say result.username. After that, let's say with ID and then pass in result.underscore ID and then we can just say deleted. So we have a message to send back. And now we'll just say response.json and we'll send our reply. And that should finish out our delete function. With our controller functions completed, we now need to test them. And I'm going to do that with Postman. So we'll go to the postman.com website. I'm here at postman.com slash downloads. And here you can download the Postman app. Postman lets us test each endpoint of our REST API and see the results without having a full front end, which can be very handy. So if you do not have it, go ahead and download and install Postman and we'll come back and I will walk you through testing the endpoints that we just created. Okay, back in Visual Studio Code, I need to go ahead and start the development server. So I'm going to type npm run dev and we should see everything start up and it should say it's running on port 3500 and we're connected to MongoDB. With our dev server running, I now have Postman open and we can click the plus symbol at the top to create a new workspace. I'm also going to press control and the plus symbol a couple of times to get a larger font on the screen as Postman defaults to a smaller font. And what we need to do is put in our dev URL at the top. So I'm going to put in localhost and you can see it actually remembers what I've had in here before. So we want localhost port 3500 and then the user's endpoint. Now our user's endpoint has several possibilities because we get different responses from each HTTP method that we send. So we have git, post, we're also going to send patch and delete and we need to check out every possibility. And if we get a response that we don't expect, then we know we need to fix something in our code. And I'll give you an example of that. Right now we're at the git users endpoint. So we're going to send a request to users and it's a git request and it should return all of the users, but we don't currently have any users, but I'm going to go ahead and send this request and we get an empty array. That was not what I expected. So let's fix that. We need to look in our code and let's look at the get all users function that we have inside of our users controller. Now I'm going to close the terminal because it will continue to run even if we have closed the terminal. And now what we expected was this response here, no users found, but we had this happen. It sent the users anyway and it was just an empty array. So what we really need to check here is if the users have any length. And by using optional chaining, we can first make sure that the users exist before we check the length property. So now let's save these changes and let's check that request again with Postman. So I'll send that request and now we get the response we expected. So now we'd like to also make sure this can return users, but before we can do that, we need to create a user. So let's check our post for the same endpoint, and now we'll need to send some data and create a user. So to do that, we need to go to the headers first, and let's add a header here in Postman that is content-type, 
and this will tell the server that we are sending application slash JSON type data. So after we've added that, let's go to the body tab and let's choose raw. So we can just send some raw JSON here. So we'll have curly braces. Then we need to put quotes around the properties here and we have a username. I'm just going to say Hank. After that, we have a password. And remember, this will be a plain text password here, but after the server gets it, it will encrypt it. So I'll put in a basic password. And we should also have roles. And roles is expected to be an array. And then there is string data inside the array. So with these three pieces of data, we should be able to create a user for Hank at the user's endpoint with a post request. Let's go ahead and send that. And it says, new user Hank created. Great, so now we can go back and check our get request for all the users. And let's see if we get Hank's information back. And we do. So you can see what was sent back. Notice the password is not here as we told our code not to send the password back. So that also is working correctly. Let's see what else we need to check inside of Visual Studio Code. So for our get all users, we've already checked when no users are found. And now we've checked a response that sends any users that exist. So that's good. Let's move on to our create new user endpoint and we made sure that it actually created a user. But now let's check if some of these other things happen. So we need to try it out without some of this data to see if we get the all fields are required message. We also need to try it out with duplicate data, which means we need to create another user and try to, or at least try to create one with the same name. So those are two possible responses. And then what else might happen? Okay, we might just create a user as we have, or if there was invalid data. And we could also just check to see if our async handler is working by sending some malformed JSON as well. So I think we'll be able to check everything except maybe the invalid user data because we're already checking some of that before. So let's pull Postman up once again, and let's first check the duplicate. So we've already got a username, Hank. Let's just try to create another one at the post method or at the user's endpoint with the post method. So I'll send this and we've got the duplicate username response. So that's good. So if we change this to Dave, we won't have that problem. But let's go ahead and remove the username from the request and now send the request. And now it says all fields are required. We could also verify that by removing a different one such as the password. If we put it back and maybe re we remove roles, and let's try sending that. Now we have an unexpected token. So this checked our async handler because we had an extra comma here that it didn't expect since it was the last one. So let's delete that comma. We know our async handler's working and our error handler was past this and sent it back to us. Now let's send this request. It still says all fields are required. Let's put the comma back and we'll put our roles back, but we'll change the type of data. Let's say it's an empty array and let's see if we catch that issue as well. And there we go. Let me send this. All fields are required is what it still says. So now what if it was just string data and not an empty array? So it didn't have the right data type. All fields are still required. So I'm going to minimize Postman again, and we'll once again look at our code. We check the all fields are required. We check the duplicate username. We definitely know we can create a user, and I couldn't think of any invalid user data to send that would get past the other checks. But if you think of something, go ahead and try that. And of course, we also made sure our async handler was catching errors, and it sent it on to the error handler for the entire server. So now we're ready to check the update user method. Again, we have all fields are required, so we need to check all of our data to make sure our confirmed data logic is correct. And then we also need to check the possibility of a user not being found when we're trying to update the user. And then we'll need to check for a duplicate, but we can't check for the same user that we're already working on because we want to be able to update that. And that's what we set our logic to. So we'll actually want to create another user 
and then try to change their name to Hank's name. And as I scroll down, let's see if there's anything else to check. Nope, now we should just be successful and send the response back. So we're checking for duplicates eventually, but also user not found and all fields required. I'll pull Postman back up. We'll now go to the Git because I want to get all of the data that we have for Hank first. So we can just put that up above and if we provide extra data, it won't hurt anything because we're only destructuring the data that we need when we send the request. And that's what the server is doing. Actually, those different controller methods were destructuring the data. So now I'm providing the ID so we can update Hank. But let's change one of the numbers here. Instead of this number nine, let's change it to a one. And then we'll try to send the patch request, which would be the update. And let's see what happens. User not found. Well, that's what we expected. Great. So now let's remove the active that should be required and let's see what happens. All fields are required. So that worked out as expected as well. Now this other logic was what we already had in there previously as well. So we had checked that with the other endpoints. So that should be good. But let's see if we don't supply an ID because we didn't have that before. Nope, it still says all fields are required. So just to confirm, I'll go back to the git and send and I'll get Hank's number again, which I think I just changed the nine to a one, but I wanted to make sure I had that same one. Now let's make sure the update actually works and I'll just change active to false for Hank. So I'll come back to patch and we'll send this and now Hank was updated. So when we go back to Git and send our request, we can now see that Hank's active status is set to false. And so now I need to create another user before I can try to rename and test the duplicate reaction. So what we're going to do now is go to the post request and I'm going to change Hank's name to my name first and we'll create a new user. So this should work and it says all fields are required. What are we missing? Oh yeah, we didn't have a password because we didn't send a password along for the update. So let's just go ahead and add a password here as well and I'll make it the same as Hank's too as that won't hurt anything. And now I'll send the information for our new user and new user Dave is created. So now if we look at the users, we should see that we have both Hank and Dave available here in our response. So I'm going to copy Dave's information and then pull the response back down, put Dave's information up here. Remember, we'll need to change this underscore ID to an ID. And now we're going to do a patch and I'm going to try to change Dave's name to Hank. Now remember, we already have another user named Hank. So let's see what we get duplicate username. So that worked out just great. Now let's minimize Postman one more time and look at the logic for our delete method, our delete user here. And so we just have to send an ID. And if there's no ID, we should get a user ID required. Likewise, we're going to look for notes. Now this is something we can't check. And as I'm looking at this a second time, I think this needs to be changed. Uh, lowercase, we're really only looking for one note, first of all. So this is lowercase and our model is uppercase. So they're not the same thing, even if they both say note. The second thing is, this probably won't return an array. We're using find one here. So I don't think that's what we want. If it doesn't find anything, it will be null. So we'll be checking that. Otherwise, it will have a note. So a nice little code review there. Now we also might get a user not found if we send an ID that doesn't exist. But we can't check this user has assigned notes now. We'll have to wait until we create the notes controller. So we're really just going to check to see if the user ID is required or the user is not found. And then we're going to make sure it can delete a user as well. It looks like I need to save that change and Nodemon will restart our server. And now I'll pull Postman back up and let's go to the delete method for the same user's endpoint. And now we're going to send some information. And remember, this is actually user Dave. We tried to change the name. So let's not send the actual ID first. I'll change this five to a one and let's see if it can find a user. User not found. Great. So now let's try it without a user ID at all. User ID is required. That's what was expected as well. Now let's put in 
the accurate user ID, I'll change that back to a five, and when I send, username Dave with that ID was deleted. So now let's go to the get request, get all of our users, and we still have Hank here. So let's go ahead and delete Hank as well, and our database will be empty once again. We'll pull this back, send, oh, that's the get request. We'll pull this back and go to delete, send the delete request, and now Hank is also deleted, so when we check the get request, we have no users found. And before you move forward with your controllers and the logic you have created for each function inside there, they would be the methods of the controller, you want to make sure you test every possible response that you expect to get, and then also check your error handling. And that's what we have done for the user's controller. And now I'll minimize Postman one more time, and we're back at Visual Studio Code. Now we still have a notes controller to create, and you have followed me for this process, starting in the server JS, where we created the route for the users, and then we went to the routes directory and we created user routes JS, and then we created the controllers directory and we added the users controller JS that has all of these different methods inside of it. So now I think it's a good time to issue a student challenge because we need to do all of this for the note model as well. So we'll have our notes endpoint and we'll have all of the associated controller methods with it. And of course the routing needs to be put in place. I will leave that to you. I will provide my code inside of the course resources for this lesson. So if you want to check back, but I think it will be a great logic exercise and don't expect to be perfect. There's no pressure, just do the best you can. And then of course you can check your code with mine in the course resources. A quick look at today's starter code. We have a new Git repository, and that's because we're building the front end now. So lessons one through four, the repository for those lessons has the back end code that has Node.js, Express, and MongoDB. That's the REST API. Now we're talking full stack. So not only do we have the back end, but we also have the front end, and that is built with React. And what you see in the package JSON is that I have named this lesson 05 with a dash front end. Now today we'll only have front end code, but if we ever have a lesson that has back end and front end, I will make sure to note on each directory which is the front end and which is the back end. Now you can see I've already started a React app with NPX Create React App, and I've removed all of the things we don't usually use. So the extra dependencies are gone. You'll also see in the source folder, the extra files are removed, and I'm back with an index.js and an app.js, and I have an index.css. Now I have supplied some CSS already. This is not a tutorial on CSS. You can apply what you want to, or you can use mine, but I'm really focused on the structure of the MERN stack and building the logic throughout, and today we'll be focused on React. Other than that, I've also supplied an image folder. We only have one image, and it's a background image. You can see that right here. Somebody's working on some technology, and that's just what we'll use for Dandy's repair shop as the background. I've also supplied this same folder inside of the public directory, so there's no issue with you linking to it from the CSS, which is where I do that, and I only apply that background to the body element, which is not something we access through React normally anyway, so that should handle that. Now let's take a look at the user stories that we we have previously looked at a few times, and these are the notes that I took from Dan D, our stakeholder, the owner of the repair shop that we're building this project for. Now we haven't completed any yet because we've only completed the back end, so we cannot fully say that any of these goals are met. However, today we should be able to complete a couple of these goals, just some basic ones, like add a public facing page with basic contact info. We should also be able to provide a welcome page after the 
the login. Now we could say that is complete or we could wait until we complete the login portion. We're first building this MERN stack with full access and just making sure everything works the way we want it to before we apply the user roles and that authentication and authorization. We'll do that after we get everything else working. Let's head back to the package JSON and we have several decisions to make today. I'm going to open up a terminal window and we'll get ready to install a package. But first, let me discuss these decisions. We need to talk about the state management of the app, the file structure, and the routing structure as we begin to create this application. Those are things you need to decide early on. Even though we won't apply the state management today, we're going to use Redux and RTK query for this application. I've had many requests for that. It's not a huge application, but it is one that will be used for business purposes, and I think it will allow this application to grow if Dandy comes back to us and wants us to keep adding features to it. The other thing we'll do is apply the Redux file structure that you have seen in my previous Redux tutorials, and that's also what's in their documentation with their examples, and so it will be based on features. And now the routing structure. We're going to use React Router. So let's go ahead and install that dependency. We'll just put npm i and then React dash router dash dom and press enter. It should add fairly quickly. I'll drag this down so we can see it in our dependencies. And there it is. Let's close the terminal window and go to index.js. Here we need to go ahead and remove this report web vitals that I forgot to remove before. But other than that, we can go ahead and import what we need from React Router DOM. So we will import and we need browser router. We also need routes and we also need route. Now that we have those, let's go ahead and delete this web vitals part down here as well. And then inside of the root.render, we can start to apply what we have imported. So I'm going to delete the app component for now and just start with browser router. And after we add that, you can see I automatically get the closing part of that tag. And then inside of the browser router, I'm going to press tab to come over. And then I need to use routes. And then inside of the routes, I'm going to put a specific route. I'm going to assign the path to a slash and an asterisk, which will allow us to have nested routes. And then I'm going to set the element. And here is where we bring our app component back. Close out the app there, and then we need to go ahead and close out the route tag itself. So you can see we have browser router, nested within that we have routes, and then we apply a specific route that will allow nested routes as we move on to the app.js. So we can save here as we are now finished with the index.js, and we go to the app.js. In the app.js, we can remove these imports as they were the default from Create React App, and we can really remove everything Thing here inside of the return as well. So just inside of the div with the class name app, we'll remove all of that. Let's start at the top of the file now, and we will import routes and route once again, and both of those will come from React Router DOM. Now let's leave this as is for a moment, and let's create inside of the source directory a new directory called components. And inside of this components directory, let's create a new file, and I'll name this layout.js. Now I'm going to import outlet from React Router DOM. And after we get that imported, we can go ahead and just type R-A-F-C-E, at least if you have React ES7 snippets extension like I do, and press tab. If not, you'll need to type that out. But once you have the basic layout here, we can remove everything after the return, and then we can just provide outlet. So all this does is render the children of the outlet component, and we're going to make this our parent component. The nice thing about having the layout component here is if we decide to add a banner that would go across the entire application throughout, or a footer, or anything like that, that we would want to show on both the public and the private pages, I mean on everything that shows in the application, we could do it here. So this gives us kind of one parent where we can add extra things if we need to. So let's go ahead and save our layout.js. Now let's go back to the app.js and we'll start by importing the layout that we created. So layout, and that comes from the components layout. 
After that, inside of the return, let's go ahead and put in a routes. And then inside of that, we'll put in a specific route. And this will be the parent of everything else, essentially, that we have underneath it. So here we'll just have the root. And then we'll say element equals. And then we'll put in our layout. But we will not close this out like you saw in the index. We will make this a route with a closing route tag. And now we can put everything else inside of this and the layout will be the parent. Now let's go back to the components directory and we'll create another file there. And I'm just going to name this public. This will be our public facing page for Dandy's Repair Shop. And inside of this, we're going to need a link from React Router. So we'll import that from React router DOM. And after that, let's once again use our RAFCE shortcut and create a public function. I'm just going to highlight everything here inside of the component and I'm going to paste in a basic web page essentially here. You can see I'm creating a content variable and then I'm returning that content with the functional component. And you can see it's inside of a section with the class name public. You'll want that to match up to my CSS if you're using my CSS. And then inside of this section, we have a full structure, a header, a main element, and a footer. You can see the footer is going to link to a login page. After that, the main section here, the main element, has all of the information about Dandy's repairs, and the header has a welcome. Now, of course, you'll want these class names to match my CSS. I'm using a BEM naming convention for some of these, or if it's a utility class like no wrap, it just has its own name there. So just note that if you're using mine, but feel free to create your own as well. I have no problem with that, as this does not really apply to the logic of the rest of the stack, but it does meet one of our user stories. So that's important. We can come back to the app.js now, and we can import this. So import public, and that's going to come from the components and then the public. And once we have that, we can put it inside of this route. So this is going to be another route, and then we can assign it a value as well. And this value is going to be index, and that means when you come to this root path, it's not showing a layout. Layout just renders the children. So this will be the default component that it shows. So here we'll say element equals, and we'll provide the public component that we created. Now let's go ahead and close this route out. Now after this, we also noticed public links to a login component. So let's save the app.js, go back and create a quick login component. We're not going to handle all of the login logic today and all of those roles and authorization and things like that. But in this hierarchy, this will at least let us create this page and import it into the app.js. So I'll use my ES7 shortcut again to create that functional component. Once we have the login here, I'm only going to change the div to an h1, just my preference again, and save that. Now let's go back to the app.js, make that import as well. So import login, that comes from components login, and then we can use it right under our public here. So we'll have route. This will not be the index though, so we'll just say path equals login, and then we have to provide the element, so that's going to equal that login component here, and let's close this one out as well. Now let's create another component, and I'm going to call this one dash layout. So this will be part of the dash after a user has logged in. So one of Dan's employees or Dan himself will have logged in, and then we'll have our dash layout. So I'll use RAFCE once again to create a quick functional component, and now we can make some changes. Let's start with an import at the top, and we're going to import outlet once again from React Router DOM. And once we have that imported, then inside of the dash layout, we're going to set some things a little differently. I'm going to use a fragment because I know I'm going to need it to nest some things inside. And once I've done that, I'm going to start with a div and this div is going to have a class name. So I'll come back and add class name and set this equal to dash dash container. And then inside of this dash container, we can provide the outlet. So now we have wrapped this in a div so we can apply different styles to our 
area that will be required to have a login to. I guess our protected area, you could say, we could apply different styles as we now have that in a container and all of the children will be within that. We're also going to use a dash header and a dash footer, but we haven't created those yet. So let's start with the dash header and I'll create that component over here as well, dash header.js. And now I'll use RAFCE to quickly get that functional component again. And at the top, we're going to need to import in a link here. So let's import link. And that once comes from React Router DOM. And after we have the link, let's go ahead and add the body here to the component. I'll once again highlight this return and replace it and we can go over this. It's fairly simple content here. We have a header as the container. Inside of this, we have a div with the class name dash header two underscores container. And then we have a link to dash notes. This is linking the H1 that we see here that says tech notes, which is the name of the application. And then we have a nav element that we know we will fill later with navigation buttons, but we're not adding those right now. That is the basic structure of our dash header. So we can save that file. And now let's once again, go back, not to the app.js, I guess, but back to the dash layout. And here we'll import the dash header. There it is in my list. And once we have that, we can put it right here inside of the JSX. So we say dash header and just close it out there. Now this is an example, as I mentioned with the previous layout, this has the children here. So now the dash header will be above every page on the protected part of our site. So this is the layout component for that protected part of the site. And now we'll be able to add a dash footer down here too that we won't see on the public page, but once we make it to the dash part of the page, which is the protected part, we'll begin to see that header and the footer after we create it. Before we create the dash footer, let's go back to the package JSON as we need to add a few dependencies for font awesome. So I'm just going to press control back tick to open up the terminal window. And then I'm going to type npm i, and I'm going to paste in the first part, which is at fort awesome, not font awesome, but fort awesome. And then it is font awesome dash svg dash core is the first dependency, but we have two others that I'll just put all on the same line. It will once again start with at Ford Awesome, and then it is free dash solid dash svg dash icons. And then finally, one more that starts with at Ford Awesome, and it will be react dash font awesome. With those three all on the same line, I'll press enter and they should install into our dependencies. And then we'll be able to use font awesome components inside of our project. And now you can see all three of these listed up here. If you didn't catch that when I listed them out on the line below, pause and install those if you need to, and then come back to the video. I'm going to close the terminal window and back in the components directory, I am going to create the dash footer component. So we'll start with dash footer.js, press enter, R-A-F-C-E for a functional component, but we've got some more work to do inside of this component. So let's start out with the basics. Inside of the component, I'm going to define my content. I'm going to set that equal to a footer element, and then inside of the footer element, I guess I should apply the class name while I'm here. So class name is going to equal dash dash footer. And then inside of this element, our user stories said they wanted to see the current user and status. And I think the footer would be a good place to have this available throughout the entire application. So I'll just put a paragraph here that has current user and when we start working with state we'll be able to bring in that user and then i'm also going to put another paragraph here that has status and the same we'll be able to bring in the current status once we start working with the state as well now there's some other things we want to add to this footer though so now let's go to the top oh we're not returning it yet i need to put the return of the content here so we'll just get rid of that and say content now let's go to the top and we'll say import, and we're going to bring in font awesome icon. 
there you can see that full import. After that, we're going to import FA house from, well, it's Fort Awesome slash free solid SVG icons. And once we've imported that, we need a couple of things from React Router too. We'll say import, use navigate, and we'll also say use location. Those will come from React Router DOM. With those imports all in place, we can now start adding some to our component. I'm going to start with const navigate, set that equal to use navigate from React Router. And then I'm also going to destructure path name from our use location hook that we imported. Now that I have those values, I'm going to create a simple function here called on go home clicked. Let's set this equal to an anonymous function and then it will be navigate slash and then we'll have our dash. After this function, let's create the button that's going to use it. I'm going to start with let and I'll say go home button and it's just going to equal null. But now we can have an if statement and we'll say if path name that we've destructured above from the location is not equal to slash dash. Then we'll do something else with the button instead of having the value be null. So we'll say go home button. Let's set this equal to a button. Notice the parentheses since I'm breaking this out onto separate lines. And now with this button on separate lines, I'll put the class name and I'm going to set this equal to a couple of classes. So I've got a dash dash footer two underscores, whoops, two underscores, button, and I've also got another class that is icon-button. After that, we'll give it a title, and this is just going to equal home. Of course, the title value always shows up when you mouse over a button. And then on click will be equal to that function we created, on go home clicked. And after that, we can close out our button here. Now we can give a value that's going to be on the button and here instead of a word we're going to use our font awesome icon and then we can set the icon equal to the fa house that we imported and then we can go ahead and close out our button and i'm getting all the red lines because i closed out the button early out of habit i put the slash there so there we're good now that i removed that slash and we've created our button. And now the only thing that remains is just to put the button inside of the footer. So we'll put it inside of curly braces and have our go home button. Now this will only appear if we're not at the root page of dash. So we don't want the home button to appear there because we will already essentially be home if we're a logged in user, but we want it to appear on all other pages. We'll have a little home icon in the footer. Let's take a quick look at app.js and it doesn't look like we have imported in our dash layout component yet. So let's do that. We'll have our dash layout and that comes from components and then we'll find our dash layout. There it is. Now remember with the dash layout, it imports the header and the footer. So we still need to import the dash footer over here. And once we've imported that, we can use it inside of the dash layout. So all that the uh, app.js needs is the dash layout component because it pulls in the header and the footer here. So now back at the app.js, we see we've imported dash layout, but we still need to use it. Now, this will be really where the protected routes begin, but we haven't applied that protection yet, and that's okay. So here we actually need route first. We'll say route path is going to equal dash, and then we'll set the element equal to dash layout. And now we won't close this. It will actually wrap around the other components that are protected inside of this route. Now, I had previously mentioned folder and file structure and said we were going to use what we've seen in my Redux course and that we also see in the Redux Toolkit docs. We're going to base this on features. So let's go ahead and create a features directory that's going to be inside of the source directory as well. So we'll have features. And now inside of this features directory, let's create another one named auth. And now that I'm thinking about it, 
inside of this components directory, we could have brought the login inside of auth because it's related to that feature. So once we do that and we moved it over, you can see it was instantly changed in my app.js file and I will save that change. If it's not in yours, you'll need to change where you have imported the login component from. But so we've put that inside of the auth directory. Now let's go ahead and create our welcome page because we'll already need to be logged in there as well and it will use some of that information. So I'm relating that back to a protected directory or a protected route. So I'm going to put it inside of auth. Now my way isn't the only way of doing this. So if you want to create a different directory, if it makes sense to you in another way, there's nothing wrong with that. You're just trying to use some logical hierarchy here. So now with this welcome component, I'm once again going to create, oh, and I don't have a dot there between the welcome JS. So this would not be a good thing right now. Let's rename this. It didn't recognize what type of file it was. Welcome dot js now we're ready type rafce and we get that functional component at the top of this component we once again need our link from react router dom so i will return come down one and import in link from react router dom and after i get that imported we're ready to put something inside of the component. I'm going to highlight and paste and review with you. I'll press Alt-Z to get this code to wrap. So we're importing link from React Router DOM. We get to our component and I'm creating a new date, first of all. And then I am formatting that date where it says today. So I'm creating a today variable and I'm using this new international dot date time format. Now you may be in another location. We know Dan D is in the US, he's our stakeholder. So that's what we're setting here. But if you want to set something for your location, you can do that as well. And then we're putting in the object with the formatting that this date time format requires. So it says date style is full, time style is long, and then we're formatting the date right here. So you can see all of that and we'll get this nice format for the date that we want to display. That's actually in one of our user stories where it talks about the login page and we're giving the date. We're also supposed to give some user information that we will do in the future. But we're able to pull in this today variable down here inside of our content where we create this section. So here is the today variable pulled in with that format. Right now we'll just have a nice welcome message and then we'll have links to dash slash notes, which will be our tech notes and to the user settings. Now the user settings will not be available to all users in the future. We'll apply some roles to whether that is visible or not, but right now we just want to make sure it works. So we've created that section and then we return the content. And that is our welcome page overall, our welcome component. So we can save that and now import it into the JS or our app JS. We'll say import welcome. And that comes from features auth welcome. I'm going to delete this semicolon as I'm trying not to use as many of those as I have in the past as they're not really required. And now inside of our dash layout, this will be a route that's nested within. So I'll just give a little space and then we'll have a route and this will be the index route for the dash path. So when we go to dash and it renders the children, it will look for this index if you just go to the dash right here. So then we'll say element, we'll set this equal to welcome, and we'll close that out. And then we can go ahead and close out this route. So you can see, as I mentioned before, we do have a nested hierarchy here. We start out with the index, essentially the index for the full page or the full site. And that goes to the public. But then after a login, we essentially have an index for the protected routes as well. And that is our dash layout. You go to the dash path though and it renders the children and the actual index value that will show is our welcome component. So now, as you noted, inside of the welcome component, there was a link to the notes and a link to the user settings. Those are our other main features of this application. So let's create directories for both of those. We'll have a notes directory. And then inside of features, we will also have a users directory. Okay, I'm going to select the notes directory first 
And inside of that, I'm going to create a new component called notes list.js. And then RAFCE to create that functional component. And the only thing I'm going to change here right now is the div to an H1 and press save. Now I'll do the same thing for users. So we're creating these components. We're not putting the logic in them yet, but they are placeholders for the future. We'll have users list.js, RAFCE for that functional component. And we'll once again change the div to an H1 and save. And now if we go back to app.js, we can finish out the hierarchy of our application. So here, we're going to have another route, but I guess we need to import these first as well. So let's go ahead and import in our notes list from features notes notes list. And then we'll do the same for users list. And that's from features users users list. And then we can set up the routing here. Now it's inside of the dash layout, our protected parent here. And then we'll put in our route. We'll set this path equal to notes. And then let's just close the route and get that closing tag right there because we don't have to put the element right there. We're going to have several things inside of this notes route. And remember, we're already inside of the dash route. So if we went to this, it would be whatever our domain is slash dash slash notes to get to our notes list. And we'll make this the index of this path. So we will then say route index and set the element equal to our notes list component. And then we can close that out right here as we won't nest other things inside of the notes list, but we may eventually put other things in the notes path, such as the edit note component or the new note component. Now we can essentially highlight this, press shift alt and the down arrow, and then I'm going to select notes and control D to select the other notes and switch this to users. So now I have path users and we're rendering as the index of this path, the users list. And if the nested routes start to get confusing, you can leave yourself a note inside of curly braces, such as a comment here, and we can say end dash, which was our dash layout. And now that might help you see things a little clearly when you get to the bottom and you're just seeing these closing routes here. So overall, the repair notes application that we've created can see the routing structure inside of the app.js component. We've got two public routes. One is just the root itself that goes to the public component. The other goes to the login page. After that, we are going to protect these following routes in the future. We have not yet, and that's okay. But if we go to slash dash, we should see the welcome component. If we go to slash dash slash notes, we should see the notes list component. And then slash dash slash users, we should see the users list components. We've also created our basic file structure here where we have some components for the overall the dash area and the public inside of components. If you want to create a separate directory for just those dash components, you could, I did not. But then we also have a features directory and we're going to have three primary features for this. We're going to have the auth directory, the notes directory and the users. So we're organizing these logically by which they apply to. So in the future, of course, the notes directory would hold the note edit component, it would hold the new note component, and it has the notes list. Similar for users, and then other things associated with the auth, the authorization, the roles that we have, and things like that, will be inside of this auth directory here. So it should make it fairly easy to find. But again, this is not the only way to do it, but it's the way that I'm doing it. And the examples you see in my Redux course will follow that pattern as well. Right now, we should be able to open up a terminal window, type npm start, and at least see what we've got so far and make sure everything is working correctly. So here we've got our full page for Welcome to Dandy Repairs. We've got the basic information that Dan wanted for his basic web page at the beginning. Now our link should work to the employee login and when we click it, it does. We just have our login heading. We're not ready for the rest. So let's change this path to dash and see what we get. 
Here we've got our tech notes page. It's got our full date format and the welcome. It's got a link to the notes and a link to the user settings. Now we also see our header and we see our footer that will have the current user and status. Notice there is no home icon, but if we go to the tech notes, which is the notes list, now we see a home icon that's available here. Our tech notes should also link, the word tech notes should link back to the home page as well and our footer still remains at the bottom. So let's click tech notes here to check that out. And it looks like maybe I linked tech notes back to notes. We'll check that in a second. The home does link back to the home page. Let's check the users list. Everything looks the same here. So we go back and that's working. So now let's just check that code for the one component that I said the header and that would be here inside of the components directory. We have our dash header, and let's see where we're linking to. And yes, it is at slash dash slash notes. Let's just delete the notes off of there as we have made the welcome, the home page. That change went ahead and registered, and we can bring this back. And actually, you can see this now in a smaller screen that it still looks just fine. Let's go back to the tech notes. And now if we click tech notes at the top, it links back just like our home icon does at the bottom on both pages. We have the basic layout and structure for our React application. And in the next tutorial, we'll be managing state with Redux and applying the API layer with RTK Query. Let's look at our starter code for today. I'm at the package JSON and I'm going to change the lesson five front end from the previous lesson to lesson six. And that's the code we're starting with is from lesson five that we completed in the last tutorial. Now moving forward, we need to add some more dependencies to our package to use Redux inside of our project. So I'm going to press control and the back tick and now inside of this terminal window, I'm going to type npm i for install, and then we're going to add the at symbol and have redux.js slash toolkit, and then give a space, and we're also going to add react-redux. Press enter, and it shouldn't take too long to add those dependencies to our package JSON, and then we'll see them listed in the dependencies above. It looks like they're already there. I'll close the terminal window. We can see React Redux. We can also see Redux.js slash toolkit now available. I should note the other starter code that I have added today is in the CSS file once again. In the previous tutorial, we stopped at line 179. I did not go over the CSS. I just said you could use mine if you want to, or you can apply your own. And the same goes here. Now I added the rest of my CSS starting at line 180, and it's everything else you'll see, including a couple of media queries that will make the font a little bigger on those larger screens. I believe in the last tutorial I thought the font looked a little small so I've gone ahead and increased that size. But this is not a CSS tutorial. You can go over my styles if you want to or you can apply your own. Now let's move on to highlighting that source directory and let's create a new directory inside and let's call this directory app. Now inside the app directory we need to create an API directory. So now I'll create that directory and inside the API directory I'm going to create a new file and I'm going to call it API and then with a capital S slice.js. I'm going to move just a little quicker today so I'll paste some code in instead of having you watch me type it out but then I will go over anything that I paste in. And so this is our starting API slice. You can see I'm importing the create API and fetch base query from Redux here. And what we're using this fetch base query for is essentially what we would use Axios for in another project or something similar. So that's how you can think about fetch base query. You can see we are creating the API right here. So we've got export const API slice and it equals create API. Then we have to set some things inside of it. And you can see our base query is going to use fetch base query. And here's where we provide the base URL, which in development is our local host at port 30. We would want to change this, of course, when we deploy this project. We provide a couple of tag types because these will be used for cached data. So when we invalidate different 
caches or types, we'll be referring to the note and the user data both. And then we provide endpoints here with an empty builder. Now we are going to provide extended slices that we will attach to this API slice essentially for notes and for users. And that's where we'll provide the details that would really be the actual endpoints. But this just gets us started with the API slice we need. Now let's highlight that app folder and let's make sure we're not inside the API folder and create another file, and we'll call this file store.js. And we can confirm we're not inside the API folder if we close that and you still see the store.js in your file tree. So what we're going to do inside of the store, just to begin, is very simple. We import configure store, and then we use configure store to create a store. We just give the reducer an empty object and we go ahead and set dev tools to true because we may want to use the Redux dev tools. But now that we've created an API slice, let's go ahead and pull that API slice into our store as well. And now instead of an empty reducer, we will refer to that API slice and we'll also provide middleware. So inside of the reducer, you can see we're dynamically referring to this API slice with the reducer path and then we have api slice dot reducer here likewise we have middleware here that now must be added to the default middleware so we can call this function get default middleware and then well here's the actual function is passed in here and then we add with concat we add the api slice middleware there now again this was all covered inside of my Redux full course. So if this looks confusing, it's a great time to go back and review that as well. And now that we've set up our Redux store and we have our beginning API slice, let's go to the index.js and bring it into our project. So we need to import a couple of things now. We need the store from our store file that we created inside of the app folder. And then we also need to import a provider from React Redux. And then we can use that here in our project. So just underneath where we have React strict mode, we want to create a provider and we want to pass in the store that was created. And then we close that and get the closing provider tag. And of course, we'll put that after browser router and before the closing React strict mode tag. So now we have provided the store to our application. Now we're ready to move on to the features directory. And if you remember, inside of the features directory, we have auth, notes, and users. Let's go to users first. And inside the users directory, let's create a new file and we'll call this users and then capital A for API and then capital S for slice. So it's users API slice.js. I'll paste in just a little and go over this before we add any more. So we're importing in create selector, which we'll use later. And then we're also importing in create entity adapter from Redux JS toolkit. And then we're importing in the API slice that we created as well, which we will use. But first we create a user's adapter specific to our user slice here that we are using create entity adapter with. Now, if you've gone through my Redux tutorial, you'll remember using an uh, entity adapter, we can get some normalized state here. So we should start then working with data that has an IDs array and then also has entities. Now the entities cannot be iterated over, but the IDs can. So we'll use the IDs to get data from the entities essentially when we need to do that. Again, if that sounds strange, please refer back to my course, but we will be using that as we move forward. Then if initial state exists in the user's adapter here, we're calling that get initial state. So we get that. Now I'm going to scroll up for some extra room. And once we get up here to the top, I'm going to paste in quite a bit as we get started with our user's API slice. But I'll go over this. It only has the one endpoint right now. But see, we're using the API slice that we import right here. And then as we define our user's API slice variable right here that we can export, 
we use that API slice to inject the endpoints into that original API slice. And that's where we define our endpoints. And we're only going to have one as we start out here. So we're passing in the builder and it's our get users query. So there we have builder.query and here you can see the query. It's just going to the user's endpoint. And remember we already provided the base query URL inside of our API slice, which was our local host at port 3500. So here we just have to provide that endpoint. Following the documentation, we can validate the status. Now you may not have seen this before and it's a little strange because even as they note in their documentation currently, uh, their tricky API, as they refer to it, always gives this 200 status, even if his error might be true. But this is how they say to check or validate the status. So this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm making sure there is not an error and I'm also making sure that we do have a 200 status here. Now this keep unused data for, and I've got it set very short to five seconds. I'm only going to do this in development, but you could remove this later on. The default is 60 seconds, which would be more like what you would want when an app is deployed. And that's just talking about whether the data will be referred to in the cache or if it needs to request new data. So we're just not keeping it that long here during development. Transform response. This is very important, especially as we're working with MongoDB and getting data from our back end. So here we get the response from the query. And then you can see I'm defining load, loaded users inside of this function that we can call inside of the transform response. And what I'm doing is mapping over the data and I'm setting the user ID property to the value of the user dot underscore ID. And the reason is, especially with that data I talked about, the normalized data using an ID array, it's looking for an ID property, not an underscore ID property. So if we didn't do that, it wouldn't work out right. And then of course we just return the user there. And then we use that user's adapter and it says set all and we're providing these loaded users, which is the response data that has that new value at the ID property. So now we have returned that data and put it in our user's adapter and it's stored as normalized data with IDs and entities. Now here this last part just provides the tags that can be invalidated. Now you could possibly get a result here that doesn't have IDs. Now that's probably when an error has occurred or you've got something you didn't expect. How I'm handling that is I'm just checking to see if there is an IDs property with optional chaining. And essentially if there isn't, I'm just returning the user and the ID list instead of the user type and ID list along with mapping over those IDs so any one ID could invalidate it. Essentially, if we don't get IDs, we probably didn't get the data we wanted anyway. So that's just kind of a fail safe. And now if you remember or know from RTK query, it is going to create a hook based on this endpoint for us automatically. So now let's scroll down to the bottom and we can export that hook. So we'll have export const and it automatically generates a hook that starts with use and ends with query if it's a query. And then it's whatever we named it, which above was get users. So this is use get users query. And before we're finished with this slice, let's go ahead and create some selectors. And I'm going to paste this in and go over it. It is exactly what I did in my Redux course as well. But what we've got first is select users result. And now we're using the users API slice, referring to the endpoints, calling get users, and then chaining the select method to it. So this gets the query result. After that, we're creating a memoize selector. Notice we're using create selector here that we imported above, and we pass in that result, select users result. And then we have a function that has users result and it comes in and grabs the data. Now I'm going to press Alt Z so this wraps so you can see my full note here, which is normalized state object with IDs and entities that are referred to. Notice this doesn't have an export, so we're not exporting this at all. We're just creating that memoized selector here to use in the next part. 
and this is with git selectors so it says git selectors creates these selectors and we rename them with aliases during the destructuring here so it creates these automatically we have select all select by id and select ids and we're renaming them to apply them to users so select all users select user by id and select user IDs. Now, how we're creating that it says pass in a selector that returns the user slice of the state. So we're using get selectors on the users adapter. We have state coming in. Here's that select users data where we created the memoize selector. So we're using that here with state. And then you can see the null coalescing operator. So if that's null, then it just goes to initial state. But otherwise, these are memoized selectors. And they can come in handy when we want to optimize our application. So now that I've saved this file, I'm actually going to press Control A to copy everything we've put in here. And then Control, I said Control A to copy. It's Control A to select, Control C to copy. And then we're going to go to the notes directory and inside of it we'll create a notes api slice.js and I'm going to paste in what we had in our users api slice. So I'll once again press alt z so that wraps but now what I'm going to do is highlight the word user and now that I have that highlighted I'm going to press control shift and the letter l and then I'm just going to type note and so you can see it changed every instance of user in this file to note. And by doing so, I just took a shortcut to creating my notes adapter because it's basically identical to the user's adapter, at least as we get started here, but we're just referring to a note instead of a user. And as I scroll down, I don't see any problem and we'll have a use get notes query that is created and everything will be created here, including those memoized selectors that we might use, including select note IDs, select note by ID, and select all notes. Now to quickly review how I did that, so you don't have to highlight every instance of note, there's two things to take into account. One is the selection, and so I selected all occurrences with Control, Shift, and the letter L, select all occurrences, which you can also do from the selection menu. That does not take into account wherever note or user was capitalized or wherever it was lowercase as we see here and notice all of mine changed automatically I'm doing that with an extension I'll save this file just so I don't lose any changes let's click the extension over here in VS code and I'll search for multiple and there it is multiple cursor case preserve I use this extension so when I select multiple cases, essentially when the word user was lowercase or uppercase, and I replaced it with the word note, I just had to type the word note, and it applied the uppercase in the same areas that user had uppercase, and of course lowercase the same. So this is a very useful extension, multiple cursor case preserve if you want to apply that to your instance of VS Code as well. But that helped us quickly and easily create our notes API slice to get started. Now in the previous tutorial, we already created a users list component and a notes list component. Let's go to the users list component. And you can see this was just a placeholder so far. Now I want to come to the top of the file and I'm going to import that hook that RTK query automatically created for us that we exported the use get users query. And now inside of our functional component, the very first thing I'm going to do is actually use that query. And you can see we're going to get several things from it. We're going to get data back that I'm going to rename as users. We're also going to have several states that we monitor here. We can check an is loading, an is success, and an is error. And if we have an error, we can find out what the error is. And all of this will help us conditionally render some content. So underneath, I'm going to define some content with let content variable defined here. And then we'll check is loading. And if that is true, we're just going to set the content to loading. Or if you have a spinner component you like, you could use that there as well. Next is error. We're going to have content set equal to 
a paragraph with an error. Now let me press Alt-Z once again to wrap this so you can see everything and I'm checking to see if there is an error here in the class name. So you can see I'm applying two different class names based on that. If there is no error, if that is false, this is off screen. And if there is an error, I'm applying the error message class and then we're displaying the message itself. Now notice the error doesn't just have dot message, it has data first. So we're going error dot data dot message. And I'm using optional chaining there just to be safe. And now let's replace the return here inside of our component. And instead, I'm going to paste in what happens if we have success. I'll delete that extra line. And let's look at this. So if success, then we're destructuring the IDs from that user's data. Remember, we renamed the data that we received from our hook users. This would also have an entities that we could destructure here as well. So the IDs is just an array of the user IDs. Now we're creating our table content and we're making sure there are IDs that they have length on that array. And if so, then we're mapping over those IDs. And you can see we're passing the user ID in here from map, and then we're providing a user component that we haven't created yet. And all this user component receives is the user ID. Now it has to have a key as well as we map over, but we're providing the user ID for both of those. And if there is no length to our IDs array, then this is just null. And then we have content here that's on multiple lines, so that's why we have our parentheses. And you can see I'm creating a table. Now this table has several classes applied that apply to the CSS that I have provided. You can see usernames, roles, and edit. And this is all inside the table head. And then we have the table body that just gets our table content, which was our mapped data from above. Now, something to note about the tables in this project is I am setting them to display contents which lets me flatten the table to actually apply CSS grid to that. Now, if you have not done that before, you might be interested in the CSS. You might also be interested in the final project of my CSS course on my channel where I do that exact same thing. So grid needs a flattened structure. Tables are not usually a flattened structure, but you can provide a flattened structure to grid if you set some of these elements that are the parents to that display contents. And you can see at the bottom we are exporting the user list component and that should finish the user list.js. Now we still need to create the user component that we're using here inside of map or we will have an error and this just won't work out right. So now let's create a user .js file. I'm going to paste in some imports that we can talk about and then we'll create the component underneath. So we are using font awesome icons as we previously set that up in the last tutorial. So here at the top I'm importing the font awesome icon component and then the icon that I want to use. I've also got use navigate from react router and then we're bringing in use selector from Redux. This is where the IDs will come in handy because we're also bringing in that memoize selector we created, which is select user by ID. So underneath using React ES7 snippets, I can type RAFCE, press tab, and we get our functional component named user. And we know we're bringing in a user ID. So now let's start just inside of the component and we're going to bring in that use selector and we're going to use that select user by ID selector, pass the state and we pass the state and that user ID here and we get our user back. Also, we're going to pull the navigate function from use navigate. And now instead of the return that we have here, let's start out with an if statement. We can say if we have a user. So if that user does exist, we're going to do something here, but then let's also have an else return null just in case we don't have a user. And now I'm going to scroll to give ourselves a little more room to put some things inside of the successful part of the if statement. And we'll start out by defining a few things. One is a handle edit, and this is going to call navigate, and it's going to go to dash 
users, and then whatever the user ID is, is going to finish out that URL. And we can set that up in our app.js with React Router. The next thing I'm doing is pulling all of the roles from the user roles array, setting them to a string, and I'm also replacing the commas with a comma and a space. So really what we're doing here is making it just look a little bit better with formatting. So instead of all scrunched together, we get a comma and a space instead of just a comma. Then I'm defining a cell status, and this is helping me set an inactive class or not essentially on the active user. And now let's go ahead and put in the return data that will use those. And so here we see a table row being created that will go into the previous table that we started in the users list. And now this row has several classes. Let me see if I can press Alt Z and get a little more to display there. There wasn't much wrapping, but what we've got are some table cells here and we're setting that cell status in each one if they are active or not. Likewise, we're using that icon that we imported here, the pin to square that we would see, which kind of indicates edit and we're calling handle edit if that is clicked. So let's go ahead and save this file and let's not forget to import it into our users list as well. So we need to import user from dot slash user. And after we save that, we're ready to check this out in our application, but we can't just start up the front end without the back end. And the last version we have of our back end code is the code repository from lesson four. So open up another instance of Visual Studio Code. And in that instance, you want lesson four. I'll drag mine over right now, as you can see it now on the screen. And I've got lesson four here in the package JSON. I could make this full screen as, here as well. So now that I've got the lesson four code up in another instance of Visual Studio Code, I can press control in the back tick, type npm run dev, and we'll make sure our back end code is running and it's ready to respond now to the front end code that we're creating. So now that I have that running, I'll minimize that and we've saved our changes here. So I am ready to press control in the back tick as well in this instance of Visual Studio Code and type npm start to start up our React app. Now I'm going to drag it to the left as I have a browser here on the right and then we should see our app start up. And we do. The font might be a little bit larger than you saw from the previous lesson as we've applied that extra CSS. But now we're going to need to enter in the URL to navigate to the dash. So it would be at slash dash. And from there we can see what the employees or the staff of Dandy's repair shop will see when they log in, except for maybe some auth details that we haven't added yet. And we should be able to navigate to the users list by clicking this view user settings. So if we do that, now we see our grid table here. And once again, I'm taking that HTML that is a table and I'm turning it into a grid and you might be interested in the CSS for that. But overall, we've got three employees that I added. You could add your own using Postman as we had seen previously in tutorials as we were building the back end. And you can see it displays their username, their roles, and the edit area. Now this edit area won't currently take you to any page. It would probably give you an error because we haven't created that page yet to edit that information. But our users list is working as we expect it to. So now I'm going to drag Visual Studio Code back to a full screen and close the terminal. I'll just leave it running because we'll eventually check that again. And now we're ready to update our notes list. So at the top, we need to use that same query that was created in the notes API slice, just like we did with the query that was created for the users API slice. So now we have use get notes query. And now inside of the functional component, you should notice this will be much like we did for the users list. So what we have here is that use get notes query. We're bringing in data, but we're renaming the data notes instead of users. We're going to check is loading, is success, is error, and if there's an error, we'll look at that error. So I'll scroll down once again, press Alt Z, so any code going off the screen wraps to the next line. 
and we're checking is loading and once again providing a loading status if that is the case for content. Likewise, we're checking is error and we're applying those same classes for an error message if it needs to display. And remember, the error has dot data dot message instead of just error dot message as you might be used to. And now I'll scroll up because we're going to replace this return and we'll replace it with what happens if we have success. And here for is success, we're once again destructuring the IDs from the notes data. So this could have IDs and entities. And in the future, we'll actually come back and use the entities here as well, but we're keeping it simple for now. And then we have the table content that we're creating in the same way we created table content for that users table. And we're passing the note ID into a note component that we have yet to create. You can see this table is a little larger here and it has some extra classes applied, which is why you see this wrapping down. So we have more columns that we'll be able to see on a larger screen, but I have applied a media query that hides some of the columns for a smaller screen. And then we have that table content going into the table here as well. And then we export the notes list. And that wraps up everything inside of this notes list. And of course, if I went over that too fast, you'll see all of this code available in the course resources. And now let's create our note component. So note.js, and we'll start with the imports, much like our user.js component. We're bringing in font awesome. We have the pin to square icon and use navigate from React Router DOM. We also have use selector and now a memoized select note by ID from our notes API slice. I'll type RAFCE using React ES7 snippets extension. We quickly get our functional component. And then inside this functional component, we'll start by using our use selector hook, and then we'll select note by ID, pass in the note ID here. Then we're also pulling the navigate function from use navigate. And now we'll put a conditional here instead of just the return. So we'll say if we have a note, we're going to do something and then we'll say else return and we'll just return null. Now inside the successful if part, let's go ahead and define a few things here. We have a little more data we're handling inside of note than we do with users. I'm going to press Alt Z once again and I'll even press Control B to hide that file tree temporarily but it still wraps down just because it's taking a little longer here with the dates. So we've got a created date and an updated date that we get from MongoDB about each record. And here we're applying this to locale string and here I'm providing the US area for this. Now you could provide your area if you want to as far as our stakeholder Dandy's Repair Shop, I'm considering them to be in the US as well. Now we're providing the day value as numeric and the month as long for both of these. And then we have a handle edit function that is going to navigate us to dash notes and then the note ID. And that's where we would be editing the information for the note. And we'll eventually need to add that routing to our app.js as well. Now underneath this, we'll put in the successful return. And this once again is creating a table row. You'll want to apply these classes if you want to use my CSS. Notice here, I've got a ternary based on whether the note is completed or not. So it gets a different class based on that completion. Other than that, we're displaying these others inside of table cells, but then they also have classes based on what each piece of information is. And eventually we have a table cell that has that font awesome icon that indicates an edit once again, and it calls handle edit. Now with those changes saved, I'll press control B to show the file tree again. Back in the notes list, we need to come back to the top and import note so it can be used. And it comes from dot slash note. After we've saved that, we should be able to see our notes list. Now remember, if you're creating users and notes with Postman, you wanna create the users first because you have to have those users to create notes so far. And that's what I've done. So I'll drag this to the left and I can see an error because inside of note, I forgot that we were bringing in the note ID so I didn't put it at the top and it needs to be coming in as a prop. So here we've got note ID as well. Let's save that, 
easy to forget when you're moving quickly. M move it back over. And here's our users page once again. So this is working. Let's go back to the home and let's see if we can view the tech notes. Yes, we can. Notice the completed here is at the top. That's something we'll talk about in a second. Right now, they're just in the order they were created. So we've got Myth Mrs. Smith's computer. We've got Foo City Schools, which is the city where Dandy's repair shop is. And we've got Bob Jones's iPhone. Now, we just see three columns here. So let me drag this to the full screen and you can see the media query is actually hiding some of the other columns based on the screen width. So now we can see the created, updated, and the owner of the note, who the note was assigned to essentially. And then we've still got the edit icons over here. Now that we've looked at this a little bit, let me drag it back to the smaller view. We can still see the status here, either completed or open. It would be nice, probably a good feature to think about and include, even if our stakeholder didn't ask for it directly, would be once a note is completed, to not leave it at the top anymore just because it was created first. Let's put the open notes on the top and any that are completed down at the bottom instead. So I'll drag the code back over and we can do that inside of our notes API slice where we have our entity adapter here, where we create the entity adapter, we can provide a sort comparer function. So I'll paste this in and we can see what it is doing. So this is much like your traditional JavaScript sort. We take A and B, and then we're looking to see if the A completed value is equal to the B completed. If it is, it gets a zero. Otherwise, then it's checking this once again, looking at A completed, and it either gives it a one or a minus one. So it may be just a little more complicated than that traditional sort that you're used to. But what we're doing essentially is putting the completed at the bottom. So if it is true, otherwise the open status is at the top. So if we just put this in, and then we drag this back over and check our page. We'll need to refresh to query that data once again. Now Mrs. Smith's computer is at the bottom of our list and any others we would switch to completed would instantly come below as well. We have covered a lot in a short amount of time as far as Redux and RTK query goes. Now in the next lesson, we'll cover mutations, which also covers the editing and posting and deleting. So the CRUD operations, but those are the mutations, not the queries, as they're referred to in RTK query. Our starter code is the completed code from Lesson 6. There are no new dependencies today, but we've got a lot to cover, and I'll need to keep things moving. Feel free to pause the video as we go, and remember all of the source code will be available under Lesson 7 in the course resources. Here we're starting in the package JSON, and the only thing we need to do here is increment this to Lesson 7 today. No new dependencies to add. From there, let's move on to the user stories. While we've made progress on many of the user stories we list here, and really this is that informal list we talked about in previous lessons, we've only completed a couple that we can really say that are completed. One of those is to add a public facing page with the basic contact info. We did that in the last tutorial. And then we also had provide a welcome page after login. And I said in the last tutorial, actually, we did this two tutorials ago as we created the React app and just provided those basic things and some routing to those. But today, I think we'll complete a few more. Let's look at number 10 here. Notes are assigned to specific employees. We'll be able to create notes and create that assignment today. Number 11, notes have a ticket number, title, note body, created and updated dates. Now we previously set that up on the back end with our data models, but now we'll complete that for the front end as well. As well as number 12, notes are either open or completed. So when we create a note, we'll assign that. And number 13, users can be employees, managers, or admins. So when we are able to create users with a form, we'll also be able to complete that. So number 10 through 13 should be completed today. Some of these others we are very close to completing, but maybe we can't say it's completed yet because it also deals with roles and protections and things we haven't applied through authentication and authorization yet. Or there are things just like provide easy navigation, which we have done somewhat 
out with our users list and notes list, but we're not finished yet. We need to provide some more navigation throughout the application. So now with these two boxes checked and our target set on lines 10 through 13 here, or I should say goals or stories 10 through 13, let's go ahead and save our user stories.md file and let's move back into the application. So we're inside of the source directory and then inside of that we want to open up the features directory and let's go to the users directory and the users API slice. We have already added our endpoint for getting the users but that's the only one we added so far. So let's go ahead and add the create, update, and delete endpoints as well. So let's find where we started this. We have get users. This is all inside of the endpoints definition of the slice that we have created here. This is the user API slice that's injecting endpoints into the main API slice for Redux and RTK query. So underneath this get users endpoint that we defined, we can put in the other endpoints. And I need some room to do this. And I just put in all three. They're not nearly as big as the get users. So we'll just go over these. The first one is add a new user. Now notice this is a builder.mutation. Previously we had builder.query, but now this is a builder.mutation, and that's what these other methods will be. So we're passing in some initial user data, and we're going to the user's endpoint, we're using the post method, and then we're just passing in that data in the body. After that, we're saying we're invalidating tags now. So this will force the cache that we're using with RTK query and Redux to update. And what we're doing is saying the user list will be invalidated, so that will need to be updated. After that, let's look at the update user endpoint here. So another builder.mutation, we're passing in that user data again, so it looks very much like the post as far as this endpoint is concerned. We're using the patch method, and here's the user data inside of the body. We're invalidating tags here, but now it's not the list. Now we can specify the ID of the user that we're passing in, and we get that with the arg parameter that we have right here inside of this anonymous function for invalidates tags. So we specify that right there, and it invalidates that one user ID. So we know that needs updated again. And remember, we specified the IDs as well as the list here inside of the provides tags for our get users query. So we had the list, and then we also mapped over the IDs. So we can invalidate those as well. After that, we have the delete user. Again, very similar. All it needs to be passed in is the ID here. So instead of spreading in full initial user data, we're just spreading in the ID. Actually, we're destructuring. We're not even spreading. And then we have the user's endpoint, the delete method, and all the body needs is that ID. And then once again, we're invalidating the specific ID of the user. And now as we scroll down, remember RTK query automatically creates hooks for us. So we had our get users endpoint and it created use get users query. That was a query. Now remember these others are mutations. So as I put these in here, you'll see now we have use add new user mutation. So it's named after what we created as far as an endpoint, which was add new user, and then they always append use at the beginning for the hook and mutation at the end, just like query was appended at the end of our get users query. So we have use add new user mutation, use update user mutation, and use delete user mutation. And we'll be able to use all of those today as we create our forms. And now that you understand the additional endpoints we added to our users API slice, let's do the same thing very quickly for our notes API slice. So once again, we're inside of the endpoints builder, and then we have the git notes builder query. So we'll come down right underneath it and we'll paste in the other three, which you could create as well or grab from my source code. But we've got add new note, update note, and then finally delete note. And this has the similar logic that we just went over for the user's endpoints as well. So nothing new there. Now let's come down to the export. And we're going to export these three new mutations that we have here as well.
Now before we create our forms, let's go ahead and add some placeholder components. I'll go back to the users directory and create a new file. And this first file will just be named edit user.js and I'll use my ES7 React snippets extension to quickly create a component and this is just a placeholder component so I will save the file and now I'm going to create another new file and this is going to be called new user form.js and once again I'll use RAFCE to create a new user form just a placeholder component for now so we have edit user and new user form files as placeholders. Now let's do the same thing in the notes directory and I'm going to create edit note, if I could spell edit correctly, .js and RAFCE with ES7 React snippets and I quickly get that functional component placeholder. And then I want one more and this is going to be new note.js. Notice I did not name that new note form. It's just new note.js. And there's a reason for this. I'll do RAFCE. We'll come back to that reason soon, but let's save that. And now we have four placeholders for our form data. So we have two for notes and two for users. Now I wanted to do this so we could go ahead and add the routing inside of our app.js file. Now to do that, we first need to import these new components. So at the top, I'm going to import first edit user. And after we get that, I'm going to import new user form. And then after that, well, I don't, I'm not quite at the end. There we go. I'm just getting rid of that semicolon that I'm trying not to use as often anymore. Then I'm going to import edit note. And then finally, we need to add import new note. And remember, it is not new note form. It is just new note for now. Okay, with those four imports, we can now add our routing below. We've already created our notes route and our users route. And at this point, I think I want to put notes below the users route. So I'm just going to switch those around. It won't make any difference which is above the other here. So we have the distinct routes of both users and notes just because I'm going to do users first here. So let's go ahead and add a route. And now inside of this route, we need to have a path. And this path is going to be equal to the ID parameter. So we're sending the ID parameter and that will be part of the path. So we'll go to the dash, we'll be at the root of the website or web app, and then we'll have slash dash slash users. And finally, the user ID all inside of the URL. Now besides that, we need to specify the element. So we'll say element equals, and inside of this, we will put edit user. And then we'll have our edit user component. And instead of this closing route, I think we can just close it out inside of the same. So we have the slash greater than instead of the closing route symbol there at the end or the closing route tag. Now once we've done this, let's copy this down and we'll have one more path inside of our users path. And this will just be to new. So we could have slash dash slash users slash new. And this should be the new user form. And now I'm going to copy both of these and put them underneath our notes list as well because it will have the same path pattern for notes. So it will either go to the ID parameter in the URL or new. So we just need to change what we have here as far as the components. So we'll have edit note or we will have new note. Once again, it is not new note form. Before we begin building our forms, there's one more thing we need to do. I'm going to go ahead and collapse the features directory. We need to be just inside of this top source directory and create a new directory named config. Now inside of the config directory, I'm going to create one file named roles.js. And I will paste this in. It's very simple. We are exporting 
an object named roles. And this would be a lookup object. And notice the key and actually the string value are the same. So roles.employee equals employee. We're going to use this in more than one file. So I wanted to just create this object one time and put it inside of a roles.js that we can export. And then we can use it in the other files we need. Let's go back to the features directory and back inside of the notes directory. And we're ready to go ahead and update this new user form component. I'm going to start at the top with the imports. Again, I'm going to move faster and paste things today and then go over what I am pasting in. And of course, feel free to pause, slow down, or look at the source code that I'm supplying for this lesson. But we're importing use state and use effect for this new user form. We're also bringing in the use add new user mutation that we created inside of the user slice. I'm bringing in use navigate from React Router. And I've also got a font awesome icon because we're going to use a save icon from that. And then the roles that we just created are going to be used in this form as well. Being a new user form, that means we're going to have some new input for the user. So I've got a couple of regex constants that I am creating as well. Again, this won't be a public facing form. This will be something Dandy or his manager will use to create for new staff members to create a new user. So we just need to put some guidance here as far as what can be entered for a user or a password. But we're not being as strict as we might be for a public facing uh, new user creation. Okay, once we have those regexes, we're ready to start working with our use add new user mutation inside of the component. So now inside of this new user form component, I'll paste that in. And we'll take a quick look at what it does and what it brings into the component. So this, unlike the query, gives us an add new user function that we can now call when we need it inside of the component. So it is not activated immediately. And then there is an object that, of course, delivers the status after we call this function. So we have is loading, is success, is error, and error, much like a query. But the query was called immediately when we use that inside of our list components. This is not called until we're ready to call it. Underneath this hook, let's go ahead and paste in the other hook that we get from React Router, which is just pulling the navigate function that we will also call whenever we're ready to call it from use navigate. And now we've got some individual pieces of state that I'm using use state for. We've got the username, but then we're also going to have a valid username that is only going to be true, of course, when it meets our regex standards. Same for password and valid password. And then we've got the roles and and set roles so we can set those and we're defaulting to employee right away for that value. But notice it is an array so there could be more than one role assigned to an employee or a staff member. And we did bring in use effect and that's going to help us validate our username and password. So we're just going to check both of those so we have username and password as dependencies in each one of these. And as they're changed we're just testing those regexes that we defined. And in one more use of use use effect, we're going to go ahead and check that is success status that we get after we call our mutation. So if it is successful, we're going to empty out all of that individual state that we're keeping here really. And we're going to navigate back to our users list that as that is at the dash slash users URL. Now is success does change. And when it does change, that's what will trigger this, you will get a warning or a complaint if you do not include navigate in here, although we know bringing in the navigate function from React Router will not change. So I just put the navigate in here as a dependency to remove that warning. Now let's go ahead and scroll up to have some more room and I'll put in the handlers that we're going to use. Instead of starting them with handle, I started them with on. And then we have on username changed, which just sets the username. On password change, which sets the password, but the roles are a little different. And that's because it's a select and then we're doing something specific with them. So let's break this down. We have on roles change that also receives the event, but then the values we get, we need to build an array from those values because when it comes in with the event.target, dot selected options, it is an HTML collection and that won't give us the same thing we need. So we're using array from 
And then array from not only takes that value, but it also has a function. And then we can just get the option dot value from that and create an array stored in values. And that's what we need. So then we set the roles to those values. After that, let's go ahead and put in our save and we define a can save before we actually allow the on save users clicked to really kick in and do what we need it to because here we check if can save. So let's look at this can save. I'm going to press control B to hide the file tree just so we can see that full line here. But we've got can save defined and notice we've created an array and inside that array, we put the roles.length because that's an array. We've got valid username and valid password. Then we're calling the every method on the array and passing in Boolean. So we're essentially saying if all of these are true, you could say if roles.length and valid username and valid password, but I kind of like this method for doing it, sticking them all in an array and then having dot every with Boolean. And then we do have the ampersand and we're also checking the is loading status. So we're saying, and if we're not loading, then can save will be true. And then we check that can save value inside of our on save user clicked. And this is where we call our add new user mutation. And once we call that, we're passing in the username, password, and the roles. Now, before we create our JSX for the form, we've got just a few more things to define. So I'll put those in here and we'll quickly look we are going to have a select, so it needs options. Now, previously we discussed how to get the value out of that, and that's what we had up here inside of our on roles changed. Well, what we're looking at here is object.values, and then we pass in that roles object that we defined inside of our config directory and imported. So now when we pass that in, we're just getting the values, which was employee, and manager and admin. And for each one of those, we're creating an option that can be inside of that drop down menu that we should have. And we're actually going to display all of those. So we should be able to select more than one. And we'll get to that in a second. But first, we have some other things that we're defining here. And these are classes that we may or may not want to apply to some elements in the form. One of those is an error class. So we're just checking to see if we have error and which class will be applied here, either error message or off screen. Another is the valid user class, the same for valid password class and valid roles class. So we're just checking to see if those are valid. And if they are, then we're not really applying anything. But if they aren't, we're giving the form input incomplete class, which will just outline those in red and highlight the fact that something needs to be completed with those inputs. I'm going to replace our return right here and just return content. So now I want to define the content variable. It's going to take up some space and we're actually going to need to scroll through that. So I'll put it right here and give one extra line before the return. And now let's look at each part of this form that is held inside of the content variable. Notice I have got a fragment here as the parent for valid JSX. And the first thing we're putting in is a paragraph with the error class. And that error class is defined above. So it's either off screen or if we have an error, it's going to display that error message at the top of the form. And remember, we gave some detailed error messages from our back end that it can provide to the front end. So these will be displayed at the top of the form if any of those errors do occur. Then we have our form. So here is a class name form. Remember the class names that you see here are going to relate back to the CSS that I've created. You can use my CSS or you can create your own as well. So my class names are relating back to my CSS. Here on submit for the form calls the on save user clicked. So that should work for the entire form. And then we have the top, the title, which is new user. And then we have a button. And this is where we're using that font awesome icon with the save icon. And notice this button has a class name, a title, and then we set the disabled. And so if can save is false, 
we're using the exclamation mark here to flip that value, disabled would be true. So if we are not meeting the requirements for saving the new user, then this button will be disabled. So we're getting double use out of that can save variable. After that, we have a label and you should have a label for each input. And what we're doing here is providing the username and some details here. We're saying it must be three to 20 letters. And then inside of this, we have a class name and here's that valid user class value that might be applied if there is an issue with the username or if it's just blank, it's highlighting that it needs to be filled out. We've got your basic attributes here, including autocomplete set to off because we don't want other previous names popping up. And this is a controlled input. So we have the username state here and we're calling on username changed during the on change if that happens. Very similar for password. We give some details here, four to 12 characters, including these characters right here. And after that, it's a controlled input and the same for the valid password class. Now we get to the roles. What I want to highlight here with the roles is that multiple is set to true. So you can select more than one value and the size is set to three. So it will display three values without being a dropdown. All three values will be visible. And then it is a controlled input. So we have roles and on roles changed. And then we're bringing in those options that we defined above. And with that, we have completed our new user form. Let's go back to the file tree now and highlight that edit user component. Let's go to the top of the file and we'll bring in our imports first and not nearly as many for this particular component. We'll have use params from React Router because we're going to get that user ID parameter out of the URL. And then we're going to bring in use selector from React Redux and select user by ID. So notice we are not bringing in a query. We're actually going to pull the data, the user data from the state, and we're going to get that by selecting the user ID. So now I'm just going to highlight the return and I'm going to replace the content of this particular component. And there's not a lot because we're going to use another form that we haven't created yet. And that is the edit user form. So what we've got here, and I'll go ahead and save, is pulling that ID from the use params from React Router that will give us the ID value that is inside of the URL. And then we're passing that ID value in where we're using the use selector hook and select user by ID. Remember, that is a memoized query there that we created in, or a memoized selector that we created inside of our user's API slice. So we pass in that ID and we get the user in return that has that ID. Now, what we're checking here for content is do we have a user? If we do, we're going to pull in the edit user form that we haven't created yet. But if not, we're just going to provide loading. If you had a loading spinner that you wanted to use here instead, that's fine. This is just a small paragraph that says loading. And then we're returning that content. So this is ensuring we have the user data before we need it inside of the edit user form. And the reason that is helpful is because we want to pre-populate that form. We need the existing data to show up in the form and this will confirm we have it as we render that edit user form. So now let's create the component we need. So we'll come over here and create a new component and call it edit user form.js. As you might expect, this will be very much like the new user form. We're essentially editing that same information. So I'm going to go fast, but highlight the changes. We're pulling in basically the same things with a few changes here for the imports. We've got use state and use effect again, but now we're pulling in the use update user mutation and the use delete user mutation instead of the add new user mutation. And then we've got use navigate again. We've got font awesome, but then we're pulling in not only the save icon, but also the trash can icon icon if we want to delete. Then we're once again pulling in the roles from our config directory. After that, we're going to have this same regex at the top because we're going to need to check those same fields for the same things once again. Underneath this, I'm just going to type RAFCE to go ahead and get a start on this edit user form component. And we're going to destructure 
the user as we bring that user in as we were doing that inside of edit user we see here the edit user form and we're passing in the user as a prop I almost well I need to control Z to undo that I didn't mean to drag that over but the user gets passed in as a prop for the edit user form okay back in the edit user form we're using the two hooks now use update user mutation and use delete user mutation they might be called at different times but we need some different identification for each so as I paste these hooks in I want to highlight that the first one update user just has is loading is success is error and error that we might expect here and I can put this on a separate line but after that the second one use delete user mutation notice I am renaming the is success to is del success and the same for is error and the error itself as we might need all of those now we've got our separate functions that we can call to delete user and update user and now I'm going to scroll up for more room and underneath those I paste in the navigate that we're pulling from use navigate as we did with the new user form and then we've got some state and it's essentially the same state that we had in the new user form with one addition and that is active and set active this has a default value of active inside of our data model when we create a new user but now we want to be able to change that to quickly disable an employee as our stakeholder dandy has requested so if he were to let somebody go he might want to remove their access immediately they may still be assigned to notes and he may not want to have to make all those changes before he deactivates a user so this is the state here that will help us do that inside of the form and then we will have the same use effect underneath that checks for the valid username and valid password oh I had it before already too I had grabbed it before so I'll just remove that once again sometimes I get a little ahead of myself when I'm copying and pasting after that we've got use effect now this use effect checks the is success status but remember we have two mutations now so we have to consider both of those and so we're still just using one use effect and it's checking the is success status or is delete success remember the is success is for the update once again passing in that navigate function to avoid any complaints inside of our console about that but we're checking here is success for the update or is delete success for the delete and now as I look at each one of these they're essentially doing the same thing and sometimes we can get caught up in that when we're writing code we write one and then we look at the other so just a quick refactor here we could say if is success or if is delete success and then we should be able to remove one of these blocks because the rest of it the consequences of those being successful it, they're both identical so we remove that and now this is a little smaller but it does the same thing I'm going to scroll for a little more room and underneath this we will put in our handlers and they are very much like what we saw in the new user form as well so we've got on username changed and on password changed no difference there on roles changed where we're doing the same thing with the roles as before with array.from but then we do have on active changed which is new but it just sets the previous active status to the opposite because it's a checkbox so it's either active true or false essentially and then we've got on save user clicked here we have to check to see if we have a password because we do not want to require the password to be updated every time we edit the user so it's just optional and that means we must call update user two different ways one with and one without the password then we also have on delete user click that calls that delete user mutation and just passes in the ID scrolling up a little bit now just underneath that delete user let's go ahead and put in some more where we define can save this can save variable is once again needing to check to see if we have a password and if we do can save is going to be using that valid password inside of the array that calls dot every with the boolean notice over here there is the is loading status as well I'm going to press control B just so we can see everything on the screen and then can save has the array without the valid password in it if password is not being created as well so we're checking either way there and then we have the same classes that we did before as far as error class valid user class valid password class valid roles class 
Then we're creating some error content. And notice there is a difference here. It's whether we have an error.data.message or a delete error. So this is based on the update or this is based on the delete mutation. And then instead of a ternary, this is a null coalescing operator. So if the error or delete error are essentially undefined or null, then we'll just have this empty string here that would be in the class and it won't change the presentation. Or I said class, this is actually the error content itself. So the content would be empty if that was null or undefined. And now speaking of content, that's what we need to return next. So I'll just modify this return right here and change it to content. And let's define our JSX with the content variable. And this of course takes up more room than the screen has. So I'll scroll back up. This is very similar to our new user form, except in the edit user, we've got a couple of additions. So here's that error content with the error class provided if it exists. Otherwise that off screen class hides it off the screen. And then we've got our form. This form not only has our save button as the previous new user form did, it also has our delete button. And this is where we use that trash can icon. And this will call, cause that delete user mutation to be called, just like the save user here will cause the update mutation to be called. Then inside of the form, we've got the same inputs except for the addition of this active checkbox. So here's the checkbox. Box, it is still controlled with checked either active or of course not, whatever is there. And then we've got the on active changed handler being called. Other than that, we still have the assigned roles. It is still set to multiple true, so we could assign more than one role. We're displaying all three roles at the same time, so it's not a drop down as much as it is a list where more than one can be selected. With those changes in place, I'm going to save the file and now I want to bring over another instance of Visual Studio Code that has our backend code in it. So I'll bring this over to the screen. This is from lesson four, the last time we touched the backend code. I'm going to press control in the back tick and go ahead and start our backend development server here. This is the REST API that's a big part of our MERN stack application. It's now connected to MongoDB. It's running on port 3500. Remember, this is the code we finished up in lesson four, and I've opened a separate instance of Visual Studio Code to run that. So now, if I want to, I'm just going to minimize that and look at our existing code here. I'll go ahead and press Control and the back tick, and I'll type npm start for our React app, and we'll see if we can view the forms we just created or if we have any errors. Now I'm going to drag this over to the left, and we've got our application running here on the right. We should be able to go to the dash that we've previously created. And now we should be able to go to the users list. So let's check that out. And we've got employees in here that I previously created that you should have seen in the last tutorial. We've got Dan D, the stakeholder. He's the owner. So he's an admin as well as a manager and an employee. So you can see different roles are applied to the same user. We've got Mark, who's an employee and a manager. And then we've got Joe, who has the role of employee. Now I'm going to drag this over to the left because there's some things we need to highlight as far as using Redux before we get into each individual form and how we maintain that state. So I'm going to press Control Shift I to open up DevTools. Notice I really shrank the application because I want to use Redux DevTools. If you don't have those, of course you want to install those and I can put a link to those in the course resources as well. But here I'm highlighting the state in Redux DevTools and I can open up this API and notice there is a subscriptions right here. And if I open this up, we've got get users that we needed our get users query to populate this users list. And inside of get users, we have a subscription set right here and it gets this long string. Now, let me go ahead and go to Dandy's page. And here we've got the edit user screen that we created. Notice there is no subscription, and now it went back to loading after just five seconds. Why is all of that happening? Well, let's take a look at why that is happening. So to do that, I'm going to close this out, drag our application back to the right, and drag Visual Studio Code back to full screen, close the terminal, and let's look at our user's API slice once again. And if you remember, 
I set the keep, keep unused data for to five seconds. And I wanted to highlight this in development because after five seconds, we went back to that loading screen. It only kept that data for five seconds. And that's because there was no active subscription to the data. So after the, all of the subscriptions are gone, that's when this countdown kicks in. Now the default value is 60 seconds. So if there still wasn't a subscription to our users list, after 60 seconds, we would use the state of our editor's form and it would go back, or our edit user form, and it would go back to loading. We don't want that either. So there's a couple of solutions here. First of all, I'm going to just remove this as we no longer want it inside of here and the default keep unused data for 60 seconds will be fine but we'll see how we can keep an active subscription and that won't be an issue either so while i'm thinking of it let's go to the notes api slice as well so we don't have that same issue because i believe i kept that in there too so we'll also remove this keep unused data for five seconds and just leave it out of the slice altogether. Now, what we need to do is create an active subscription that remains active even though our user, our edit user form, I believe we're here in edit users where we got the data, it is just using the use selector, so it's not querying that data again, and that's why we don't have a subscription, but we've already queried the data. We don't want to send another query when we already have it, so we're not using RTK query, although RTK query would know we already had that data and create that subscription, we're using a use selector. So somewhat of a preference, but also just to demonstrate what is going on here. So we're pulling this out of the cache and out of the Redux state and using select user by ID rather than creating a new subscription. And we want the notes and users throughout the application. So it's really no problem to create a subscription that lasts for the duration of our protected pages. So to do that, let's close out the users directory. Let's close out the notes directory. Let's go to the auth directory and let's create a new component in here. And we're going to call this prefetch.js. Now, RTK Query and Redux Toolkit does have a use prefetch hook, but that's not what we're going to use. Let me start out with a few imports here inside of this file. We will import the store from our app directory and the store. This is the Redux store. We're going to import the notes API slice, the users API slice. We're going to use a use effect hook, and we're going to import outlet from React Router DOM. And now let's go ahead and use RAFCE to get that functional component started with our ES7 React snippets. And inside of this prefetch component, I'll just paste in the details and we will go over that. I'll highlight the existing return and put in our details here. I'm going to press Control B so this doesn't go off the screen. So let's look at this and we can see how it uh, works as well. Here's our use effect and it's an empty dependency array. So we only want this to run when this component mounts. When it mounts, we're going to log subscribing. And I really wanna highlight that or leave it in the code for you because of React 18 and we're using strict mode. So it's going to mount, unmount, and remount. And we'll see that with a subscribing unsubscribing, and then once again subscribing. And that's only in that strict mode when you're in development mode. But we're going to create a manual subscription to notes and another manual subscription to users that will remain active. So that way we have access to that state and it will not expire in five seconds or in 60 seconds, which is the default and then we'll unsubscribe if we ever leave the protected pages. And we're going to do that, of course this returns an outlet, so all of the children, we're going to wrap our protected pages in this prefetch component. This will also help us when we refresh the page and we still wanna have that state, including pre-filling our forms. So now that we've created this prefetch component, let's go to the file tree and let's go to the app.js. And inside the app.js, I want to import prefetch. And there we've got it from features auth prefetch. And once it's imported, all we really need to do is wrap it around everything that starts with our dash, which are the protected pages. So here we'll have route, and then we'll have an element. We do not need a path for this. 
And inside of that, we will put our prefetch component. And once we have that, we can go ahead and close this because we will want a closing route and we do not want this to close out until after the end of the dash. And once we've done that, we have now prefetched that data for notes and users for this whole area of our application. Now let's once again go back and look at that prefetch because I was thinking the one thing I didn't explain really is what this is. This is the manual subscription right here. So we use the slice, then we call the endpoints, then we call the actual query that we want, and then the initiate method creates that manual subscription. Notice in the cleanup method, we are unsubscribing. So if we ever go to any of the unprotected pages, it will unsubscribe as well. Okay, with that save now, let's see, we're still running our application. Let's drag this back over to the left and now we've got Dandy's information on our edit user form and it's not going away. Let's see if we can change Dandy's name to a lowercase d at the end just for an example. We'll click our save icon. Now we're back at the users list and we have added that addition to Dandy's username. Let's go ahead and change that back. And now we can also see in the roles, we can hold down the control button and just select one or none, but then it's outlined in red saying, hey, we need something here. Notice also when this is outlined in red, the save button went away. So our can save variable is working as expected too. Active or not active. And of course, Dan needs all of these roles and we're not changing his password right now. So we'll just leave this empty, but that's okay because we do not have to have it. Although we did, it looks like we applied the uh, red around this, even though we're not actually requiring the password when we edit the user. So we may want to change that. Also, while we're here, let's go ahead and go back to the edit and notice if I refresh the page, we reload all of that data because we're already subscribed and that hits the prefetch component first before it comes here. So that really helps our consistency if someone hits the refresh or reloads the application in any way. Now, what else do we need to check? Well, let's go back to our tech notes and we could view the user notes again, but after the users, we also created that new user form. So let's put slash new to check that out and let's create a new user. I'm just going to call this new user test and our password is test123 and we'll make him an employee or her and a manager and then let's hit save. And now in our list, now we don't need that or any help from Chrome, but in now in our list we have test with an employee manager role and here is that user. Let's go back and let's delete that user. And now that user is gone. Now what might happen with our list of data here or with our notes data is say this was open on more than one employee's screen or more than one staff member and we might get some stale data after it's open for a while. So we also want this to refresh the data sporadically or at some type of interval that we can control. And we can do that with RTK query and Redux as well. So now let's go ahead and apply that. I'm going to pull this back over to full screen. We'll close the terminal for now. Let's open up the file tree and go to the app directory and our store.js. Inside of our store, we need to import setup listeners. And notice this comes from Redux JS Toolkit Query. And I'm going to get rid of those semicolons just because I'm trying to be consistent. Now, after we bring in setup listeners, we just need to add it at the end of our file and we call setup listeners and pass in the store.dispatch. Once we've done that, we've enabled some things that we can use now with our queries in the users list and in the notes list. Let's go back to the users directory we have inside of the features directory and back to our users list. Notice we're just calling use get users query here inside of this component, but we can pass some things in including options. So I'm going to paste this in. We just put null or you could put undefined here as well. This would also work if we did that. After that, we have options. And what we're using here for options are a polling interval, refetch on focus, 
and refetch on mount or arg change. Really, if we remount the component, we're going to refetch the data. That's set to true. If we put the focus on another window and come back to our browser window, then we'll also refetch that data. So we'll be looking at fresh data. And then we're setting the polling interval to 60 seconds. This is 60,000 milliseconds essentially. So every minute it will re-query that data. And if we have the page open to a user's list, then we will get new data again. Now we can also do this inside of our notes list. So let's go to the notes directory and inside of the notes list, we'll do something similar, but I would expect the notes list to be more active. I'll once again, change this to undefined. It should work either way, but I believe the documentation shows undefined when you do that. Afterwards, we're just going to change that polling interval to every 15 seconds because the notes could be more active, more than one person could be working on them. So we'll show the most recent data in the list at least every 15 seconds. After that, refetch on focus and refetch on mount or arg change will both be true as well. So after setting this polling interval, you should see a new request for notes every 15 seconds inside of your network tab of DevTools. Of course, you could adjust that if you didn't think it was necessary that frequently or you needed it more frequently, either way. But those are nice features to add when you have more than one person working with a list of data and they're needing to reference that data for any changes. And now let's go to the welcome component that's in inside of our auth directory, and we have links to the lists for tech notes and for the users list, but let's go ahead and highlight those and I'll just put in two more links with it. So we go directly to the add a new tech note or add a new user link as well. Now that said, we haven't created the forms yet for the notes. So let's get started on that as we have a new note and an edit note component. Now, just like our edit user component that had an edit user form component that was pulled in, our new note component will have that. And you would think, okay, but why didn't the new user have that? Well, the new user has all new data, but the new note actually needs some existing data. So we're going to pull in this use selector and select all users. And then there needs to be a new note form component that we will also use. Inside the body of the functional component, I'll just replace this return. And we're going to use that selector with select all users, which is a memoize selector that was created inside of the user's API slice and get all of the users. Once we have that, we're going to check what kind of content do we want to render? If we have the users, then we're ready to render the new note, note form that will be populated with users data to choose from as well. So we can assign that note to a user. If not, we'll just have a loading message. And then we return that content. So let's go ahead and save that file. And let's go into our directory and create that new note form.js component. We could RAFCE for a placeholder Holder and just get that new note form component there so we don't currently have an error. We should go back to the new note and import that, and we did, so that's good. We already have that, so no error there when we try to check it out. Now we're at the edit note. The edit note has a little bit more to import at the beginning, so let's go to the top here and go over the imports. Oh, I got rid of the name there. There we go, return that. Now go down and paste in those imports. Now we're bringing in use params because we're going to need the ID of the note. We've got use selector, select note by ID, which is that memoize selector that's now created in the notes API slice since we're dealing with notes. We also need the users though. So we're going to select all users here as well because this form will be very similar to creating a new note. And then we're bringing in the edit note form that will also need to be created. So we're bringing in data once again, and then rendering a pre-populated form to edit that information. So let's go ahead and replace the functional component information here. We're going to get the ID from use params, which should look very familiar to you after we did the same for the users. Now we're getting the note data for the specific note that has that ID with the selector. We're also getting all of the users that we need again. Now our content is going to check to make sure we have the note data and the user's data. And if we do, it's going to render the edit note form and 
after that, of course, we're passing in the note and the users, both as props there. If not, we have the loading message. And after that, we return the content. So now let's go ahead and create an edit note form placeholder as well. So edit note form.js for the component, R-A-F-C-E to quickly create a functional component. And we have placeholders for edit note form and new note form. Now this is very similar to what we have already done with the users where we had the edit user form and you can use that pattern. What I'm going to do now is give you a viewer challenge much like I did with the controllers. We've already spent a lot of time going over these patterns. So now apply what you have learned and try to create your own forms here needed for these two placeholders. And of course, I'm going to put my code in the source code for the lesson so you can go back and check as well. But I think this is a nice place to stop and give you that challenge. And we've got everything else in place. In lessons one through four, we built a functioning backend REST API for our MERNstack project. And in lessons five through seven, we created the front end React app for our MERNstack project. It should currently complete all CRUD operations for both notes and users. At the end of lesson seven, I left you with a viewer challenge to complete the new note form and the edit note form for the app. I hope you did well, and remember, you can view my source code for Lesson 7 in the course resources to compare your code to mine. Let's start today by quickly reviewing the difference between authentication and authorization. While many use the terms interchangeably or simply refer to the abbreviation auth, they are not the same things. Authentication refers to the process of verifying who someone is. Authorization is the process of verifying what resources a user has access to. When we log in with the username and password, we are verifying who we are, and that is authentication. After logging in, our app users will be issued JSON web tokens, also known as JWTs. While it's true that possessing a JWT confirms the user authentication has already taken place, users send JWTs back in a request authorization header to prove they are authorized to access the REST API endpoints and data resources. Today's starter code is the completed code from lesson four, where we left off working with the backend REST API. We are back to add authentication and authorization to the API now. So the only change we're going to make in the package JSON right now is to go from lesson four to now save this as lesson eight in the name. Now let's move on to the server.js file. Not much to do here, but we do need to add our auth route. Out. So it's going to look a lot like the users and notes route. So I'm just going to click on line 29, press shift alt and the down arrow to copy down the users route. And above the users route, I'll put in the auth route and it's going to go to routes and then auth routes. So we'll just save that line and we're finished with the server JS. Now let's go to the routes folder. And when we highlight that, we can create a new file and we'll name this auth routes.js and I'll start with the imports. I'll just quickly paste those in and we can look at this. It starts with express being required and then we're creating a router from express.router. This is exactly what we did in our previous routes files and then we're bringing in the auth controller but we haven't created that yet so that will be coming up very soon. After that we simply have a few routes to handle so we'll have router.route and this will be the root route, so it just has slash. Now, of course, this would be at slash auth already as we're directed to the auth routes. But then after that, there wouldn't be anything, I guess, to follow auth as far as in the URL. Then we'll have dot post, and we'll just put this here as a placeholder now because we haven't created that auth controller yet. Now let's move down to the next route, and we'll say router dot route, and this will be slash refresh. So the full URL would be the root URL, then slash auth, then slash refresh. After that, we need the refresh route to be a git method. So we'll just put an empty git here for now as we wait on that auth controller. And then we have one more route. So router.route once again, and this will be slash logout. 
And now this one will be a post request. So we'll put in an empty post method there to handle what we get from the auth controller after we create it. Then we'll have module.exports and we'll set this equal to router. And we can save the file for now, but we have some methods to create in the auth controller. Before we move on to that auth controller, we need to create a rate limiter for our login route, the root route here in our auth routes. So to do that, we have one more dependency to add. I'll go back to the package JSON and we'll scroll up where we can see all of our dependencies. Press control and the back tick to open up the terminal window. I'll pull it down just a little bit. Then I'm going to type npm i and then express dash rate dash limit. This shouldn't take long to install. And now we see it in our dependencies right here inside of our package JSON. Now that we have that, let's go to our middleware directory that we have here and create a new file. And let's call this login limiter.js. I'll start by defining rate limit and we'll set this equal to require and then we'll have express dash rate limit that we see from our Visual Studio Code IntelliSense. After that, I also want to bring in the log events middleware that we previously created. So it's right here in this directory already. So we'll just say require dot slash and it comes from the logger file. After that, I'm just going to paste in some code that we can go over. I'll press control B to hide the file tree and also control Z because we had a long line there that wraps. So now we can look at the details of this code. I'll get rid of that extra line, but we're creating a login limiter with rate limit and pretty much everything you see in here then are options for rate limit that we're setting inside of an object. Let's just go over these. First, we're setting the time and we're setting this to one minute. So 60 times 1000 milliseconds. Then we're setting the max rate limit. So notice I put a note here, this limits each IP to five login requests per window per minute. And then we have a message if that is exceeded. So too many login attempts from this IP, please try again after a 60 second pause. And then we have a handler. And this handler is going to handle what happens if this limit is achieved. And so we're going to log events here, this middleware we created where we can see a log that there were too many requests and where it's coming from. This gets written to our error log if we need to refer to that. Then we're also going to send this status with the status code and the message back. And then these are setting standard headers and legacy headers that are simply recommended in the documentation for this middleware. So I set those as recommended. And now we have our login limiter that we will be able to use specifically in our login path. So if we go back to auth routes now, we should be able to include this by saying const login limiter, and then we will require this and it's going to come from our middleware directory and then be in the login limiter file. Then we can use this specifically in a route. So this is our login route, the root route. So we'll just say login limiter goes right here and then we'll put a comma and then this will be awaiting what method we call from our auth controller. So now it's time to go back to the file tree. So I'll show that again, go to the controllers directory and we need to create auth controller.js. Now I'm just going to paste in the simple code for now and we will review this code. But quickly, we just bring in the user data model. We also bring in the bcrypt dependency that we were previously using to encrypt the passwords as we stored them. Now we'll need to decrypt those with bcrypt so we can read them and compare to what the user is providing to authenticate with. We've also got a JSON web token dependency that we're going to call JWT. So we're going to need to add that dependency. And then we've got our async handler that we have used in the other controllers as well to catch any unexpected errors and pass those on to our custom error handler. So I'll save this right now and we will come back and describe these empty handler methods that we have as far as log in, refresh, and log out in our controller. But right now, before we forget, let's add that JSON web token dependency. So I'm back at the package JSON, control and back tick once again, type npm i and JSON web token, and add this to our dependencies as well. 
Once I close the terminal window, we now see it added to our list of dependencies here. We're good to go. I'll scroll back up to that auth controller and let's quickly look at these. We've got the description route and access for each one. The login route is publicly accessed and it's at slash auth, which comes of course after whatever the root URL is. And then we also have a public route for refresh, which is slash auth slash refresh. And this needs to be public because our access token, our JWT that will give us access, will have expired. So the only way to get a new access token will be to have a valid refresh token that we send to this endpoint. And then we have the logout method. And this is going to be at slash auth slash logout. And it can be public as well. And we're going to clear a cookie at this logout route or with this logout method if we do have a cookie. So we're exporting these three methods from this controller. So before we put this logic in, at least since we have the placeholders in place, let's go back to the auth routes and put the rest of the information that we need from the auth controller into our routes. So we're going to start out with auth controller and I'm going to copy this because I'm going to need it a couple of more times. Then we can say dot and we want login first. We can use IntelliSense to help complete these. After that, in the refresh route, we're going to have auth controller dot refresh. And in the logout route, we're going to have auth controller dot logout, which is also in my list. And we can save and we're now finished with the auth routes and we have the middleware that we're using, our login limiter as well. So now everything we need to complete is going to be inside of the auth controller. For these three methods, we just need to add the logic. But before we do so, I think it's a good time to review a little bit of information about JSON web tokens, JWTs. JWTs are referenced as a form of user identification, which is issued after the initial user authentication takes place. When a user completes their login and they are authenticated, our REST API will issue the client client application, an access token, and a refresh token. An access token is given a short time before it expires, for example, 5 to 15 minutes. A refresh token is given a longer duration before it expires, possibly several hours, a day, or even days. Our REST API will send and receive access tokens as JSON data. We will store access tokens in our application state so they will be automatically lost when the app is closed. We won't put these access tokens in local storage or cookies. If you can store it somewhere with JavaScript, a hacker can also retrieve it with JavaScript. Our REST API will issue refresh tokens in an HTTP-only cookie. This type of cookie cannot be accessed with JavaScript. Refresh tokens do need to have an expiration, which will then require users to log in again. Refresh tokens should not have the ability to issue new refresh tokens because that would grant indefinite access. The overall access token process involves issuing an access token after user authentication. The user's application can then access our REST API's protected routes with the access token until it expires. Our REST API will verify the token with middleware every time the token is used to make a request. When the access token does expire, the user's application will need to send the refresh token to our REST API's refresh endpoint to be granted a new access token. Of course, the refresh token is also issued after user authentication. Our REST API's refresh endpoint will verify the token. If the refresh token is valid, a new access token will be provided to the user's application. And remember, a refresh token must be allowed to expire at some point to prevent indefinite access. We are back in Visual Studio Code. Now, before we can create the logic for our controller methods, we need to create a couple of secret keys that we will use to create our access and refresh tokens that are issued by the REST API. So to do that, we're going to store them in our .env file. They will be environment variables. So let's name those variables now. We'll use all caps and we'll type access underscore token underscore secret and we'll have an equals. And then I'm just going to shift alt and the down arrow 
because all I need to do here is change this to refresh token secret. And this is where we will store both of those values. So now let's create those values. Press control in the back tick to open up a terminal window. I'm going to scroll up for just a little more room. We can create our secrets right here in the terminal and we can do it with a module that is built into Node. So I'm just going to type Node first and press return. And now we're at a Node.js prompt inside of the terminal. Now I can require the module that we need. So I'll say require and it is the crypto module. After that, I'll put dot random bytes in camel case. So a capital B and put 64 inside there. And then one more dot and then two strings. So we call the two string method and let's supply hex. Now after this, I'll press enter and we get a secret key. And of course, I'll change mine after this as well. But we copy this. You can do the same. And after you copy it, you can paste it in as your access token secret. Now we could press Alt Z to wrap the code. And you can see it's a fairly long string. Now we don't really need to type all that again. We can just press the up arrow and it issues the same command. So I'll press enter again and we get a different string back. So I'll copy this one and I'll put it in for my refresh token secret and paste that in. And now I'll save the .env file and close out of the terminal. Well, I guess I could go back to the terminal quickly and press control C to escape that node prompt and then close out. But there is our .env file. Now we have an access token secret and a refresh token secret. So now let's put our logic inside of the login method of our auth controller. And I'll start out with the basics here. Let's go over this. We are expecting a username and a password to come in when a user logs in. This is the authentication process. And so we'll say if we do not receive a username or a password, we will send a bad request status, which is a 400, and a message that all fields are required. Then we'll look for the user in our MongoDB database in the users collection. And if we do not find a user, or if the user is not active, remember we have that active status for each user that Dan D will be able to deactivate a user, even if we still want to keep them in the database because they are linked to notes. So if the user is not active or does not exist, then we'll send the 401 unauthorized. If the user does exist, we will try to match the password then. And we're using bcrypt to compare the password that we received to the password that is stored in the database. And again, if there is not a match, then we'll return a 401 again, which is again unauthorized. After this, I'll scroll for some more room and we need to create our access token, our refresh token, and our secure HTTP only cookie. So let's start out by creating this access token. And so you'll see I'm defining an access token variable. And now I'm using the JWT that we created above when we imported the JSON web token dependency. So this is JWT.sign. And now we're creating that access token here. So it contains what looks like an object and we've got user info. And inside that user info, we have username and roles. So this information is being inserted into that access token and we would need to destructure that access token when we return that information in the front end application as well. So all the front end will have in state is the access token until we destructure it or decrypt it and pull this information out. And notice we're now passing in our environment variable that has the access token secret to create this. Now here in development, I'm only setting the access token to 10 seconds at first. So we'll see it expire very rapidly. But when we're finished, we're going to want to set this to something like 15 minutes. Likewise, right now I have the refresh token at one day and we'll probably come back and modify this to even a shorter amount of time when we're testing it out just to make sure it works because we won't want to wait a day to see how it reacts when it expires. However, with Dandy's user requirements and the user stories we have, he wanted users to have to log in at least every seven days. So we'll probably eventually during deployment set this more like seven days and that way they won't have to log in every day if they don't log out. Okay, now the cookie, the create secure cookie with the refresh token we've just created above. So now we have a response with a cookie. 
we're naming it JWT and we're passing in that refresh token. Now here are the options we want to make sure we have set. So HTTP only is set to true and this means only accessible by a web server. Likewise, secure is set to true. Now this means HTTPS. Same site we set to none, so cross-site availability is a possibility. And that's because we will be hosting our REST API possibly at one server, we may have our application at another server. So we do want to allow a cross-site cookie. Now max age, here we're setting this to match the refresh token. So this would be our seven days. Actually, if we look at this, this is 1000 milliseconds. Now this is 60, so 60 seconds and 1000 milliseconds. So there we get one minute. And now we have 60 times one minute, which would be one hour. 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. And so that's how that max age is calculated. Then we are sending back the access token in the JSON. So the client application receives the access token, the server sets the cookie. So the client application with React never actually handles the refresh token inside of this cookie, but we will ensure that when React sends a request, to the refresh endpoint that this cookie is sent along with it. Now let's move on to the refresh method inside of this auth controller. And we'll once again start out with the simple stuff at the top where we're expecting a cookie with the request. And if we don't have a cookie named JWT as we expect, then we're going to send a 401 unauthorized. If we do have it, then we're going to set the refresh token variable to that cookie. And after that, we need to use our JWT dependency to verify this token. So then we're going to call JWT verify, as you can see right here after we set that refresh token variable. And then we pass in the refresh token variable. And then we pass in our refresh token secret that we have inside of our uh, environment variables. Now we're going to use that async handler that we're using to catch any possible async uh, error that we did not expect. But notice we've already done the verify process here. We've already completed the verify process, I should say. And if an error is created, it is passed in here as an argument. And so this async handler is going to catch errors that we did not expect, but if there's an error from the verify process, it's right here. And so then inside this function, we're responding to that error. And if we do have an error there, we're going to send a 403, a little different than a 401. 403 is a forbidden response, and that's the message we're sending along with that. Then we once again look to see if we have a user and if we do have the user from the decoded username that should be inside of the refresh token, then we're going to say, uh, or if we do not have that user, then we're going to say 401 unauthorized again. Hopefully we do have the user. And if we do, we're going to create a new access token with that username and with the roles. And then we're going to pass in that access token secret again because we're creating an access token. Right now, I once again have the access token expiring in 10 seconds, which we would change before deployment. This is just for development. And we're responding with the access token. And again, this is because the refresh endpoint should issue a new access token if the refresh token is valid. And now let's move on to the logout method, which has the easiest logic of all. We'll just go ahead and add this in. I'll press Alt-Z because this one line does wrap. But we'll once again check for cookies. We're expecting to get that HTTP only secure cookie that has the refresh token. And if the cookie doesn't exist with JWT in it, then we're just going to send a status 204, which means yes, the request was successful, but there is no content. Otherwise, we're going to call clear cookie if there is a cookie. So we will remove that cookie when the user decides to manually log out. And we'll look for that JWT cookie. And you have to pass in all of the the same options that you did when you created the cookie. And then we'll just respond with a message saying the cookie is cleared. So this would by default be a 200 status response, meaning successful, and the message cookie cleared. After that, we're just exporting 
all three of these auth controller methods. Now while we've created the auth controller logic and it does handle the endpoints, it doesn't protect the other endpoints yet with those tokens. So we need to create the middleware that will verify a valid token every time we make a request to a protected endpoint. So let's go to the middleware directory and create a new file now named verifyjwt.js. I'll start this file by defining JWT and requiring that same JSON web token requirement or dependency that we have added to our project. And now I'll define verify JWT, and this is middleware. So remember it receives a request, response, and next. And then we'll go ahead and have an empty function here, and I wanna put the module exports at the bottom before I forget. So I'll say module exports equals verify JWT. And now that we've done that, let's go ahead and look at what we'll get first inside of this middleware. And I'll put this right at the top, and then we'll break it down here. I'll press Alt-Z so it does wrap. We're defining the auth header because we're going to look at the header of the request and make sure there is an authorization header, either with a lowercase a or a capital A. So we've got the or here because there is no requirement or standard for, hey, it must be lowercase or it must be uppercase. So it's best to look for both. And of course, we're creating this application, full stack MERN project, where we have control over that. But this is a good practice. So you're always looking for either the lowercase or the uppercase authorization header. Now, what is required as standard for providing the authorization header is what's in the value. And it should also always start out with the word bearer with a capital B and be followed by a space. And after that space should be the token. This is all in a string. So we can check that by checking the auth header we've defined above and then verifying it starts with the string bearer and the space. And if it does not, we can reply with a 401 unauthorized response. And after that, we can go ahead and grab the token. So we define our token, which is the access token and we get it by splitting that same auth header string that we were looking at above and we don't want the word bearer or the space we just want the token that comes after the space so we split on the space and take the second value of course the first value being stored at the zero position this would be at the one position now that we have the token we pass that into the jwt.verify method and we pass the token in and we verify it with our access token secret. And then we have our function here. Once again, if we have error, we note that error. And then after we do that, we send the 403 forbidden response. Otherwise, we should have decoded values. And then we'll set the request.user to the decoded.userInfo.username. And the request.role should be the same. And then we can call next at the end of this. Now next is the part of the middleware that calls either the next middleware in line or we'll move on to the controller if that's where the request needs to go. With that complete, I'm going to remove my semicolons just to once again stay consistent as I'm trying to break myself of that habit. And then we need to apply this middleware, again our verified JWT middleware, to the routes that we want to protect. And so let's move back down to our routes directory and first we're not going to apply it to the auth routes, but let's look at the auth routes because here we brought in our login limiter middleware. Notice how we could apply it to just one route. We just put it here after our post method and we put in the login limiter comma and then we call the controller method. Now that's possible if you want to just apply it to one route. Likewise in the server, I'll scroll down to our server. We applied app.use and then say our express.json middleware here is applied to the entire app. So that came before any of the routes. It was applied to everything. So our .use method could actually be used to apply everything to all of the routes inside one of our routing files. So let's look at the notes route and we can bring in our verify JWT. So I'll say const verify JWT. We'll set this equal to require and then two dots in our middleware directory and then there's our verify JWT. 
And now instead of applying it to any one specific route here, I'm just going to say router.use and I'm going to pass in the verify JWT middleware. Now this applied this verify JWT middleware to all of the routes inside of this file. And now I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm just going to copy both of these and go to the user routes file and apply that here as well. So I'll paste in the require. So we've pulled in verify JWT and then we apply it to all of the routes in the file. With those changes saved, we're now ready to start our backend REST API and test out all the logic that we entered. So let's go ahead and type npm run dev at a command line and get our API up and running. It should be running on port 3500. Now let's go to Postman. The last time we used Postman was in lesson four as well. And we can check these endpoints. So we're going to go to HTTP colon slash slash localhost 3500 that's running on our computer here in the dev environment. And then we'll go to the auth endpoint. So for that, we need to do a few settings here. Let's put in the headers first. We need to tell Postman the content type that we're sending, and that will be application slash JSON. And then we need to go to the body tab and go to the raw selection here, and we'll send that JSON. We'll have an object, and the first thing will be the username. It does go inside of quotes here inside of Postman, and I'm going to send the user I've created called Dan D. He's our stakeholder. And after that, I need to send his password. That's not what I need. So I'll say password. And his password is an exclamation, capital, lowercase d, and then one, two, three, four, five. Just a simple one to test out here. Let's go ahead and send this to the auth endpoint and we'll see what we get back. We've received our access token, but we've also received more than that. So let's see what else. And here's cookies, but this is not where the cookie that we've received is. You can see if I click this, it says no cookies received from server. Back here in the bodies, in the body, we have the access token. However, up here at the top right where it says cookies, we have a cookie manager. Here is our JWT cookie. If I click on that, we can see we have received this secure cookie and it has our refresh token in it. So this is a different token than we received in the body where our access token was. Now to send this back, and it will send it with this path here as slash to all URLs at our local host port 3500. However, it won't right now because we start out with HTTP and not HTTPS. So we need to remove this secure just to test it out because that secure means it must be HTTPS, which is what we would want in deployment, but not right now as we test. So let's save the cookie with that one change and close our cookie manager. And with that change, we can now go to the refresh endpoint and notice we did send to post, of course, with that auth request, but now we're going to send with a get method here to the refresh endpoint. And it will send the cookie that we just saved over here. Our refresh token is inside of that cookie. So let's send. And I have sent to the wrong endpoint. I need to send actually to auth slash refresh. There we go. Instead of just refresh, now I'll send again. And I expected to get a result there. So let's look at our server and see what's going on. And we can now see inside of the terminal that I didn't just send to slash auth slash refresh. I also had a space, which is represented by this percent 20 at the end. So if we bring postman back up, Let's go ahead and remove that extra space that we can now see is there. And now we should be good. And yes, we did now send to the correct endpoint and we've got an access token back because our refresh token was valid. This is a new access token. And if we were to send again, we'll get a different access token. And now we didn't receive a cookie with a refresh token, but let's verify our cookie is still here. So now let's go to the logout endpoint, which would be slash auth slash logout, and it should delete our cookie. So by the way, I haven't cleared out this raw JSON data here, but we're not using it with these other requests. It was only for the login request, but it doesn't hurt to go ahead and leave it in there. So now I'm going to send a logout and that goes back to the post HTTP method. And this should delete our cookie. So let's send that. It says cookie cleared in the response. 
Let's look at our cookie manager now, and there are no cookies, so that also worked. Now let's go ahead and log in once again, so we'll go back to just the slash auth route, and now we need this information in the body, and it is a post request, so we'll send in Dandy's information. He's logged in, he's now received a new access token, and we're going to use that to access either the notes or the user's routes, or we could test out both, just to make sure our verified JWT middleware is working and checking those access tokens. So now to do this, we need to go back to the headers, and here we're going to add another header. This is going to be authorization. I need the capital A there at the beginning, or just an A. Either way, it would take lowercase or the capital. Their authorization, and now we need to start out this value with bearer, and then a space, and we can paste in our access token. Now this is not going to work at first, and I can tell you why after we do it, but we'll just check that our unauthorized is also working as planned. So now this needs to go to a get request, and let's just request all of the notes. So let's send this, and oh, I said unauthorized. It's actually forbidden because it was a valid, or at least a cookie that we, ex or not cookie, a token that we expected to be issued, but then it had expired. And of course that creates the 403 forbidden. So that is because we only have 10 seconds right now on our access token, because I put it in a very short time here in dev mode. I'm going to quickly close the terminal and let's go back to our controller where we have that 10 second setting up here where we first issued that, let's see, here's 10 seconds, and then we had that same setting in the refresh token or refresh endpoint. So I'm going to select both of those with Control D, set it to one minute for now, and save. I can open up the terminal again just so it we can see it saved and it restarted the backend server with Nodemon. And so we're running again on port 3500. Now let's go back to Postman. And what we need to do here is go back to our auth instead of notes and get a new access token. So it's going to be post. We'll go back to the auth endpoint. And after that, we need to switch over here to the body and make sure we have Dandy's authentication information. So we send that in. He gets a new access token, which we can then copy without the quotes. And then we'll take that over to the headers, and I'm going to replace this access token inside of the header with the new access token. We have one minute now to make this work, so paste all of that in. And then we'll go to the notes endpoint, and it will be a get request. We'll send our request, and now we get all of the existing notes. Now, if this access token hasn't expired yet, we should also be able to request the users, and yes, we've got all of the users, but it probably will expire fairly soon, so we'll check that out as well. So let's go ahead and request the notes again and see if we still have any time left. And we send, yes, we still got it, so I'll just wait a few more seconds and we'll send it once again. And I guess this is a long minute for me. Let's go ahead and try it one more time. And now we're forbidden, so we got the 403 response again. So when this is forbidden, that's when we need to send the refresh token to get a new access token. And we will automate all of that inside of our React application, and you'll find out how to do that with Redux in the very next lesson. Our starter code is the completed source code from Lesson 7, which is the last time we worked on the front end app. I also have the code from Lesson 8 running the back end REST API that you see here, and this is a separate instance of VS Code. So we can try out the login code when it's complete. I'm going to minimize this now, and we're back at the front end code. The only change I'm going to make in the package JSON to start is to change this Lesson 07 to lesson 09 dash front end. Now let's look at the user stories. We have completed number two and number four in previous lessons, and we also completed number 10 through 13. So let's check those off. I'll put an X in each one of those. And then we'll look at what we might complete today. However, many of the goals that we still have are waiting for 
the roles and permissions to be applied to the front end app after we have the authorization from the server. So what we can complete today, along with the login that we of course expect to provide, is to have a log out option. So we'll definitely be able to check off number seven. The rest of these may be waiting on another domino to fall in place before we can actually check them off. So let's save the user stories with number two, four, and 10 through 13 checked off and we'll move on. Let's go to the source directory in our code and then let's go to the features directory and finally to the auth directory. And we have a lot to add here today. So let's create an auth slice to start out. I'm going to click new file and I'm going to create auth and then with a capital S slice.js. Notice this is not an API slice, but more of a traditional slice like we would have just with Redux. Now I'm going to import create slice from Redux Redux.js toolkit, and after that we'll create our auth slice. So I'll say const auth slice, set this equal to create slice, and there should be an object inside the parentheses. And now I'll put in the first two properties of the object, so we'll name the slice auth, and then our initial state will have an object that has a token property and will be set to null, because we'll be expecting to receive the token back from our API. Then we're going to have reducers and reducers are an object as well and I'm going to quickly insert the two reducers we're creating and then we'll go over those so the first one is set credentials after we get some data back from the API we're going to have a payload and that's going to contain the access token then we're just going to set the state dot token to access token and that's because we're already inside of the auth slice here with the name auth so we don't have to set state dot auth dot token we know we're in that so then we also have a logout reducer here and that's just going to set the state dot token to null at logout time and now we need to export these things so just underneath I'm going to export set credentials and logout they're both the action creators here from the auth slice dot actions so those are exported we'll also export the auth slice re dot reducer itself so all of the reducers because we need to add that to the store and then we're creating one selector that's select current token notice here it does refer to state dot auth dot token and remember auth is here because it is the name of the slice we created above and now that we've created our slice we need to go to the store that's inside of our app directory so there's store.js and we need to add it to our store so first we need to import that so we will import auth reducer and that is going to come from and then we should go up out of this directory and then we're going to look inside of the features directory and then inside of features we have auth and inside of auth whoops I'll go back we should have a slash there then we should be looking in the auth slice now once we have imported that auth reducer we should be able to put it inside of the reducer for the store here where we have the API slice of course supplied as well so now we'll put in auth and have our auth reducer. Now let's go back to the auth directory. And as you might guess, we do need an API slice as well. So let's now create that. So we'll have auth and then capital A for API, capital S for slice, dot js. This shouldn't be a new concept as we created separate slices for the notes and the users as well. And we extended the API slice. And that's what we'll do here. Let's start with our imports first. We're going to import the API slice so we can extend it. We're also going to import the logout function that, or logout reducer that we created inside of the auth slice. After that, let's go ahead and say export const and we'll have our auth API slice. We'll set this equal to API slice that we imported dot inject endpoints and then we'll have an object inside of that and now that we're injecting endpoints we should define those endpoints so we'll start here with that and then we'll pass in the builder and that's an arrow function and there will be an object inside of this where we can put each endpoint we'll start with our login endpoint and we'll quickly break this down so this is the login we call builder.mutation this will be a mutation and now we define the query inside of the mutation we're passing in what we're calling credentials this would be the username and password that we send with the query then we'll have this sent to the slash auth route 
and this will be a post method. And here we'll spread in the object that we expect to receive as credentials into the body object. And while that endpoint is fairly straightforward, the next one has a little more to it. So I'll paste this in and we'll break it down. So we've got our login endpoint above. And now we have a send logout. Notice I didn't name it logout because we're importing our logout reducer from auth slice. So we have a send logout. And this is also a builder mutation. And we define the query first. And this goes to our logout route that we defined on the back end. So it's slash auth slash logout. And the method will be post, which is expected. After that, it gets just a little more complicated. So let's go over what we have here. RTK query provides an on query started function that we can call inside of our endpoint. Now what this does, and it's async, it accepts an argument that we're not really defining, but it needs it here as the first parameter. But then it also provides things like dispatch and query fulfilled. So we can verify our query has been fulfilled. And because we're putting async here, we can await that. So I'm putting a try catch inside of our on query started function and we're awaiting the query fulfilled. Now notice I have this commented out because you could set const data equals query fulfilled. It returns a data property and then you could log that data and you'll get the message from the REST API that we created that says cookie cleared. And that's what you should get as a response. So if you want to get that, go ahead and set the const data and destructure it from query fulfilled. I just wanted to put that in there as an option. And then of course you can view it with a console log. After that, we're going to dispatch our logout reducer that we imported from the auth slice. This will set our token to null in our local state. And we need that as well. So we've logged out on the server. We're setting that token to null. And then the API slice, which is separate from the auth slice, and this is going to need to be cleared as well. And so we can call API slice because we imported it up here at the top. And then we go dot util dot reset API state. And that is a method that can be called and it will clear out the cache and the query subscriptions and everything to do with our API slice. So that also needs to be taken care of at logout. Now this doing all of this inside of on query started keeps us from needing to import the uh, dispatch or I should say use dispatch into a component and then dispatching each one of these in every component. So we can put it here and then we can just call this logout endpoint, the mutation that we would import into the component and it will take care of everything. So this is a more efficient way of doing that. If there is an error, we're just going to log it to the console. There really shouldn't be when you log out, but if there is a logout error, this is what we'll do here. And now I'm going to scroll for some more room and we'll add our third and final endpoint. And it is just the refresh endpoint. It is also a mutation and we're just defining the query which goes to auth refresh. And it's a git method because essentially we're just sending a git request that includes the cookie when we send it and it will hit that refresh endpoint so we could get a new access token when needed. Now, just like with our other slices, what we need to do is export all of the mutations that we have now created. So you can see we have export const and we're exporting use login mutation, use send logout mutation, and use refresh mutation. And with that complete, we are ready to work on the login component that will use some of these things. And you can see we've already started the login. We just put in a placeholder functional component. Let's start at the top by putting in some basic imports and we'll break these down. So we've got use ref, use state, and use effect from React. We also have use navigate and link from React Router DOM. But that's not all we need. We also need some things from Redux and RTK query. So we've got use dispatch from React Redux, set credentials from the auth slice we created, and then the use login mutation in our auth API slice. Now let's start at the top of the component and we'll bring in some of these basic hooks that we've imported from React. So we're creating a user ref that we will use to set the focus on the user input, an error ref that we'll use to set the focus if there is an error, and then we've also got state for the username, the password, and a possible error message. After the state, I'm going to scroll up just a little bit and we'll go ahead and 
Use our use navigate hook to bring in the navigate function. Use the use dispatch hook to bring in the dispatch function. And then we've got our use login mutation hook and we'll bring in a login function that we can call when we need it. It's also going to have an is loading state that we're going to use. Mutations do provide other states, but we will not need it in this component. Now let's go ahead and define an error class and then also check that is loading state. So we're defining an error class first. And if we have an error message in our state for error message, then we're going to apply the class error message. This is a ternary statement. Otherwise, we're going to apply the class off screen. So we'll see where this is used as we create our form. Also, we have this is loading state that we are checking from when the mutation is called. So this is where it's actually right here. I scrolled up too far. This is where we're using the mutation. When we call login, it will have an is loading state. And if it is loading, we'll just return this simple loading paragraph. You could use a loading spinner if you have one that you like to use. And now let's define our content. So I'll say const content and it will be on more than one line. So I'm going to provide parentheses as well. And then here, instead of this placeholder h1 login, I'm just going to return the content as well. Now we'll put our content inside of these parentheses. I'm going to scroll up just so we have some more room and I'll paste in the first part. And of course, notice it gives us a closing main and we're starting out a section here with a class name of public. Remember these class names align with my CSS. If you've provided your own, you could do something different. Here we have a header that says employee login. Now remember, this is not inside of our protected routes where we have a dash with the dash header and the dash footer. This is a separate public page, much like the first page that provides some information about Dandy's business. So right here, we're just going to have to provide our own header and footer for the content of this page. Let's go ahead and close everything out after that closing main tag. So we're going to have a footer as well that's just going to link back to the first page of the website. There's also a public page. And then we close out the section. Now inside of the main element is where we're going to put our form. So I'll start the form here, but not add everything yet. We could add the closing form tag just so it lines up and doesn't show that error for us. But inside of this, let me go ahead and save and it should indent. There we are. We'll start out with a label and this label is for the username. And notice it has an HTML4 that should align with the ID attribute of the input for username. Also notice the class name for form is form, which lines up with more CSS in my CSS. And then it has an on submit handler called handle submit that we have yet to define. So we'll come back to that. Other than that, you can look at the different attributes for this text type input. Notice we are applying the ref we created earlier, the user ref, and then we're applying the state with the value. So this is a controlled input. And then the on change also has a handler that is handle user input that we have not defined yet. We want autocomplete to off because we don't want to show any other possible usernames that have been entered. And we do want to make this required. Now let's provide a blank line underneath and we'll put in the information for the password as well. Very similar to the username input. You can see the HTML4 is password that lines up with the ID password. The type is password, so it doesn't show the entry. It also has a handler that we have to create yet called handle password input. It's a controlled input with the password state and it is required. And then when you only provide one button inside of a form, by default, it is the submit button. I'm going to press control B just so we can see this a little better, but we're providing a button with class name here and that matches up with my CSS once again, but we don't have to say that this is a type submit. By default, it already is. And then we're just putting sign in on the button itself. Now let's go back and provide those handlers and a couple of other things that we did not provide at the top of the component. One of the things we did not provide was how to handle the uh, refs that we've put on both the username and password input. So I'm going to put in the use effects that handle those, or at least handles the first one for user ref. And what we've got here is user ref dot current dot focus. And this is an empty dependency array in use effects. So it only happens when the component loads and it puts the focus 
directly in that username field. The second use effect is to clear out the error message state when the username or password state changes. So our user may have already read the error that has appeared and then when they once again type in the username or password field, it will clear out the error that is being displayed because they've already processed the error. There's no longer a reason to display that error. And speaking of displaying errors, I believe that's the one thing I currently left out of our main area. So let's put that error in right above the form and here we'll be able to see how it is applied. So we have the error ref on the paragraph, which we will use in just a moment. We also have that class name, error class, that we defined above. And then there is an aria live attribute, and it says assertive. That means when this gets focus, it will read like a screen reader would read the error message that appears. And that's also important to do. Now let's create those handlers for the username and for the password fields and for the form itself. I'm going to start underneath the use effects we've applied and then I'll put in the first two handlers. We've got one for handle password input and one for handle user input and you can see they're very simple. They receive the event itself and then they set username to event.target.value or set password to event.target.value. The handle submit for the form is just a little more complex so let's start building that and I'll put the closing curly brace there. We're going to start out by just having this be an async function and it receives the event and then we're saying event.prevent default. That's the first thing you need to do when you submit a form really because otherwise the default is to reload the page and you don't want that to happen inside of your single page application. And now we're going to need a try catch block. So I'll start with the try, then we'll add the catch here after and I'll receive an error in the catch. Let's put in our try block contents first. I'll paste this in and go over it. We're going to get our access token back after we call the login mutation function. This is what we received, this login function from our use login mutation hook. We can await that result. We pass in the username and password state when the username and password are complete. Then we call unwrap at the end. Because I'm not using the error state, I actually want to use this in a try catch block. And that's what we do in Redux if we want to use the try catch block instead of using the RTK query states such as is error. So I'm doing that to catch the error here instead. We're also going to dispatch set credentials, which we mentioned earlier, and we receive an access token back, and that's going to be our credentials. So we set that state.token. Then we have set username and set password just being set to blank, and that's great because we just want to empty out that state. And then we have navigate that will take us to the dash after we've logged in. So this is all if it's all successful. And of course, nothing happens until we've awaited this login. If we have an error there, it will go directly down to our catch error. So these things won't happen unless we are successful. Now the catch block might actually be considered a little more complex than what we just went over for the try, but let's look at it. It's if we have an error status, or if we do not have an error status, I should say, here's the exclamation mark saying, if we do not have an error status, we're going to just say, there was no server response. And that's the only time we shouldn't have an error status if we have an error. Otherwise, we're going to check the status. And if it's a 400, we know that should be missing a username or password. 400 usually means bad request, and that would be the case for a login. 401 would be unauthorized. Or we can just go ahead and set the message. And remember, it won't just be error.message. Here we'll be receiving error.data dot message. And I'm using optional chaining here just as a precaution. After that, we have our error ref and we can set that error ref dot current dot focus. So the focus is then set on our error message, which would be read by a screen reader as well because we put aria live attribute set to assertive. And one last look at that handle submit, and I believe it is completed. Yes, so now we have finished our login component. Let's go back to the file tree before we test this out, and let's go up to our components directory and go to that dash header, because once we've logged in, we also need to provide a logout. We're currently only importing link from React Router DOM, but that is about to change, so I'll paste in the imports and we can look at those. We're going to have use effect from React, then we're also going to use a font awesome icon, and then we import that very icon that we need, which is FA right from bracket. It 
kind of indicates a logout. It's often used for a logout. And then there is use navigate, link as we had before, and use location coming from React Router DOM. But that's not all. We also need to import our use send logout mutation from our auth API slice. And before we move into the component, I'm going to import some cons that we are creating here. And these are regex constants. So I have a dash regex, a notes regex, and a users regex. We're going to use these to compare to the location in the URL to verify what location we are on or not on. And we can use those to decide if we want to display something such as a button in our header or not. And now I'm going to scroll up a little bit and we can start inside the component that we already have for dash header. And I'm going to import some of these hooks. So we're going to get the navigate function from use navigate. We're going to destructure the path name from the use location hook. And now we're going to get the send logout function from our use send logout mutation hook. We're also going to get several things about the status when we call the function. Is loading, is success, is error, and error. Much like you've seen in other calls to RTK query hooks. I'll scroll up just a little bit and underneath the call to that hook, we're going to put in a use effect and use effect is going to check the is success status. And of course we need to put in the navigate function just to appease the uh, warnings that we might get inside of the uh, console, even though we know that the navigate function won't change. So if is success, then we're going to just navigate to the root. And this is because it's a logout. So we would go back to the root of the site. Other than that, we have an on logout clicked handler that is going to call that send logout function that we're getting here from use send logout mutation. And underneath that, I went ahead and put in the if is loading. We're just going to return the paragraph that says logging out. And if the is error status is true, we're going to return an error message here that we're going to get from our hook. And as I look at this, I realize I need error.data, and then I'm using optional chaining again for the message. Underneath the error, I'm going to define a class for the dash. And this could be done with a ternary as well, but I just think it's easier to understand this way. So I did it like this because it's kind of long. I'm going to press control B to hide the file tree so you can see it all as well. I'm defining this dash class with let here and just setting it to null. But then we're also checking to see if the tests here for the different regexes, we're essentially making sure that we're not on the dash path itself, the root, and we're not on the notes list or the users list. We do not want to be on any of those pages. And if we're not, we will set this dash class to a dash dash header two underscores container dash dash small. I'm using a BEM naming convention here. If you're wondering why my class name is so long for this uh, class that I have inside of the CSS. But anyway, quickly defining that class and you could do it with the ternary if you want to, but this is how I'm doing it just because it's long. It's a little easier to understand this way. I think now let's go ahead and put in our log out button that we will see in the header. We're going to define it first. So it is a button has a class name of icon dash button. The title is log out and we're going to call our on log out clicked handler, which I believe we already defined up here. It essentially just calls send log out that we received before. And now let's scroll down to see the rest of our content. We have already defined content. What we haven't done is put that dash class that we created inside of our dash. So let's go ahead and add that. It's going to be on this div that we have that has a class name of dash, dash header, two underscores, and container. But it's a modifier. The first thing we need to do is go ahead and put all of this inside of curly braces here. And so we'll do that first. And then we'll turn this into a template literal. So I'll select the first double quote and press control D to select the second one and press back tick instead. So now it is a template literal. And now we can insert a variable. And so now I have dollar sign curly brace. I'm going to insert my dash class variable. And this way we can add this extra dash class if it does exist. And otherwise, I'm just going to put the logout button below. And here, instead of saying add nav buttons later, I'm just going to say we're going to add more buttons later because we absolutely will add buttons to our header depending on the path name in the near future once we have the different permissions worked out. With our logout now added to the header, let's go ahead and press control back tick 
and start up our React app. Now, you should have already started your backend as well, as I showed mine was running from the beginning of this tutorial. That is the code we completed in lesson eight, which was the back end. Here we're in lesson nine, and we're starting the front end, and we can check our changes. So let's see what we get once the React app starts up. We have successfully started. Let's go to the login, and here is the login page. I'm going to log in with Dan D and the password I put for him. He is our main stakeholder, the owner of the business, and he should have an admin role. This is worth noting as well. If you did not already create those test users or a user for Dan D, before you added the Verify JWT middleware in the last lesson, then it won't let you create those new users. So you need to create one with Postman before you've added that Verify JWT middleware. And hopefully you've done that in the past as I displayed that I had. Just noting that. Okay, I can log in now with Dandy, and I'm here on the homepage. Notice we have this log out button in the top right of our header and we have the different pages we can go to. Now we do not have a JWT being provided when we make a request. We should have received one, and we can check that in our Redux state component, but let's look at what happens if we try to view the tech notes. We're not sending that access token back to the server, so it says we're unauthorized. The same if we try to view the user settings right now. If we go to add new user, we shouldn't have a problem getting to this page because it does not require any new data or any, I should say, any existing data from the API. We're not making a request to go to this page, so we can get there. If we go back to home, we're going to have a problem when we try to add a new tech note. So we do that and we've got nothing. And if I expand this over to full screen, we should be able to open up the console and we see some errors here as well. So. We need to fix this, not because it will be much of an issue in the future, but I don't like to leave this hanging as it is. So let's go back and we'll refresh here on the dash and we should get our dash page back. But what we need to fix is in the new note. I'm going to drag this over and we'll drag Visual Studio Code back and we can see what's going on here. I'll close out the terminal. We can leave it running. In the file tree, we should go down to features and then notes and we should go to our new note component, the very first one. And here's where the issue lies. We're expecting the users to go into that new note form because we need to know what users exist so we can assign that new note to an existing user. There's a couple of things we can change here. First of all, this use selector is calling select all users, which has been renamed just from a select all. And that select all memoized query always provides an array. So even if we just check users here, we're going to have users, it's just an empty array. So this isn't going to work exactly as we expect. Instead, let's check to see if that array has length. And we can do that right here, and I'll paste that in. And then we're just going to return a simple statement that says, not currently available. After that, we can shorten up the next line, and I'll just highlight over this one and paste this in, and we'll just put our content equal to the new note form where users is passed in and return the content. So essentially, if we don't have users for any reason, or we don't have any length of users, we're just going to say that that form is not currently available. So once we fix this, we should be able to go back now and well, I don't really need to change that. I'll put over here to the left. Let's go back and once again, we can just refresh to make sure we've got those changes and try to add a new tech note. And now we get the not currently available. And that's because we do not currently have access to that data. So instead of unauthorized, we're just putting that message in. Now, when we are authorized or when we've protected those routes, then another message will occur. So we won't have an issue there. I just wanted to temporarily fix it for now. And it's nice to have everything at least responding as expected without an error at this point. Now I'm going to drag the app to a full screen and I'm going to open up DevTools. And inside of DevTools, we can clear out the console, but let's go to Redux. And we want to check our state here. And actually, our Redux DevTools, if you have them installed, it likes to have a little more room. So I'll move this over. I don't need it quite that much. There we go. I just want the state down here below. And we're looking at the tree view. And this has our auth state. We're logged in, or we were logged in, and we have a token null now. Let's go ahead and refresh this. 
And yes, we should have a token all after the refresh. We don't have in our protected routes yet, so we're not getting kicked back out. So let's go ahead and hit the log out. That kicks us out to the beginning. We'll do the employee login once again, and I'll do Dan D. I'll put in his password and log in. And now we can see our auth state here has a token, and we have our token inside. Our API has also made some requests and it has subscriptions as well. So we can see the git notes and git users. Although back in the console, we see those requests are replied to with a 401 unauthorized because we're not providing that token when we're making those requests. We're also seeing these subscribing and unsubscribing notes that we have inside of our prefetch component that we created in the previous lesson seven tutorial. We're in lesson nine right now. Okay, so that's what we have in the console and our state is showing here in Redux. What we want to test now, and we're not providing that token yet when we do those requests, but what we want to test is our logout to make sure that the subscriptions and the uh, queries all go away, that it resets our API state and the token is set to null. So let's hit that logout. And now you want to select your last choice here inside of where your state was, and it will show the different requests up here at the top. I know the window's a little scrunched. Here is our logout. The token is null. We currently still have the subscriptions, but then when we go to rest API state, or reset API state, I should say, the subscriptions are cleared out, the queries are cleared out, and everything is as expected. And we can scroll on down to get to the very end, and we can see the same thing. The token is null, this is the current state we're in, and our API has been cleared out. So our logout is working as expected, and as I had mentioned before, when we log in, we're currently not able to see those lists that we had. So let's log back in. Here's the console. We can clear this out and see what happens in the console as we log in now. So put Dandy in. And once we get logged in, we see the subscribing, unsubscribing when the component unmounts, and that's the strict mode from React 18, and then subscribing once again. So that's all in our prefetch component. And then we have a couple of 401s when we request the notes and the users. That's unauthorized, so our prefetch didn't really work. They were both unauthorized requests. And now, of course, when we go to view the tech notes, we are still unauthorized, and you can see that request here. So we can go back. Same for users, and we're unauthorized. And now the changes we made to the tech note page gives us the not currently available message, which is fine. We can go to the add new user form, although if we tried to add a new user, we would once again be unauthorized. Now in the very next tutorial coming up, we're going to learn how to provide that token with the request. And of course, if that access token is expired, we're also going to learn how to automatically supply the refresh token and make that request to get a new access token. We're going to do that all with Redux and RTK query in the very next lesson. Our starter code today is the completed code from lesson nine. So we're just going to open the package JSON and change this lesson 09 to lesson 10, and we can save the package JSON, and let's move to the user stories. Now previously we checked off 10 through 13, we've also got number two and number four checked off of our list, and really I think we could check off number seven because we provided our logout option in the last lesson, but the others were not quite ready to check off yet. If we look at some of these, we're very close, like add an employee login to the notes app. We really did that in the last lesson, but I can't say it's complete until we go ahead and provide those permissions and role-based user access. So we're not going to check that off yet. Kind of the same for eight and nine, where we have require users to log in at least once per week. We'll eventually set that refresh token to a seven day expiration, but we're not quite finished with that yet. Also provide a way to remove employee access as soon as possible if needed. We had put in an active status for each employee that can be checked or unchecked. And we'll go ahead and check that off when we also put in the permissions so only an admin or manager can check that or uncheck it. So we're very close on some of these. And I think a lot of these will fall into place after we get those permissions in place.
place. We'll go ahead and save our user stories for now and let's move on to our source directory. And in the source directory, we need to open up the app directory and then the API directory and then the API slice.js. So far, this isn't too complicated and we've been injecting endpoints into the API slice in other files, such as our notes feature, our users feature, and even our auth feature. But today we need to do something here that will allow us to use our JWT access and refresh tokens. And the first thing we need to do is go ahead and define a base query. So I'm going to come right here on line two, get a little extra room, and paste in a base query that we can break down and see what it's doing. Notice previously we assigned our base query right here in the API slice and it is fetch base query. Now we're going to use this base query instead. And since it has the same name as the object key right here, so it matches, we'll just go ahead and remove all of this and use the comma. So we don't have to say base query colon base query. We can just put in base query and the comma into the object for create API. Now let's look at what this does. We're putting fetch base query here. So we're setting our base query equal to fetch base query. Previously, we're, we're just providing this base URL. Notice right now it's localhost port 3500, and that's what we're using in development. We would need to change that upon deploying. But then we want to add some other things as well. One is to put credentials and in include. So that's an important thing to add. And that way we'll always send our cookie. Remember we have that secure HTTP only cookie that contains our refresh token. So when we need it, it will be sent. But also we need to prepare the headers. And that is a specific thing that's available to the fetch base query. And the first thing that gets added to it, and I, I said specific thing, I should say specific function that we can put here with our fetch base query. And the first thing we pass in, the first parameter is the headers. And then it has an API object. Now this API is specific to prepare headers. One thing we can destructure from that is get state. So we could say API here and then put API dot get state, but I'm just destructuring get state right here. And that allows us to get the current state of the application. So notice I'm using get state, I'm calling that, and then I'm looking at the auth state, and then I'm getting the current token that we have, and I'm assigning that token. So if we have a token, then we're setting the authorization header. Notice we're using the headers here, that is the first parameter, and we set authorization, and then we pass in that specific format that is expected. It starts with the word bearer with a capital B, then there's a space, and then you have your token. And so that sets our authorization header, and we simply return the headers here from our prepare headers function. Now this is applied to every request we send. Now I'm going to save this, but before we start our app, I want to point out that I am also running the code from lesson eight, which is our backend REST API, and that's the last time we worked on it. Notice it's running here in a separate instance of Visual Studio Code, so our REST API server is available to our React code that's in this new Lesson 10 repository. So I'm going to go ahead and press Control in the back tick, open up a terminal, type npm start, and we should see our application start fairly quickly in Chrome. Okay, with the React application running, I'm going to drag it to full screen, and then I'm going to press Control, Shift, and I to open up the dev tools. And notice I'm looking at the network tab instead of the console. So find your network tab in your list of tabs. And we want to see the requests come in and see what happens. Also, I should note that in that backend code, and I can pull it back up quickly, that from lesson eight that we're running, I set the access tokens to expire in 10 seconds. I set the refresh token, this is just for testing purposes, to expire in 20 seconds. And so this will just help us see what happens much faster. Normally, we will set this to where the access token expires in 15 minutes, and we'll set the refresh token to seven days for our deployment for this specific application. However, wanted to point out we're at 10 seconds and 20 seconds right now. So let's go ahead and log in. And now I'm going to put Dan D, our stakeholder, in his login. Once we're logged in, you can see we immediately had an auth request and then 
but we prefetched the notes and the users. Now we can view the tech notes and we already have a 403 forbidden because we were past our 10 seconds. So let me log out and do that again because we'll need to do it fairly quickly. And now let's view tech notes. And we have our tech notes, but it expires fairly quickly. Now we're not using the refresh token yet. And remember every 15 seconds we have the polling set. So our tech notes requeries that information. And so we should see it expire and we will get a 403 forbidden. And that's what we see here in our network tab. So we are using our access token and we can briefly see those for 10 seconds right now before it expires. When the next request goes out, which is actually in 15 seconds, we get this 403. So now let's make some changes and we will go ahead and start applying the refresh token as well. I'm going to close the terminal window and now underneath our base query that we created and we do need it, I am going to paste in a query wrapper that we create here. And this is going to be called base query with reauth. Now this is going to accept args, which are going to be the arguments like we're passing in essentially to our fetch base query here. It's the URL and things like that. This has its own API. So not to be confused with the API object I talked about with prepare headers, that's a separate API object, but a base query has an API object also that we can use. And then there is an extra options object. And we just pass all of these in, even if we're not using them. So we see args, API, and extra options. Now I put console logs for each of these. Now you could uncomment any one of these and you could see what we would get, but extra options would be undefined unless you passed in a value. And here I have the example of shout being the key and true being the value. But these are just examples. I wanted to leave those in just for the purpose of this tutorial. Now we set our result with the keyword let equal to await base query that we previously defined and we pass in our args, API and extra options just like we have above. Now this would be the result that we get this result right here that we get from the first request. So we have used our access token as defined up here with our base query. So it passes the access token, but now notice we're looking for a 403. So if we get an error status of 403, I'm logging, sending the refresh token. And after we send the refresh token, which I'm commenting right here. I'll press control B so we can see all of this. Then we're going to get a refresh result. So notice now we're going to await the base query and our args that we see here is a new route to go to. It goes to the auth refresh and then we're passing in API and extra options again. What we expect to get as our refresh result is data and the data should hold the access token. So now notice we are dispatching set credentials and we are spreading in that refresh result dot data. We could destructure the access token from there as well, but I did it this way in this place. Also with set credentials being used there, we need to go ahead and import set credentials at the top. So before I forget to do that, let's come back up to the top and put in our set credentials that we defined in our auth slice. That was that action creator. And then it sends the payload and sets that token in our Redux state. Okay, now let's scroll back down. After we have set credentials, then we retry the original query. Notice we're using the base query again right here, but we're passing in the args once again. And now remember, if you're wondering what the args are versus passing in this route, Let's scroll back up here and you can uncomment these and see, but it will be the request URL method and body that we previously set. So you could double check that with the console log statement if you want to. Okay, that should then retry that original request and we should once again get our data because we've applied a new access token. So what happens, we try the original access token. If it doesn't work and we get this error status 403, which is forbidden, then we send the refresh token 
And then the refresh token should give us a new access token, which is set here with set credentials. And then we retry the original query. But there's an else, if we don't have the data, we're going to then set the error status to 403. So we will have a forbidden from our refresh token try as well. So we'll have two 403s in a row. And then we're setting this message here to dot data dot message your login has expired. And we will see that, and I've put a specific space after this on purpose because we're going to provide a link after that, but we do that in the component where we will use it. And then we'll return that refresh result, which would be the error that we're sending on. Otherwise, down here at the bottom, we're returning the result, which is what we hope to get after we retry that original base query. Or it was up here and it was successful and we didn't need to have the check for the 403 if that was the case. This is the original query that might succeed without all of this if the access token hasn't expired. I hope all of that makes sense and it really helps to understand what happens with an access and a refresh token and it might help you to go back to lesson eight and review that presentation on the JWTs that I gave in that lesson. Now there's one more change we need to make and that's that we're not just going to use this base query anymore. We're going to use our base query with reauth. So once again, this base query just becomes the key for the object. And then we provide base query with reauth is the actual value here that we're using as the base query. With these changes saved, let's make sure our app is still running. Yes, I opened up the terminal and it says compiled successfully. Let's close the terminal, drag Visual Studio Code to the left. Our app is on the right. I'll drag Chrome over for a full screen. Open up DevTools so we're on the Network tab once again, and let's get ready to log in and see what happens now with these new changes in place that also use our refresh token. We're logged in. We've got the auth, notes, and users. Let's go ahead and go to the notes page. We've requested notes again now because that used the get notes query that was on our notes list page. And that starts a 15 second counter before that polling interval requests that data once again. And we set that. And this is what we see happen. It failed because our access token only lasted for 10 seconds, but the refresh token lasts for 20 seconds. So we used the refresh endpoint. We got a new access token and requested the notes again. But now this second time we request, the refresh token has expired at 20 seconds because this is now 30 seconds later. And so our notes didn't succeed and then the refresh token did not succeed. And now we get that your login has expired. So at this point, it would be time to log out and then we could go back to the employee login if we needed to. So when we extend those tokens to 15 minutes and seven days, of course, we won't get kicked out so fast, but this shows us that they are working. What happened was we prefetched all of our data. We hit the auth endpoint. We got the notes and the users. Then when we went to the notes list, it requested that data once again, because we loaded that component. And then after the access token expired, we used the refresh endpoint and we got the notes data again. That was when we polled at that polling interval of 15 seconds to once again refresh that list. And then the second time we polled, which was 30 seconds, the refresh token had also expired. And so we see those failures there. And then we hit the logout, but there's something to note here. We're continuing to request the notes and getting a 401 every 15 seconds. This is something I discovered and I might report this as a bug. I'm not sure that it is though. So I need to dive into that, but I did figure out a fix for it. So now let's look at that. I'll go ahead and close out the dev tools. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code and look at how we can prevent that request from continuing to repeat after we've logged out. Let's open the file tree as we're finished with the API slice. So control B, I think I pressed control back tick there and open the terminal by mistake. But what we want is the file tree. And now inside of the file tree, just so we can identify these queries better and discern those from the actual prefetch queries, let's go to the notes list and the users list. And instead of this undefined, we put in as the first value of this use get notes query or the first parameter, I should say, let's go ahead and put in notes list and that will give it a label 
And now let's do the same thing for users on the users list.js file. We had undefined. Let's go ahead and put in users list. And we'll be able to see these in React DevTools and just tell these queries apart from the ones that are used in the prefetch component. And now let's go up to the auth folder and we want the auth API slice. This is where we have our logout request. And then we have our on query started function. And what we're doing here is waiting for query fulfilled. Let's go ahead and uncomment this. Let's put this all on the same line. So you can see that message we get back, which will say the cookie was deleted and we can log that right there. But after that, what is happening is we are logging out and we are resetting the API state, but then it's still hanging on to that one query whenever we log out from our users list component or directly from our notes list component. I noticed when we logged out from the other components, or if we chose the same logout button, of course, it's always in the header, from other components, we do not have this issue. But we're on when we're on the users list, and when we're on the notes list, we do. Now those queries that are created by RTK query are supposed to unsubscribe the components when the component unmounts. So we're missing something. It's taking just a little bit of extra time. And that is actually what I did to solve the problem for this application. I just went ahead and put in a set timeout function. And then we'll have this anonymous function inside of set timeout. And I put the dispatch of the reset API state inside of a set timeout. And you could play around with the interval or the actual delay time. It's not an interval so much because it only happens once. I just set it to one second and that should give it plenty of time to go ahead and confirm or realize that it has unmounted that list component, whether it's the notes list or the users component, and then it can reset the API state and then it gets rid of that subscription. So like I said, I might submit this as a bug. I'm not sure that it is a bug though. It might be something that I am not realizing that I'm not doing in the correct order, but I think I'm doing this correctly with the on query started to follow up our action here. Otherwise, I would have to import use dispatch and whatever I wanted, such as my logout action creator or my set credentials uh, action creator into a component every time I wanted to use it. But this way, we can put it into the actual request here that we have, such as send logout with our query, and then using on query started, this will be called wherever we would call this mutation. And likewise, you will see when we create our persist login component, I did play around with this and imported use dispatch and that actual set credentials action creator there, and I still had this issue. So this is the place that I have found to solve the issue with set timeout for now. With this in place, let's go ahead and try this again. And if we need to, we can even look at React or Redux dev tools and see the difference. So I'm going to once again, open this up and we'll log in. Right now, it is still currently subscribed as notes, so we saw that failure. But here we have auth notes and users. We've got everything. Here we go, and we've requested the notes again. Now let's look at our Redux component, and we can see some state here as well. And this is where we want to go to see all of the state, and here's the subscriptions. Ah, if I could get it to stop. There we go. So there's our subscriptions. We have two undefined. Those are the prefetch. But then here's the notes list that we did label and define. And now if we unsubscribe, let's look at our last state here. We should no longer be subscribed to everything that we have here. Let's see. Well, we're still getting the pending and rejected from that previous subscription, I believe. Let's go ahead and try this again. And this time I'll refresh the app. Now we have no state whatsoever. Let's go ahead and log in. And now that we're logged in, let's look at our current state here. I really would like to drag this over so it's a little bit larger. Have a little bit more room to work with everything. There we go. Now our API comes down and there's our subscriptions. We can come to the end. Let's go ahead and look at the tech notes. We've got the tech notes. Now let's log out and we have no subscriptions. We can see where we logged out, where our state was, and we did have subscriptions. We had get notes undefined and get users undefined. That came in from our prefetch component. Get notes was from the notes list component. Then we have our subscriptions here that we're removing, I believe. 
and these are easier to see in the other view. But then once we get down to the reset API, it removes all of them. So this was actually different fulfilled mutations or not, I believe. You know, there it removed those subscriptions one at a time. There we can see those removed when we're highlighting each one of these. There it removed the mutation. There it removed the notes list subscription. And there it cleared out everything with the reset API state. Before we did not have that. So that's just important to note. If you don't put in that actual set timeout with a little bit of delay, you will have that one subscription from your Git users or your Git notes that is still active. Okay, with that workaround now in place, let's drag this back to the left and once again, look at Visual Studio Code. We are using the JWTs now. We have the logout working correctly and we're ready to work on persisting our login state even when we refresh the pages. I'm going to drop the features directory down and what we need to do is create a new directory called hooks. And inside the hooks directory, we're going to create a custom hook named usePersist.js. This is a simple component I'll paste in and review with you. And it's very much like a use local storage component. And if we were actually going to use local storage for more things in this application, I would probably create a use local storage component and then we could still persist and do other things with it. But this is specifically for our persist data. So we have use persist, we're setting persist and set persist with use state, and we're looking at our local storage. And if persist does not exist in our local storage, it is simply false to begin with. We're using the use effect hook as well. And when persist changes, we set that value to the local storage. And then we're returning persist and set persist. So we will use this very much like a use state hook, but it's specifically for our persist data. So let's go back to the file tree now, and we want to open up the features directory, open up the auth directory, and choose our login component. There we're going to import our use persist hook that we created at the top. And then underneath our state, we can use persist as well. So we'll say const, we'll have persist and set persist. And now let's set this equal to use persist. And now I'm going to scroll down to where we have our handlers and underneath the handle input and handle password, we're going to handle the toggle of our persist. And what we're going to do here is just use set persist, take the previous value and set it to whatever the opposite is because it's really just going to be a checkbox. And now we'll scroll down to the bottom of our form and we have a button at the bottom right now, but we want to put this underneath the button. And this is going to be that checkbox, just a toggle. So our label says HTML4 persist, and we have a class name applied from my CSS. And then this input right here is a checkbox. It has a class name of form, two underscores, and checkbox. Remember these class names go back to my CSS if you're using my CSS. The ID is persist, which must, must match the HTML4 attribute that we have up above. And it is a controlled input. So we have an on change with handle toggle and checked is equal to persist. And notice I'm labeling here, just trust this device next to the actual input, the checkbox that we're providing. Let's save these changes. And we didn't save use persist yet either, or if you hadn't, go ahead and do that as well. So we've saved our use persist hook and the changes to our login JS. Now we need to create a persist login component. Before we do that, I want to highlight there is just one change I added to my utility classes of the CSS file. Note this uh, class error message. I'm now choosing any link inside of the error message because we're going to provide one. And I am just styling it, adding the underline and the error color. So go ahead and grab the, the entire CSS file if you want to. Just note that I have added a change to it from the previous lessons. And now inside of the auth directory, let's go ahead and create our persist login component. This is the component that is going to help us remain logged in even when we refresh our application. So I'm going to paste in the imports first and we'll take a look at those. There are several. So note we have the outlet from React Router DOM. We're importing use effect, use ref, and use state from React. We're importing the use refresh mutation that we created in the last lesson in our auth API slice. We're importing the use persist hook that we just created. 
We're also importing use selector, select current token from the auth slice, and then link from React Router DOM. And now that I'm looking at this, link was a late addition. Let's go ahead and cut that out. And let's just put link right after outlet since they both come from React Router DOM. And we can remove at least one line out of all of those imports. With the imports complete, let's go ahead and start our component with RAFCE, the ES7 snippet that helps us go ahead and create a quick component, a functional component. And now we have our persist login component. And let's start with some of the state at the top and also a use ref. So notice we're just pulling in persist and not the set persist from the use persist hook we created. We're pulling in the token using our use selector and the select current token selector from our state. And that would be the current token that we have received that will give us the access that we need. It's an access token. We're also defining effect ran. And this is something I'm doing specifically for React 18. And I do have a tutorial on how to handle strict mode in React 18. And that's exactly what this is going to be for. We're setting this use ref to false right now. And that is the effect ran value. Now we're going to have true success and set true success. I separated this out because it is something that's a little unique also that we'll need to talk about. Next, we'll go ahead and bring in our refresh mutation. And this looks like many of the other hooks we have used from RTK query. So we have our refresh function. And then we have several states. One new state to notice that we haven't used before is, is uninitialized. That means the refresh function has not been called yet. And that's another state that we're going to use. And now I'm going to scroll up for some more room. And after our use refresh mutation hook, we'll go ahead and put in our use effect and we'll cover this. There's quite a bit to cover here as I'm doing something that was covered in a separate tutorial about handling React 18 strict mode. So that's what you see first. We're using our effect ran, which was the use ref defined up here with the initial value of false. Now we have to get the value from the dot current property. So now I'm saying if effect ran dot current is true, now, the first time use effect runs, it will be false. But in strict mode, what happens to every component is they mount, then they unmount, and then they remount. So use effect runs twice when you're in development using strict mode. So if effect ran.current equals true will only be true the second time. And that's because we're going to set it to true later on. Now, next it says or process.env dot node underscore env not equal to development. So if we're not in development mode, it's going to go ahead and do this as well. So that's because React 18 strict mode only happens in development. So if you have that in effect in your index.js and when you use create react app, it is in there by default. So it's good to know this. So this will have a problem actually if we do this twice and usually it's okay and components won't have a problem but this does create a problem if we're going to use that refresh token so we will only want to send it one time and before i get into the verify refresh token function just to continue on with this strict mode notice I'm using the cleanup function here so after use effect runs the first time the cleanup function sets it to true, the effect ran dot current equals true. And then use ref will actually hold that value even after the component unmounts and remounts. And so that will be okay. So when we come back through, this will be true. Now you see our function verifying refresh token or verify refresh token. It's an async function. And notice I'm just logging to the console here so we can see it happen, verifying refresh token. And I've got a try catch block. Now, what I did was comment out the response because we don't really need it here. We're going to set this response in our on query started back in our auth API slice. But I wanted to go ahead and leave it here in case you want to uncomment it and go ahead and log that console here or log the access token to the console, I should say. You can do that here. And when I first put this together, I actually imported use dispatch and then I imported set credentials 
and that is the action creator, and we disp dispatch that action creator right here. But I think it's going to be better to do that in the auth API slice in that on query started, much like we did with the logout action creator. So we're going to await the refresh, refresh right here, but then we have a problem. And I didn't think about this at first, but we can have that is success status from our use refresh mutation hook. It can be successful before those credentials get set. And that happened to me when I was dispatching it here. And it still happened to me when I used it inside of the on query started inside of the auth API slice. So either way. So what I needed to do was add one more piece of state. So that's why you see this set true success. I needed one more flag to say, yes, we have got the data and those credentials have been set. And it really, it just needs that extra little bit of time to work. It doesn't really make sense. It's not something you would think of at first, but then when you try it the way you think about it, when you just wait for the is success, you realize when it's not working that you just quite haven't given the credentials time to be set and then be used when the request is sent. So by setting this other piece of state right here, we get that extra little bit of time. And so that's why I just called this true success. So once we set that to true, as we have that in state above right here on line 14, that's why I set it aside because it just needed a little bit of explaining. Once we set that to true, we should be ready to go ahead and display everything inside of our components. And this persist login component is a wrapper. It's wrapped around everything that we want to persist that we need the token for. And now that defines our verify refresh token function. And notice after that, we say if there is no token and we have checked persist. So if persist is true, essentially, then we're going to verify the refresh token. Now, why do we say if there is no token? Well, that's what happens when you refresh the page and the state is wiped out. You have no access token or any other state at that point. So we need to verify that refresh token. And what we do with that endpoint is just send that cookie back and that contains the refresh token and then it gives us access to all the other state because we get a new access token. One more thing to highlight before we're finished with use effect, and that is this comment right here. So this disables some warnings that will tell me I need several things inside of my dependency array here, but I really don't because I only want this to run the one time when this component mounts and it makes this check. So if you put in this line, eslint dash disable dash next dash line, then you will not get those warnings. Now I'm going to scroll up and instead of returning the div that we have right here, I'm just going to say content and we're going to define some content. And it's really going to be a larger if then statement than is needed, but I wanted it to explain some things. So you could condense this down after you understand what all is happening. But I really thought I needed all of these different else's here to show what is happening. So the first thing we're going to do is just say if persist is essentially false. If we're not wanting to persist our login, then we're going to say no persist in the console, and we're just going to set the content equal to the outlet. So that's fine. We don't want to persist the login. It won't have an access token. It will tell us we're not logged in if we refresh when we're on a logged in page, a protected page. The next is the is loading state. So if that is true, maybe we've told it, yes, we want to persist, but we don't have a token because our refresh mutation will only get called if we don't have that token. So that's the only time there would possibly be an is loading. So then we could display the content of loading while that is true. Now we might have an error if persist is yes and token is no as well, but maybe we get an error. So we're going to display that error and this could happen when our refresh token expires. So we get a 403, not only from the access token, but also from the refresh token. And then we're going to go ahead and use that link from React Router that says, please log in again. And we're going to display that right after our error message. So we should see that all in one line. Finally, this is the one we want is success is true, but remember, we also needed to wait for that true success or it just didn't get time to set the credentials. So here we've got persist is yes, and yes, now we have a token and everything is ready to go. But also there's the possibility right when this component loads that we do have a token, but we haven't yet initialized that refresh mutation 
uh, function. So this could also be what we see, and this has token and uninit is going to the console, and you'll probably see that because that should be what happens first. We're also just logging is uninitialized, so you can see what that value is. It should probably be true at that point. And this would also just return the outlet. Now, after you take all of this in, as I said, some of it could be condensed. I just wanted to show you each possibility inside of this if and then else if statement. And there are several possibilities to take into account. Now let's go ahead and save this file. Let's show the file tree once again and go back to our auth API slice. In the previous tutorial, we went ahead and added our refresh mutation right here. However, I mentioned we did not put in the on query started yet here, and we need to do that. So let's put a comma after the query, and then let's go ahead and put in our on query started, and you'll see why we need it. Here we have on query started much like above. We used it here in our logout as well, and we're once again pulling in the dispatch and the query fulfilled. We're once again getting the data. I'm gonna go ahead and log the data here, which would be the access token. And here you can see I'm destructuring the access token. Now we need to import set credentials at the top as well. So let's make sure we do that before we forget. And it comes from the auth slice, just like logout. So I'll put set credentials in there. And then if we come back down and look at this, we're taking our dispatch and we're going to go ahead and call the action creator set credentials and pass in that access token right here. And we're doing this here so we don't need to import use dispatch and the action creator in every component that we want to use it in. Now, anytime we use our refresh mutation, it will go ahead and set the credentials for us as well. And with that complete, we are ready to go to our app.js and import our persist login component. So we will import persist login, there it is in our list. And once we have that, let's scroll down and we're going to wrap this around everything just like we did our prefetch component. So I'm going to click on the line of the prefetch component and press shift alt and the down arrow. And then I'm just going to change the top one. We want this to wrap around the prefetch as well to persist login. And then I'll scroll to the bottom and where we have our closing route, I'll do shift alt and the down arrow to get another closing route. When I save, it should imply the, or apply the indents and we see that. So persist login is now wrapped around the prefetch and the dash layout component. And of course, everything else that's inside of those. And with our changes all saved, let's drag this to the left. And it looks like we're having a hard time finding this hook that we created. Let's see what's going on with that. And yes, I've got the hook way up here. The hooks directory needs to be inside of the source directory. Sometimes I miss that when I create a new directory. So we're inside of the source directory. And that is where we have the features directory. We have the hooks directory, the config directory, and so on. So if you were following me and had it outside of the source directory, please move the hooks directory inside of the source directory. Okay, let's drag this to the left once again. No more error. That looks good. Let's drag our screen of the browser over so we can see everything that we want to see now. And what we're going to do is clear this out and we're going to refresh everything. Let's go to the network tab once again. So when we log in, we're going to have dandy and sign in and we've got our auth notes and users let's go to view tech notes we're still good let's refresh and our tokens haven't expired and notice what happens when we refresh we hit the refresh endpoint we got notes and notes users from the prefetch as well. One of these notes came from the use get notes query. Now I haven't changed our back end, so it's going to time out fairly quickly. So let's go ahead and change our back end now as well. I'll pull this back up and let's put the proper times here. So we'll say 15 minutes for the access token and we can say seven days for the refresh token. So that shouldn't expire. But remember, there's a second spot for the access token because our refresh endpoint issues a new one. So we need to scroll down and find that other 10 second spot and change that to 15 minutes as well. Now those shouldn't time out on us and we'll be able to test everything just a little bit better here. So now clear this out, go ahead and log out here 
and everything should be clear, but I want to go ahead and refresh. Just start with a clean slate. Now let's go ahead and log in again. We have Dan D. And notice I should go back to the home page here. I'll log out one more time so we can look and I'll log in. Notice we have the trust this device now with the check mark. And if you want to check that, you can go to the application tab and then you're in local storage, localhost 3000, persist is true right now. We can uncheck it. You won't see it change here. You need to actually right click, choose refresh. Now it's false. If I check it again and I refresh again, now it's true. So that's how you can check that. Now I'm going to go back to the network tab, refresh all of that or clear it out at least. And now we'll say Dan D's login one more time. We've logged in. He hits the auth endpoint, prefetches notes and users. Let's go ahead and look at the notes. So now we had the other notes request. Now, if we go ahead and refresh, we're still good. We hit the refresh endpoint. One of the notes was prefetched and one was from the notes list page. And then we have the users prefetched as well. We can even go in to one of the specific notes and we can refresh and we still have all of the data and we're still logged in. So now that we're using our JWTs and our persist login state is in place, we are ready to apply role-based access control and permissions. And that is in the next tutorial. Our starter code today is the completed code from lesson 10. So I've got the package JSON open. Let's just change this name to lesson 11 and save the file. But after that, we also need to add a dependency today. So I'm going to press control in the back tick to open up the terminal window. And then I'm going to type npm i and then jwt dash decode so we can decode the access token that we're receiving from our backend rest api and then we're going to use that information inside of that token where we store the username and the roles that we receive for our user and now we can see we have jwt decode installed in our dependency list here in the package JSON. Now let's move over to the user stories.md and we've got quite a few here that we haven't checked off, but really we can check off a few and by the end of this lesson we'll have most of these complete. So the third one, add an employee login to the notes app. Well, we've done that. And after we add the extra role-based access control and permissions today, this will be completely in place. So I'm just going to check that off now. Number eight, require users to log in at least once per week. Well, we have set our refresh token to expire every seven days. So that pretty much completes that and provide a way to remove employee access ASAP if needed. We do have that with the active and inactive state for each employee. And once they log in, they can't receive that data if they are inactive. So we can check that off. Now that leaves several others that we can go over. We're not going to check off number one today or complete that. Now everything else we've completed in previous lessons, including the ones I just checked off. But now, five and six, easy navigation, we'll complete that today. Display current user and assigned roles, we'll complete that today. Number 14, notes can only be deleted by managers or admins. We will add that permission in today for those roles. Anyone can create a note when the customer checks in. So even though we haven't checked this off yet, we really have that in place, but I don't want to check it off until we verify this with the permissions and role-based access control in place. Then there's employees can only view and edit their assigned notes. We will implement that today. Managers and admins can view, edit, and delete all notes. We'll verify that as well today. Only managers and admins can access user settings. We'll take care of that. And only managers and admins can create new users. We will also take care of that. Desktop mode is most important, but should be available in mobile. We will wait on that just like we did with number one. So we will have those two left today for at least the final lesson in this series. But let's save our user stories.md and move on. Let's go to the source directory in our file tree. And from there, we're going to open up the hooks directory. And you can see we have one custom hook that is use persist. Let's create another new file here. Let's call this use auth.js. I'll paste in our imports and we can quickly look at those. We're bringing in use selector from React Redux and then our 
token selector, select current token from our auth slice. After that, we're going to bring in JWT decode from our new dependency, JWT dash decode, that we just added in our package JSON. From there, I'm going to type RAFCE with our ES7 snippets. It should quickly create a functional component called use auth. And now that we have that, let's remove the return as this will be something that starts out with a few values. So let's pull in our token, which is our access token with our use selector and the select current token selector that's passed into it. And then we're going to set some different values here for is manager, is admin, and status. Right now, false, false, and the status, the default value will be employee. After that, let's go ahead and return some values. And we're going to start off with a username inside of this object that we're returning, and it will just be an empty string. Then we'll have roles, and that will be an empty array. After that, we'll just put in the is manager, is admin, and status. Now this will be what is returned if we don't have a token. But now let's check to see if we do have a token. So we can say if we do have a token, then let's look at what happens inside of this if statement, because this is where we actually get our values from the access token. So we're going to define decoded, and we're going to decode the token with JWT decode. From there, I'm just going to destructure the username and the roles that are stored inside of that access token. And if you remember from our backend REST API code, we put all of that inside of a user info property inside of the token. So we have decoded.userInfo, and that's where we can destructure the other values, such as username and roles. And now we're just going to set some different values and things that might be useful that we could use anytime we pull this hook in. We don't have to use all of the values. We just want to make this hook very useful for any type of situation that needs to confirm if we have a manager or an admin or just what the username or roles are. So we're going to set this value for is manager to check the roles to see if it includes manager because it's an array with the different values inside of it. The same for is admin. We're just checking for an admin. And then we're going to set the status equal to whatever the highest role is. So we need to check for is manager first, and then we check the status to manager instead of employee that we've set above. Likewise, after checking is manager, we can check for is admin, and then anyone who is an admin and a manager will have their status set to admin instead. So we could have named status highest status if we wanted to be very accurate about that. But whatever we're storing in status is the highest role available to that user. And then we're returning the username the roles array, and then the status is manager and is admin. You might think you wouldn't need all of these and you could go without some of them and create other logic inside of your components, but I think it's better to just handle the logic here, deliver all of the different information in these different forms, and then just destructure out of the hook whatever you need at that current time. Now let's save our new use auth hook and let's move on to the components directory and go to the dash footer.js file. We're going to import our new use auth hook at the very top, and now let's destructure what we need to use inside of the footer. So I'll say const, we're going to pull in the username and the status, and then we'll just set this equal to use auth. And now let's scroll down to our content and you can see we have the current user and status here available. So let's just put those values in here with username and then we can put status here as well. So status and save this file. And now let's see how that looks in our app. And to test our app, we need our backend code running. So I also have the code from lesson eight running in a separate instance of VS Code. And you can see we have our backend connected to MongoDB. It's running on port 3500 for the local host. And this is our REST API. So now let's go back to the React app code that I have in the other instance of VS Code open a terminal window here and type npm start and the app is up and running let's go ahead and go to a login so we can log in and then see our footer that we have in our welcome page so here we go with dan d's information and now we can see in the footer we have current user dan d and his status is admin let's go ahead and log out and check one more so we'll log in and check mark our manager 
and we'll enter his credentials and now we have current user mark and the status is manager so our footer is working as expected i'm going to close the terminal window and i'll go ahead and close up the components directory for now let's move into features and the auth directory where we have our welcome js file now at the top of the welcome js file let's once again bring in that use auth hook and now as the component gets started here let's bring in the values we need so we're going to destructure username and we also want is manager and is admin and we'll bring all of those in from our new use auth hook. And the very first thing we can do is extend our welcome with the username. So let's just put the username right here inside of our H1 with the welcome. After that, let's scroll down. And remember, we only want to allow managers and administrators, admins, to view user settings or add a new user. So let's put some conditional logic around these links. So I will put a curly brace at the beginning and the end, but then at the very beginning, we can check to see if we have an is manager status or an is admin status set to true. And if we do, then we can just use the double ampersand. So now if we have a manager or admin, if either one of these are true, then this link will show for the user settings in this welcome page. Now we can copy this exact same logic and do the same thing for the add new user link. So we'll put this right there and then we'll put the curly brace at the end. And we have both links now only provided to our admins and managers on this welcome page. And let's go ahead and verify that with Chrome. So right now I'm logged in as a manager mark and it is still showing all four links. Let me log out and I'll log in as an employee named Joe. And his only role is employee and Joe can only view the tech notes or add a new tech note. He does not have the links for the user settings or to add a new user. If we log back out, and we'll log Dan D in, the administrator, and we'll verify here on the welcome page, Dan has all four links. Let's go back to VS Code. Before we move on to the header, I just want to point out that yes, I've got this conditional logic in here twice. You could put it once, and then of course have a fragment and put both of these links inside. But I wanted to show how to apply this to individual links and we'll see more of that as we move on to the header and apply it to buttons. But you could do it either way. There's always more than one way to do things. And sometimes I get comments saying you could have done this, but then I think if I had done that, then I would have got a comment saying you could have done what I already did. So either way, just do it the way you want to, but I'm providing it here for each link. Okay, let's move on now back to the components directory and to the dash header. This is where we're going to provide that easy navigation that is in our user stories list. And I'm just going to come down here and add some more lines to our import as we bring in these different icons from Font Awesome because I need to bring in several more. So now you can see I've got four new icons on top of the existing one that we already had. And then underneath our send logout mutation, I'm going to bring in our use auth hook as well. And now scrolling up to start out the component, we're going to go ahead and destructure some information from our use auth hook. So I'll say const and we need is manager and we also need is admin and we'll bring those in from use auth. And now I'll scroll again and underneath our use effect, I'm going to put in four click handlers, all for the new buttons that we're going to add. And you can see each one of the buttons is going to have a different navigation destination. We're bringing in that use navigate hook that we already had to call the navigate function. And so we could go to add a new note, add a new user to the notes list or to the users list, all from the header. We're going to change our is loading and our is error return statements that we have here as well, but I'll come back to that. Right now, I want to go underneath where we defined our dash class, and we'll look at how that dash class is applied because we created it in a previous lesson, but we really didn't look at the result of it too closely. We've also got a logout button here. Between these two, I'm going to add our four other buttons and we'll look at what they do. So 
they follow that same pattern that I used before for the dash class and for the logout button. So you can see we're defining the button initially with the keyword let and setting it to null. And then we're using our regexes that we created above in the previous lessons as well. So we had the three different regexes here and we're checking those with conditional logic to see if we want to turn the button from null into something more if we're going to use that button and it really depends on the path. So here we're making sure that we are on the notes list essentially with this regex and if that's the page we're on then we'll include the new note button. Here we're doing the same for the users list and then we're including the new user button. Down here we have a user button as well but now we're making sure that we are not on the users list and we are also making sure that the path name includes dash and we're pulling in that path name from the use location hook but we're also checking to see if we are a manager or an admin so this is the user button for the users list so what we're doing really is checking to make sure we're not already on the users list because then we don't want to provide the button to go to the same page that we're on but we are making sure that we are in the protected pages with dash and then we could provide a new user button if we're a manager or an admin. When I said a new user button, this is actually the users list button. Now above, notice we didn't check to see if we were an admin or a manager for the new user button. However, we don't really need to because we have to be an admin or a manager to be on the users list in the first place. And the only place the new user button will appear is if we are on that users list page. And then scrolling down, we have a notes button as well. And this notes button is checking to make sure we're not on the notes list page and that once again, we are in the protected pages that start with dash. And you can also see each one of these buttons has the class name icon dash button. This applies back to the CSS that I've created. They all have title attributes as well. And the on click applies to each of the four handlers that I supplied above these buttons in the code that we recently put in. Also, they all have their own unique icon that we're bringing in from Font Awesome. Okay, under this, underneath the logout button as well, but let's put it maybe above the content that we define. I want to add an error class like we have previously had in components before where we're checking to see if we have an error. And remember, this would only be for the logout because we have that send logout mutation and it does have an is error status. So if we have logged out and we have an error, then we're going to apply the error message class, otherwise off screen. So this means we're going to present the error in a different way than we had above. So I'm actually going to put the error just on top of the header. Otherwise, the way we currently have it, it would display inside the header. And that would look kind of weird because the header is constrained to a small area at the very top of the page. If we put the error above the header, it will span the page just on top of the header. So let's do that. And we're going going to need a fragment to do that because then we'll have two different elements underneath as children. So then after the header will close out this fragment as well and we can save and now we have our error and I could even put a space to set them apart. But now we have our error that has the error class we define. So it's typically off screen unless we have an error and then the error message class applies and it will display that message across the top of the page. Now notice inside of our content here, we had add more buttons later and we have our logout button, but I'm actually going to define all of the button content above and then we'll put that inside of the content. So I'll paste this in and we can take a look and now you can see we're also going to change what we do for the is loading that we previously had above, but I'm defining button content. We're checking that is loading status. Again, that only applies if we call that send logout mutation. And if that's what happens, then we have button content equals logging out. Otherwise, the button content is going to equal all of the buttons that we've created if they exist. If they're null, they won't show up. And so either way, we're going to put button content in our content below. So it could display logging out if we have is loading. Otherwise, it will display the button icons that are appropriate for each page that we're on. So now we can scroll down here. We can get rid of this note altogether. And instead of logout button right here, we can just say, button content and save. Now we need to go up 
and remove the is loading and is error that we previously had in our page right here. So we'll remove both of those and we should be good. Let's check it all out in Chrome now. I'll pull Chrome up. Oh, and we have a blank page. We may have an error. Let's drag this over so I can open up DevTools as well and see what's going on. Yep, we'll scroll up to the top to see where the errors start. Okay, cannot read properties of undefined. Reading data at the dash header in 130. I think this has to do with us reading our error if we have one. So let's go back, look at the dash header on line 130. So scrolling down here, and there we are, yep, where the error is displayed. I didn't use optional chaining here, and we're not checking the is error status first. So if we don't have an error, that data property doesn't exist. We need optional chaining there to make this work, and we can save. While I'm doing that, I'm going to go ahead and highlight the source directory, and then I'm going to right click and choose Find in Folder, search for error.data to see if I did this anywhere else that will have any possible consequence that I hadn't caught. I do see it in a couple of places. Let's look at those quickly. In the persist login component, I've got error.data and then optional chaining for the message, just like we saw in the other file, but I am checking the is error uh, property here, for, or I said property value here first. So this would only happen if we do have an error, which would make this okay, but we can be doubly safe just by adding that optional chaining there to the persist login component. Now let's check out in the API slice where it says it has it, but this is where we're setting the value. So this is what we need. We don't want optional chaining here. So this one is fine. Let's go ahead and close that and close the persistent login component as well. Go back to the file tree over here, and I think we're now ready to check everything out inside of Chrome. So let's look. Yep, and Joe is logged in now, and he's got access to the tech notes and add a new tech note, but does not have access to those other links for the user. So all is like we expect, but we're also checking the header now. And notice he has an icon to go to the notes list, or he can log out, because that's all he really has access to. Let's go to the notes list, and he has the notes, and now there's an icon for a new note. And we click that and we go to the new note. Now notice the icon changed back to the notes list. So this is all working as expected. Let's log Joe out and let's log Mark in who will have access to the users as well because Mark's a manager. Now logging him in and we can see at the top we have an icon for the notes list or for the user settings. So let's go to user settings. There they are. Now that we're on the user settings page, we can create a new user with this icon or go back to the notes list. So there we go. When we're on the create a new user screen, we can now go to the users list with the user settings icon or the notes list. So let's go back to the users list. Let's go to the notes list. And now we've got a new note icon or the users list. Let's go ahead and create a new note. We're on the new note page. Now we could go back to the notes list or the users list. Let's edit a note. Now we could go to the notes list or the users list. Again, everything seems to be working like we expect it to for Mark as well. And of course here on the welcome screen, he has access to all of the links too. Let's log Mark out and we'll log back in as Joe. So here's Joe and he is an employee only. So he should only have access to the notes and the add new tech note. Now let's view the tech notes and he can see everyone's notes like he's an admin or a manager. So we need to change that as well. So let's go back to the code. Let's close the components directory. Let's look in features, look inside of notes, and we'll choose the notes list JS. Now at the top of notes list JS, we once again need to bring in our use auth hook. And as the component gets started, let's destructure what we need, which is the username, is manager, and is admin. And we'll pull all of those from our use auth hook. Now I'll add an extra line there and let's scroll down to our is success area where we're destructuring the IDs from notes. Now remember we're using our entity adapter from Redux and RTK query. And so we have an array of IDs, but we also have entities. So what we want to get here is not just the IDs, but also 
the entities. So we're destructuring both of those from the notes that we get from our hook above, the use get notes query, we renamed the data notes. So now that we have IDs and entities, we can change this just a little bit and we will only view Joe's notes because we can filter these. So I'm going to paste this in and we'll go over it. I'm going to create a variable called filtered IDs. Then we're going to check if we have a manager or an admin, the filtered IDs are essentially going to be the same as the actual IDs array, but we're just going to create a new array right here that holds those. So we spread in the IDs array, but else, so if we're Joe and we're not a manager or an admin, then filtered IDs is going to equal the IDs array filtered where the note ID, each ID passed in, is going to be used on the entities. So we can identify the entity and we're going to look at that username for that specific note and see if it matches Joe's username. And if it does, it will be included in this filtered IDs array. So then we want to move down and change a little bit of our logic for our table content. I'm going to press Control B to hide the file tree just so we have some more room. I'm going to change this from a ternary too because I think we can switch this pattern. Let's go ahead and use backspace to remove that and I'll say if the IDs array has length, then we're going to apply the filtered IDs to map instead of IDs right here. We can also just get rid of this null. We no longer need the ternary because we're using the double ampersands that we see. And I think I can get rid of that parentheses as well. Nope, that one's for map. I do need that. So what we're doing instead of using a ternary is just saying, okay, IDs have length and then we can filter those uh, IDs and of course apply that to the entity that we did up here. So this is just Joe's post by the time we have filtered IDs right here. Or I said post, it's his notes actually. So we save that and now when we go to view the notes with Joe's login, we should only see the one note that he currently has. So let's go back and check that out. And yep, only this note is what Joe has access to. Now he can create notes for other people, but then after he creates them, he won't be able to go back and view them because he only has access to the notes that are assigned to him. Now, if we go back as Mark, as a manager, he should be able to see all of those. So let's check that out as well. Now let's look at the tech notes. Mark can still see all of the notes, no matter who they're assigned to. So works either way. Now, of course, as we drag this out and we get a wider screen, we can see more columns here as well. And I think you see who those are assigned to there. But if we open these up now, like if we look at Bob Jones iPhone title here for his note, it is assigned to Joe. And if we go back to the list and look at Foo City Schools with their laptops to repair, that's assigned to Mark and so on. So you can see Mark has access to all of these. Okay, we'll log out and let's once again log back in as Joe and we'll check everything out. Looks good. Tech notes, still just Joe's note. That's all good. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. I'll pull the file tree back up with Control B. And that logic we just changed there with the double ampersands instead of a ternary, I remember one other place we could use that as well. And that was in the users list where we did something very similar. So let me scroll down. We once again have the IDs length. Here we do not need to filter anything, but otherwise we can use that same logic. So let me get rid of the ternary, put the double ampersand in, and then we can get rid of the null as a possible result as well. And this works just as well, and I like the logic just a little bit better. I'm going to bring Chrome back up now, and we're logged back in as Joe, and let me take this to the full screen. And what I want to show is we've applied permissions to several components, and those permissions are applied to the roles instead of any one user, so you can assign as many users as you want to those roles, and that's more efficient. We abstract those permissions away from each individual user to roles, so we have role-based access control. But now I want to highlight that we haven't protected the routes yet. So even though Joe should not have access to the users, really we're just not showing him an icon to get there. So if Joe were to know the address and just type in users, 
he can still view the users list here. So we need to change that by protecting the routes. Likewise, if I log out entirely now and say I were to try to go to one of these pages and I'm not logged in, we won't be able to see it, but it's not because of a protected route. It's just because of an error that we're getting from our API, the response. And I see we need to add a space there. So let's fix that quickly before we add the protected routes. I'll pull Visual Studio Code back up. And from the last lesson, you might remember we were in the app directory working with the API slice. And here I'll press Control B again to hide the file tree so we can see this better. But we had this error message and I left the extra space here, but that's not the error message we were seeing. We were seeing unauthorized. So that space really isn't helping us out. Let's go ahead and remove that and handle the space somewhere else. So I'll save that, show the file tree again, and now let's go back to our persist login component and that's what's showing this error data message that we have and then it shows please log in again so we need to change this so there's a space and I can do that by making this a template literal so I'm going to start with a back tick and then the dollar sign and the curly brace and then we want to have a curly brace after it all and I'm going to also put a, a space and a hyphen and a space actually so we can separate the error message from our please log in again message and there'll be a hyphen in between. And then I'll put my closing back tick and then I need a closing curly brace. Now we'll have that error message and please log in again. So let's save that. Let's go back to Chrome now and we can see this has changed. So we have our error message space a hyphen or you could call it a dash and then a space and then our link to please log in again which takes us back to the login and now we've shown the reasons to protect our routes one we're really just getting an error we're going ahead and requesting something from the API even when a user isn't logged in and we don't want that even though it returns an error and then when Joe is logged in even though he doesn't have the permission to see those icons to take him to the user settings he can still get there if he knows the address we need to change all of that by protecting our routes. To protect our routes, we need to create one more component inside of our auth directory. So I'm going to do that and name it require auth with a capital R and a capital A dot JS. I'll put the imports first. We're going to import use location, navigate, and outlet from React Router. We're also going to import our use auth hook. Then I'll use RAFCE to get our functional component quickly, but this is not going to be what we need here. So I'll just replace that. And here's the content we need. So here we're getting the location from our use location hook, and we're only bringing in the roles array from use auth. Now that we have that, let's define the content. So the content is going to equal this ternary statement, and I'm using the roles array and then the sum method, which means if this is true at least once, this will return true. So if we find one of the roles, that's all we really need. And we also need to pass in the allowed roles, as we see here inside of our sum method here. So let's pass in those allowed roles. And as you can expect, this allowed roles is an array that is being passed in. So now we're calling includes on that and we're checking each role there. So essentially if allowed roles includes one of the roles that the user has that we're getting from use auth, then we'll have true and we'll just return the outlet, which as you might remember is all of the children, whatever we're going to wrap this require auth component around. So it is a wrapper to protect whatever we have inside of it, whatever routes, and make sure they're only sent for these allowed roles. Otherwise, we're going to use navigate and send whoever is trying to access a route that they're not allowed to access back to the login page. And what this does, here we have the state, so we, we get the location from use location, and we're passing that in here as the from for our state, this is a React Router thing, and then we say replace. So we're saying replace this. What we don't want is to have this require auth component in the history. So say Joe tries to access the user settings and then he would use the back button. If we didn't do this, he would just go back to the require auth and it would send him back to the login again. So his back button essentially wouldn't work. This will ensure it does. So if he's on the, say the tech notes list, then he tries to access the user settings by typing in the address 
it'll send him to the login. But Joe thinks, hey, I'm already logged in. I'm just going to hit the back button. He will be able to do that. So he could back up and be back at the notes list, or he could log in again, and that wouldn't hurt anything either. So that's our require auth component, and we're going to use it as a wrapper more than once inside of our app.js. Let's now head over to our app.js. We can close the features directory in the file tree. We haven't looked at the app.js in a little while since we brought in the persist login component in the last lesson at least. But now we've got a couple of things to add here for imports. One would be the require auth component that we just created, but also we need the roles. If you remember, we created a roles object in the config directory before, and we're going to pull those in. Let's look at that real quick, just so we can remember what we have there. We have a roles object, and it's got keys and values that actually match. So we have employee, employee, manager, manager, admin, admin. If you went through my Node.js course, you've seen this also where the employee is assigned a number, the manager is assigned a number. This could be different at different companies. This is just what we're doing now. And you'll see how we can still use dot notation to refer to these when it's constructed as an object. And I think that's ideal when we bring this into app.js. So we're also importing that roles object. And now I'm just going to add a comment here for the public routes. So everything is wrapped inside of our original layout that we've talked about in the past. And these first two routes are our public routes. The public can access the home page, of course, that's the public page. And then they can also access the login page because we have a link from there to the employee login. It wouldn't be necessary if all the employees bookmarked it, for instance, and maybe you wouldn't want that on your home page, but we've done it for this project. After that, let's go ahead and add the protected routes. And I'm going to just mark those as well. That's going to be everything after these. So protected routes start here with the persist login that we currently have. And then they're also wrapped in our prefetch component. And then we have a separate dash layout that has that header and footer and then all the internal routes for that as well. So let's go ahead and mark the end of these as well. So I could mark the end of the protected routes. We don't really need to do that for the public since there's only those two. But the end of the protected routes is going to be down here at the very bottom. So I'll put that right there. And now let's scroll back up and let's protect all of our routes. I'm just going to click here on line 27 and then use Shift Alt and the down arrow because we want this to be our require auth component, at least our first one that we're going to add. We want it after the persist login because it's going to need that login data to get that from the use auth hook. However, we want it before the prefetch component. So if someone's not authorized, we're not going to go ahead and prefetch that data. There's no reason for that. So let's go ahead and add require auth right here. And now require auth needs to pass the allowed roles in. And the allowed roles is going to be an array. So we're going to create a new array right here by putting in the brackets. And now we can put in each role we want to allow to access the protected routes. Now this is for all of the protected routes, even the welcome. So really all roles should be allowed to view this, at least if they have a role. Likewise, the public should not be able to. So we could put in each individual role, like we could say roles dot, and then you can see we get dot notation. We could choose admin, employee, manager, so we could have roles dot admin, comma, and so on, which is what we will do for another route coming up. But since it takes all of them, we can also say dot, 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 we're just spreading in, and then say object dot values, and then we'll pass in the roles. And this will just spread in all of the roles inside of that object. Now I'm going to press Control B just to make sure that we close this out. I couldn't see the end of this. Yes, and that looks fine. So we need to go ahead and add one more closing route element here as well. So I'll just click on line 47 and bring that down. Now when I save, we'll get the proper indentation. And now everything should be protected, but it's allowed to all roles. Now let's go ahead and use require auth once again for a nested route. And we need to do that for our users routes. So I'm just going to copy all of this and then we'll change the roles. And I just wanna wrap it around the users routes. So I'll bring this down here, paste it here, and I need one more closing route there. And now let's just change the routes or the actual roles, I mean, that can access the user's routes. So here we'll say roles dot, and a manager can access the users. 
and then roles dot, and an admin can access the user. So we're passing an array with only those two values. And I see a little red to indicate an error over here from VS Code, and that's because it instantly put a closing route tag there as well, but we have that down below. So now let's save, and we've got the proper indentation again. And now let's go back to Chrome and check everything out. So first we'll log in as Joe, Whoops, I had my caps lock on there and did it the opposite of what I needed. So I need capital J, then OE, okay, here's Joe's password. We are logged in. He only has access to the notes again and we see all the proper links. But what about if we try to just go to the user settings once again? So I'm going to type in slash users at the end here and he gets kicked back out to the login. So that's fine. Let's see if the back button works as expected. Yep, it took him right back to the dash. So that is what we want. Let's go ahead and try to do the same thing now for Mark, who should still be able to access all of the routes. So here's Mark, let's go to user settings. He can still see the user settings and he can edit a user he could probably even create a new user. We can do it with that icon now. Notice the dash class, if you remember us setting that up in the header as well. So when we go to the forms that aren't as wide as the lists, when we take up the full screen, it brings these icons over even with the form. So that's what that class was about. It's just changing the width a little bit. So now if we go back to the user list, they're back over here to the right, taking up the full screen, which is fine. We can see this with notes too, by the way. Let's go in and edit a note. Now our icons are all lined up over here with the form instead of way over here to the right. So everything seems to be working just fine for Mark too, and the routes are good. Let's go ahead and log out now and now let's just try to access those routes and see if we get that error from the API or if we actually just get kicked to the login screen by our require auth component. So we'll say dash and users. Now we're not logged in at all and we get unauthorized, please log in again, which I believe that does indicate a request is going out. So I'll go back to that. Let's open up dev tools and let's see what we got. Yes, we got the persist login error right here and there's an error object from the auth API slice. That's all good. Let's check the network request as well. So here we're at the network and let's try to reload this page. And we hit the refresh and that's what gives us the error. So that's okay too. And really this is better than taking someone straight to the login page if they're trying to access something they don't have access to. So now they have to do a little more work and that's just fine with me. Let's see what happens if we go back to the login page and uncheck trust this device. Now we're not logged in at all. We're on home. I'm going to refresh network request is good. Let's go ahead and try that users again. So we're at dash and now users and we're not checking that stay logged in on the login page and we get kicked right back to the login and that's fine too. And that's what I expected the first time. I didn't think about the trust this device. If it was just a public machine and no employees had logged in, maybe a customer logging in on their home computer and they tried to access a route that was protected, they would just get kicked to the login because they don't have access. A quick final note, I am back here at the user stories and I was reviewing those and notes can only be deleted by managers or admins. I realized we skipped over that one. So let's go ahead and finish that before this lesson is over. We should go to the features and then the notes directory. And now we should go to edit note JS and then edit note form JS. And this is where we will actually work with that trash can icon and only let it appear for managers and admins. So I'm going to paste in our use auth hook once again as the import. And then from there, we're going to destructure what we need. And that is is manager and is admin. And I'll set this equal to use auth and pull that from the hook. I should mention, as you might have already noticed, the manager can access everything the admin can at this point in the app. And really, our user stories don't require for more than that. However, I'm providing each because there could be additions in the future. We're just making it flexible. Possibly we tie this into a ticketing uh, financial app or something like that, something that Dan, our stakeholder, wants to add in the future. So it's still good to have that 
separation between managers and admins. So we're just building it in now. Okay, after we've brought in the is manager and is admin status, we need to scroll down and I'm going to scroll down till we're underneath our content here for the error and everything we've created. There we go. Between the error content and the regular content, I'm going to define our delete button. I'll just paste that in and we can go over it. It has the same pattern you've seen before. So we have let delete button and it equals null. But then if we are a manager or an admin, the delete button then has some content. And of course it calls the on delete note clicked. So let's scroll down into our code now and we can replace where we originally had that delete button, which was right here. So we'll just grab all of that backspace and I'll put our delete button right there and save. Now this should not be available to Joe, but it should be available to Mark and our stakeholder, Dan. So let's check that out now inside of Chrome. I'll pull Chrome up and let's view, we're logged in as Joe. So let's view the tech notes, pulled up Joe's only tech note right now. And if we go to the edit form, he has a save button, but not a delete button. And that's what we wanted to see. So now let's log out and check the same for Mark. Sign back in, go to tech notes. Let's go ahead and look at any one of these notes. Let's look at Joe's again. So Mark can delete Joe's tech note if he needs to. So that's what we needed there for that last user story. So we have made a lot of progress today and I think we're through most of our user stories. We can check off more of those in the next lesson. And also in the next lesson, we'll be doing a little bit of code review and refactor, and then we'll deploy everything, the back end and the front end as we wrap up our MernStack project series. Today's lesson will have two code repositories, one for the front end and one for the back end of our MernStack project. Our starter code for the back end is the completed source code from lesson eight, which is the last time we worked on the back end REST API. I've got the package JSON open for our back end code now, and I'm just going to change lesson eight to lesson 12, and then I'm going to put a dash and put BE for back end, because we're also going to have a repository for the front end. When creating projects, I don't get a traditional code review like I would working on a team. But the nice thing is, is I release lesson by lesson and build a playlist on YouTube or wherever you've watched the video, I get feedback and questions and I'm able to answer those questions, give responses, look up details. And sometimes viewers catch things that I may have overlooked or they think about things in a different way. That's actually one of the things I love about teaching is because I learn as I teach as well. My students at university or just viewers on YouTube help me see things in a different way. So I've had some, some questions as I've built this playlist for our MernStack project, and they've identified some things. And a code review and building in public can, of course, make you go, I am not perfect, and I know I'm not perfect, and there are some things we need to correct today. So thank you in advance. Well, I say in advance, thank you for previously reviewing those things, and thank you in advance for anything you help me with in the future. I do sincerely appreciate it. Now, what we're going to look at first are the controllers, and that's when I really started to get some comments when we were building the logic for the controllers, specifically the notes controller and the users controller. So let's look at this notes controller first. And what we'll look for is the duplicates area. So we can do control F and we can just search for duplicates for when I was searching for duplicates. And well, I guess not with an S, but just duplicate. And there we can find it in the file. You could also just go to the controller directory here and then right click and choose find in folder. And then you could just search duplicate and it will find everywhere we looked for a duplicate in these controllers and then we could bring that up and that's a good way to do that. Now the first thing I actually want to do is go to the model because I was asked instead of looking for a duplicate title for example or in the user we were doing usernames why not just set that to unique. Well unique does help but it creates an index and that will provide a duplicate key error when we attempt to save a record that would need to catch a duplicate but but we're not sending, you know, that user friendly error like we have in the controllers. When I look back here, let's find the user area here and we're sending specific messages and status numbers for these error messages. And so we were getting some granular control, some specific control over that. And we would have to do that in a different way 
if we base that, say, on setting that unique or some of the other things we might do where we would only catch the error when we attempted to save the new user, for example, and we find that here as we go, oh, here's created. This was actually user.create. But other places where we update, I believe we save as I scroll down here and look, yep, await user.save in the update that we see here. So we would be catching the errors there in a try catch block. If you remember in the controllers, we used an async handler. And so that catches those errors instead of using a try catch for the await. And if we're not expecting the errors, the ones that we did not already anticipate that we're grabbing and sending the specific errors that we defined, and of course those user-friendly messages, then they get kicked out to our error handler middleware that we created in the middleware directory here. And then it sends whatever the error is that's generated, not always quite as user friendly. So that's why I took this approach. I wanted to handle all of the errors that we could, that we expected, that we knew we might get, and send the specific error messages and status uh, HTTP status numbers, like 400 here, for example, or we'd have a 409 for conflict, I believe, when we have a duplicate. Yep, there we have that. And I wanted to send those specifically and have control over that. So that answers some of that, like why we didn't specifically use unique. But another reason is unique doesn't necessarily check for case sensitivity. And that's the second thing I need to bring up that I got called out on and it's correct. I'm busted on that one. I should have checked for case insensitivity and I didn't. So in other words, if we put in a name like capital D at the beginning of Dave for a username, and then we put in Dave all lowercase, they would be different. Unique wouldn't catch that and we would allow two Daves to have that username. So we want to make that search case insensitive, in other words, instead of case sensitive. Now I'm currently in the user's controller. I can highlight that here in the file tree. So let's make the change here first. That will adjust our search and make it case insensitive. And I've received several suggestions on how to do this also, as far as just setting everything to lower case or requiring that on the input. But then of course our users would have to say, they just want lower case and we wanted to go ahead and allow uppercase letters or I wanted to for this project. So I didn't do that. A regex was also suggested and you could set the case insensitivity on the regex. That would be another good solution. However, there is a solution that is documented for MongoDB and the MongooseJS documentation links directly to MongoDB for that and it will easily adjust this for us. So all we need to do is find our initial search for that duplicate. So let's go ahead and search for duplicate in this file once again. And we can see we found five of nine, so it's in at least a couple of places. Here's the first area right here. So let's see what we're in. We're in the create new user handler here inside of our user's controller. And we're just going to change our find one that we have looking for this duplicate. Right now it says await user.find one. We pass in the username. We have lean because we don't need to get the entire object back. We're just checking that username. Then we execute that. But what we can do is use a collation. And then you just have to add what strength you are providing for the search. And we can chain it right in here. I'm going to press Alt Z so this wraps. So now you can see we have the find one and the username. And then I've added this collation, and I will link to the documentation in the description for this. But you must provide the locale property here. And after that, you can set a strength. And we'll just go ahead and set that to two. And there's several things that that does. One of the things that it does is it checks for that case insensitivity. So simply by chaining this to our find one request, and then of course having lean and exec after, this will fix our problem and it will check all capital letters or all lowercase letters, it doesn't matter, two Daves will still be identified and only one person will be able to have the username Dave no matter the capitalization or the lowercase. So let's go ahead and find the other instance that we're looking for a duplicate in this file and let's apply the same there. And here we are on line 72 now. Let's see what we're in. This is in the update user. Once again, we're looking for a duplicate here. So we want to put 
that right after the find one. I'll just paste that collation in and that will work. Okay, now let's go to the notes controller and make this same adjustment for where we look for duplicates there. And let's make sure we're on the first instance of duplicate. There we are. So we have note, find one, and we can put the collation. It's the identical code. There's nothing that changes here that's different than where we put it in the user controller. It's just a collation with the locale property. I'm setting it to EN for English, and you could set yours differently if you want to. And then we have strength, and it's set to two. And after we find that one, let's go ahead and find the next time we use duplicate. And it's here probably inside of the update note, just like we had update user. And we'll put that here as well and save. Okay, another review comment that I had was we have a default in the user model. And that default has employee set here. And we have a string for the array. Now it said the comment I received, and they're correct, that if we provide this default, we don't really need to require a default role to be sent or the role's value to be sent at all when we create a user. And I remember going through that tutorial and I said, I'm going to require the roles anyway. It doesn't hurt a thing, but we can fix that so the default is available. However, I believe in our front end code, we've already required the roles, so it's not a big deal, but I did just wanna show how to do that. And I also wanted to fix something here in the schema as I went over that. And this is worth noting because we actually uh, put this in differently than it should be, and I just didn't catch it before. So this is good to note right here. What we want to have, instead of having the array here around everything, we'll put roles, have an object, then we'll say type string, and we'll just put the word string inside of this array right here. After that, we'll have a default, and we'll also put the default value inside that array like you see there. Okay, now that we've made this change to our user schema, and I'm going to save this file, let's go back to the user's controller and let's find the create new user method once again. I'm scrolling up, here we are on line 24 in the user's controller for create new user. So we can just make a couple of changes here that will not require the roles, but we'll still use them if they are received like we are getting here from the request body. So here's where we were requiring those and saying all fields are required. Well, we can change this then if we're not going to require the roles to be received and just remove this last part of the conditional. So now we're just checking to make sure we've received a username and a password. After that, let's just scroll down to where we create our user object. And now there just needs to be a little bit of conditional logic right here instead of always sending the username pass the hashed password and the roles as we create a user. So I'm going to change this and we're going to use a ternary statement. And I'll just put this in and save so you can see the better formatting. And here we're creating the user object and we're providing a conditional here, basically the same conditionals that we took out up above. And now we're saying if these are true, if one or the other, then we're going to do this where we just send the username and the hashed password. So this means if we do not have an array of roles or if we have an array, but it doesn't have any length, essentially nothing's in it, then we're just going to use the username and hashed password. Otherwise, we're going to do what we were doing before, send the username, the hashed password, and the roles as we create the user. So that easily makes the change for the comment I received on that. And of course, like I said, you don't have to because in our front end code, we were definitely requiring the roles, but this just makes it a little more thorough and shows, yes, that can be done. I did also receive a couple of comments about why I was choosing for for instance, save instead of using, say, find one and update or find one and delete, where I was just using, say, find by ID or find one, and then later on actually saving the changes as we see here in the update user. And I've got a couple of reasons to explain that. One is, again, I wanted that granular control or more control, you could say, to give those specific error messages where it as if I was using the find one and update, essentially we'd be trying to do everything at first. I wouldn't be checking any of this beforehand, and then I would be handling errors afterwards. And that brings me to my second reason. Then I would have to use a try catch block instead of using the async handler that we had before that would kick those errors out to our error handler middleware immediately. Using the try catch, we would have to handle those errors afterwards 
And of course we could give different reasons inside of the catch and then we'd have to pass the error to next. So it could be done, it's just a different way of doing it. Also, I guess a third reason here is when I teach things, I tend to do one step after the other, not so declarative. And sometimes when I'm just coding for myself, I may be a little bit more declarative, but it's easier for me to walk students through steps one by one. So that is a, another good reason that I didn't just try to do everything at once. So we walked through each step here, everything that I would look for in a controller, each error message that I would send back, and eventually we save our changes and of course send a successful message. And just one final note for our backend code, and this will impact the controllers, and it's our use of async handler. We're bringing this into each controller, we're wrapping our methods that have async await. And of course, if there is an unexpected message, because this async handler lets us avoid using try catch blocks, but if there is an error that we didn't expect, of course, like here's the 400 we are expecting that says no users found, but if there's something we didn't expect and it gets kicked out, then it goes to our error handler. But there is another package I have discovered that is actually easier to implement than this async handler. It doesn't require us to wrap every method, but it is easily applied by just requiring the package in your server.js. So you don't have to make this change. Our async handler is doing the exact same thing. I would just recommend it for the future because it's easier to use. If you do want to implement it, we will need to remove the async handler and anytime we wrapped it around a method inside of our code. So I won't walk through doing each one of those, but I will show you how to install the new package and what the name of that package is. So let's go to the package JSON. I'll scroll up here so we can see our dependencies. And then I'm going to control backtick. And then I'm going to say npm i, and then it is express, I can spell express, dash async dash errors instead of handler. I'm going to go ahead and install this. And then all we need to do is require it at the top of our server JS. So I'm going to close the terminal so we can see just a little bit better. And I want to put it before the port, but after that it's fine. So we could just require it right here. And as long as it's required, and I guess because we're doing the same with .env instead of having it right here, I'll just put it at the top underneath the .env require. And then it just applies itself everywhere in your application. So you do not need to do what we did with the async handler that you see being imported into each one of the controllers and then wrapped around each method. So I'm going to remove those you, and then I'll come back to the code. You can do the same if you want to, or for this project, if you want, you can just leave your async handler in there. I'm also going to uninstall the express async handler. And I guess I could do that now to show you in the package JSON as well. So that would be npm uninstall, and then you just name the package. So express async handler. Again, only make this change if you want to. Okay, I have removed all the instances of Express Async Handler from my controllers. I'll just show you one for example. No import at the top of the auth controller now. Previously, the login method had the Async Handler wrapped around it, and I have removed that as well. And I've done that for all of the different methods in each of the controllers that were using the Async Handler. So no import and no wrapping the async handler around any method if you're using the package express async errors now. And again, the only thing you need to do to use express async errors is it required at the top of your server JS. So yes, a nice change to a different dependency if you want to make that change. One more change to our backend code and then we'll be finished and able to move on to the front end repository. But this change is going to be inside of our middleware and in our error handler. And this is something we need to do because of how we're handling errors in Redux and RTK query. Right now, if an error gets kicked to our error handler, it sends the message and that's pretty much it. So we don't know what the status is going to be. It's kind of a mystery status and we figure it out along the way. And if we don't know it, we set it to 500, which is a server error. But what we do need to do is one extra flag that RTK query is going to look for and that is to be is error is true. 
Now, the other errors that might be encountered, RTK query will already know their errors, but we want these messages from our error handler to specifically be flagged as errors, and we'll be able to handle this as we validate the status back in our API slices in the front end code. So this is just something we would need to communicate to the back end developers if you were working on a team that, hey, uh, we're using Redux with RTK query, and any unexpected error, it would be nice if you could set is error to true for us. So I'll go ahead and save that. And with that final change, we're finished with the changes to the back end code. So now let's move on to the front end repository. Now we're at the starter code for our front end repository. And the last time we worked on the front end was just in the previous lesson, lesson 11. Let's just go ahead and change this to lesson 12 in the package JSON and save our file. Now from there, the first thing we need to discuss is what is in the notes and the user's API slice. Unfortunately, we have a few more changes to make to the front end, so we better get started quickly and we'll go to the features directory and let's go to the notes and now we can scroll down to the notes API slice. Now something that I overlooked that a viewer kindly pointed out to me was the validate status I put in here. I put it outside of the query and it hasn't heard anything. Our app has been functioning. However, it's actually a property that belongs to the query. Right now, I'm just giving the query the notes endpoint here, the address to attach to the base URL. We need to change this and apply the validate status and then we'll identify notes here with a URL key. So let's go ahead and highlight this full query right here under Git Notes, you can see when I paste this in now, it's going to look just a little different. Now we have a parentheses and an object, and here we say this is the URL, and there's notes, and now we have our validate status here. Now coming just from the back end code where we made that other change, if we have an unexpected error, we're not sure what the response is going to be, then it goes through this validate status process. And notice we say, if we do not have result.isError, and that's specifically why we were setting that is error to true in the error handler middleware in the back end, so it would catch right here, which will allow us to display the error message that we get. Something else worth noting while we're in here is that if you've got an error about response.data and map not being a function, well, that means you do not have an array at this point. That response data has to be an array to map over it. So you could check to see if you have an array here and do an early return. I'm not going to put that in because I'm going to say, look, you need to know what errors you're receiving. And of course, this validate status helps with an error that you might not expect as well. So if it's not coming from your error handler or it's an unexpected error, well, then you just need to have control of that data and you should always be receiving an array here. So you could put in a check for an array, but you're going to have other problems right afterwards with the provides tags as well, for example. And you really just need to have an array at this point. So make sure that back end is sending the expected response. And if it's not the expected response, it should be an error. Okay, let's save these changes to the notes API slice. And let's do the same to the user's API slice because I made that same validate status mistake right here where I had it outside of the query. So I'm going to go ahead and adjust that. And now we have our user's URL and the validate status is part of the query object. Okay, now I'm going to close these files, but we're going to go up and look at our prefetch component that is inside of the auth directory. Now this has definitely been working for us. I'll press control B so we can see it a little easier here. And what it's been doing is initiating the state for Redux. And so it's made sure that these queries have all of their data ahead of time. And of course we can even refresh the page and it grabs that data again quickly, but it is using the initiate. We need to break away from the actual Redux that we're used to using, because then when I pull in this data later, say in the note component or in the edit note component, for example, we're using the use selector and then we're passing in a selector. But what we really need to do is use the RTK query, use get notes query that also runs. And then of course we can select results from that. We don't have to request that data again. And we can use this prefetch component to instead of putting that initial state with initiate into Redux, we can use it to actually prefetch. And it makes it just a little bit easier actually. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to 
remove the console logs as well. And I'm just going to paste in what we do, and I'll save this so it comes over, but what we do to actually use a prefetch that is built in. And we can prefetch those hooks that we are using. So we have the notes API slice dot util dot prefetch. And then we identify the endpoint. And we have a get notes endpoint and a get users endpoint. Now let's go ahead and pass in an argument to name these, just like we did in the hooks query, notes list and users list. And of course, then they will be the same subscriptions. And that subscription is what a component does. It says, hey, I'm using this data to Redux. And so it is subscribed while the component is mounted. After it unmounts, it holds the data by default for 60 seconds, but we've shortened that up in our slice by saying keep unused data for only five seconds. I'm also passing this force true here, so that means anytime it comes to the prefetch, even if it has that previous data, it's going to query it. So that just forces that query, even if the data already exists in there. We can also just remove this return. There's nothing to unsubscribe from here. This is just a prefetch. So I'll remove that return so we don't have to clean up. That is the cleanup function of use effect. And we can pretty much get rid of the empty spaces if we want to as well. I guess I could bring use effect down one so it's a little easier to see from the prefetch. But there we have changed our component. Now this is going to break a few things right now, so we'll need to change those as well. And we'll see those in those children components from our list. Right now, we'll just be prefetching those hooks that we have in the users list and the notes list. I'm going to show the file tree again, and let's go to the package JSON, because as we go through some of these child components like the edit note and the edit user, I want to add a spinner as well. So let's just go ahead and add that dependency, and as we're editing those different components, we can add the spinner in also. So control back tick to open up the terminal, and npm i, and then react dash spinners. And this is a nice package that provides some predefined, some already created essentially spinners that we can apply inside of our project. And so now we see React Spinners has been added as a dependency. Now let's go to our note component. And what we need to do is actually use the data we already get from our notes list query right here. We have use get notes query inside of our notes list. But then when we pass it to note, what we've currently been doing is using the use selector and passing in a selector. Well, we're changing this approach now. So we won't have the use selector or select note by ID. So let's go ahead and remove those. And then in its place, let's go ahead and import our use get notes query that we're using inside of our list as well. But we're not going to have to query all that data again, because what we can do to define note instead of this use selector, and I'll delete that and just paste in the difference, and we'll look at how this works. We can define our note from the use get notes query that we have in the notes list, and we're naming it the same. But then it has this function called select from result. So we already know we have a result, and we're getting the data from that. Now remember, we have our data broken into an IDs array and then entities. And what we want is the specific note. So we're passing in the note ID. And then here, we're just defining the note when we select from result. This is a selector, essentially, for our use get notes query data. And here we have data.entities and then we're providing the note ID. And that gives us the note in the same way. There's no other changes to be made here. We're just getting that data in a different way. So we'll save this, and now we should still be able to have all of these notes, and we're only making the one query with use get notes query. This will not create a separate query or network request, I should say. It will get this note from the data that is already queried. And while we're in the note component, there's one other optimization we can make. So let's go ahead and add it as well. We'll say import, and this is going to be memo, and it comes from React. You may have heard this referred to as react.memo, where we would just import React and then use dot notation to use memo. But we can just destructure memo this way as well. Now at the bottom of this component then, we need to go ahead and put that in place, and I'm going to say const memoized, 
note and then set that equal to memo and then pass in the note we have created. We'll create some space here as well. And then instead of default here for the export default note, we will go ahead and export the memoized note. Now this component will only re-render if there are changes in the data. Now let's do the same to our user component. So we are no longer using the use selector or select user by ID. And instead, I will import use get users query. And then from that, we can get rid of where we're currently defining the user with the use selector. And instead, I'll paste in once again, our use get users query. We select from result and we get the data and then we get the user that we need. After that, we can also import memo here. And let's get that from React there in our list. There we go. And then we can scroll to the bottom and I'll create an extra line here and I'm going to define const memoized user, set this equal to memo, pass in the user, and then our default export will be the memoized user here. And I should add, if you're not familiar with how React Memo works, I do have a separate tutorial on that that I'll link to in the description as well. Now let's move on to our edit user component. And we have a few changes we can make here. At the top, I've got the imports we need. So I'll put in the use get users query once again. And then I'm also going to import a pulse loader from that React spinners package that we added as a dependency. And you can see it has react spinners slash pulse loader, which is one of the choices. And I'll put a link to that full package in the description. Also, you might want to make a different choice than the pulse loader. That's what I'm going to use. I'll get rid of that space. And we can once again define our user inside of this component. And it's going to be just a little bit different because notice we have an ID now that we're passing instead of an ID that comes in here. We're getting it from the params, which would be in the URL. And so then we can use that select from result and we pass the ID here instead of being destructured as a prop, it comes from the use params. And either way, we still end up with the user. And now I'll scroll up just a little bit and I'm going to change some of this logic that we have here. No longer going to use the ternary. I'm going to say, if we do not have a user, we're just going to return that pulse loader. That means it is probably still loading. If not, we're going to of course create the content and then return that content. Now let's move on to the new note component in the notes directory. And we'll once again import what we need at the top. This is the use get users query. Notice that even though we're in the new note, we're pulling in the users because we need those users when we create a note to assign the note to a user. And once again, we're going to replace the use selector and the select all users selector and we'll put in our select from result using the use get users query here. Now that means we do not need these imports. I should go back and check that. Of course, in the last component we were in, I may have forgotten to remove the old imports. But after we define the users, I'm going to change one other line here, and that's because we're going to use that pulse loader again. So instead of saying not currently available, we'll put the loader here if the users do not have length. And then we, of course, have the content equal to the new note form and return the content. Let's quickly go back and see if I have some old imports at the top. And I do. We don't need the use selector or select user ID here inside of the edit user component. How about the user component? It's fine. And the note component looks like it's fine too. So we're good there. And now let's move to the edit note component. Now I had a separate question on this component that I received and it said, hey, we could use one more layer of security other than what I put in in the last lesson, which was about uh, role-based access control and permissions. And this would be what if an employee tried to edit a note that isn't available to them through a role just by changing the note ID in the URL. Now you'd like to think your employees aren't malicious and that it might even be hard for them to get whatever note ID would exist that they would want. However, we can go ahead and programmatically correct that or look for that. So let's go ahead and do that while we're here. So I'm going to add a few imports at the top. We'll notice we've got four imports here. We've got the use get notes query and the use get users query. We're also going to bring in our use auth hook and then that pulse loader that we're going to use. And we can get rid of the selector, select note by ID and select all users. 
And we can also get rid of use selector. So let's delete all of those. And now let's go ahead and put this code into place. I'll just start by replacing how we're defining the note and users here and paste in a destructure from our use auth hook and then also how we define the note. And I'll save that, but we still need to handle the users. So now I'll put that underneath and let's look at the information that we're getting here. We'll quickly break it down in case anything is different. So we're bringing in the username, is manager, and is admin. Of course, we're using that use auth hook to make sure for that situation that I described where an employee could still possibly enter a note ID in the URL and get access even though their role didn't permit them. So we're going to prevent that from happening. Here we're getting the note and we're getting that ID from use params once again to define the note. Now, when we get the users list, we're doing this a little bit differently, and we should have done that in the last component too for new notes, and that is we're mapping over that data, the IDs array that we get back. That is iterable, the entities are not, so we need to map over the IDs array. For each ID, we're grabbing the entity, which is the user, and putting it in a new array, and so users ends up being a users array for us here. And if we look back at new note, that is the same thing we did here, which I didn't review quite as thoroughly, but it's the identical thing. We end up with a user's array. So we can save those changes. And now we're going to change this content line here. So I'll highlight this and put in a few changes. Again, this is somewhat to prevent that uh, possibility of an employee entering in a note ID into the URL and still gaining access to it even though their role didn't permit them. But the first thing we're doing is making sure we have a note and that we have a user's array with some values in it and we're returning the pulse loader if we don't. So we may briefly see that while we're waiting on this data. After that we're checking to see if we do not have a manager or we do not have an admin and if we don't have either one of these we're just going to pass along this second conditional here, which we could chain, but then we'd have to put this twice, like uh, is manager and this, and then is admin and this. And by nesting this, we just have to do this once. So we're checking to see if we have an admin or manager. And if we don't, then we're checking to see if the notes username matches the current username that we get from use auth. Now, if they don't match, then we return no access. So that solves our problem. Other than that, we define the content and return the content here. Okay, so we've made some big changes into how we get the data. Now we're not pre-populating Redux, and that is going to let our queries use the data that we get from the use get users query and use get notes query in the lists to be reused in the child components. And that works out just a little bit better. It's also going to allow us to see updates from other users, and that's very important. I'm back in the backend code now in a separate instance of VS Code. I'm going to start the backend REST API first with npm run dev. Once we confirm it's running, then I'll go back to the front end code and I'm going to once again open up a terminal window and there I'll type npm start to start the React app and we should see it open in our Chrome browser. Okay, our app is up and running. I'm going to open up Chrome DevTools and I've got the network tab open. So let's log in as our stakeholder Dan D and this network tab is going to let us see the requests that are going out. So we're at the welcome page and now we have a request to the auth endpoint, to the notes endpoint, and to the users endpoint. So we have prefetched that data. Now, if we go to view the tech notes, another request went from our query to notes, and that's okay. So we have that data. Now let's go ahead and look at an individual note. And notice, no extra query went out. We're using the data that we already got from our use get notes query. So that is what we wanted to happen. And now I had an access token timeout, and so it hit the refresh endpoint, and we've got another notes query here. But that is due to how the timing is set currently in our backend code, which, of course, before we deploy, we want to make sure we're at 15 minutes and seven days, 15 minutes on the access token, seven days on that. So I'll want to change that. I think from lesson eight, we had it shorter. Okay, now let's go to the users and we can see we have a user's request here, 
by the way, notes is still has a polling interval of every 15 seconds, it's going to request notes again, but we've got the users. And now if I go to an individual user like our test user, it didn't put in another request to users either. So that is also working as we wanted it to. So that's great. Now let's go back to our user. Notice I've got a user here named Dave that's an employee. Let's try to create a new employee and we'll just name him Dave all uppercase and I'll just put in a simple password and let's see if we can save. And note, now we get duplicate username and that's because the collation we put in our backend code is checking for that case insensitivity. So even a lowercase Dave will match an all uppercase Dave. So that's also what we want. I'm going to quickly bring up the backend code once again. Let's go to that auth controller and I'll check the timing that we've currently got set here from lesson eight. Yep, 15 seconds on the access controller. We want something a little longer than that. So I'm going to go to 15 minutes and I'll probably need to scroll down to find the second place that is set yes 15 minutes instead of seconds it looks like we were already at seven days for the refresh token those are the numbers we want to use in for this project so now that we've set that that should change things a little bit I'll clear that out we'll log out notice on the logout we had notes because it refocused on the window and we've got a refetch on focus. But after that, we hit that logout endpoint. It deleted our secure cookie with the refresh token when we logged out. Now let's log in again and check out some state in Redux DevTools. So I'll log in with Dandy first. And once we're logged in, I'll open up our DevTools window and now let's go to Redux. And I'll pull this over so we can see the state a little bit better on the right. And let's look at this API state. And we currently have our queries that are identified as notes list and users list. And then we also have subscriptions. And we can see the subscriptions here as notes list and users list. And of course, it lists the endpoints beside those as well. Now, if we break this down, we have two subscriptions here, it looks like, and two here under Get Users. See what happens when we go to Tech Notes, and it adds some more. So now this is one for each of these notes that it created, and that's okay too, because we're using the Use Get Notes query there, but we're not creating another network request as we saw before. When we look here, we've just got notes and then once again notes there and we could log out and see all of that happen one more time so we'll go dandy log in and so now we went auth notes users we go to notes we'll see another notes request but now we look at one of these and we don't see another notes request there so requests network requests are not the same as redux subscriptions and that's important to point out but subscriptions last as long as a component is mounted. And remember, each one of these notes in the list is a note component that is mounted as well. So now instead of looking at our state here, let's go ahead and look at the profiler too. Now we can record some data as we profile. So let's go ahead and make a change to Mrs. Smith's computer problem. Although it says it's completed, we can go ahead and just maybe add another exclamation mark here to the end and save, but I didn't profile anything, so I should have hit record. So I'll hit record here and let's do this again and I'll just remove that extra exclamation mark and save. Now let's stop the profiler and let's see what we get. This is showing everything and notice we've got one of nine screens to look at. So I'll scroll all the way down. Here's our notes list. And when it rendered, because we memoized those notes, the notes did not render. So that makes it a little more optimized. Now let's go to the next changes and of course if we pull this over I think maybe I need to pull this over further dev tools at least it can see what caused this update and that says browser router so it'll give us some information as we go edit note so we were at the edit note form and every time we typed of course we got a render there and anything else we did and so it has a few renders now we've got what caused this update it was browser router when we went back but now let's look at the final one and the only render we got was the one we updated so it knew that the other two notes were not updated and we got that final update right here so our react memo is working as we expected as well okay now that we've checked our optimizations i'm going to make this full screen and i'll go ahead and log out and we want to go back to the code there's just a few other changes we could make so here is our react code 
and we can leave it running as far as that goes. I'll just close the terminal window. And one thing I'm going to do, I'll collapse these directories over here in the file tree, but I'm going to highlight this source directory and we could find in all the folders anywhere we have a paragraph that starts with loading and then dot, dot, dot. And that's usually what I would want to replace with that spinner we included. And so I will go through and do all of these, but just to let you know, you could search for that as well. Or you could also search for that if is loading that seems to appear at all of those. So check if is loading and then look for all of those in files and you may want to replace what you have there with one of those spinners instead. Again, I'm not going to show you that I change every one. You can just do it and you can trust that I did it as well. Okay, one final change today. I'm going to bring the browser back up. Notice at the top, because a React app is truly a single page app that we make look like it has multiple pages by using React Router, but notice the title is always React App, and that's what's set in our basic HTML page that's in the public directory. However, we can create a hook that changes this for each React router page we visit. So let's go ahead and do that. That's one nice little addition to add at the end of our project. I'll go back to the file tree, and now we'll go to the hooks directory. We're going to create one more custom hook, and we'll call this useTitle.js. Now inside of use title JS, I'll just paste what I have and go over it. We need use effect from React, and then we're going to receive a title, whatever we want the title of the component to be that is currently displaying a page. And then we'll use use effect here. We'll get the previous title by selecting document.title, that's from the DOM, and then we're setting the document.title to the new title value. We're storing the old one in previous title. Our cleanup function restores the previous title to the document title. So whenever the component unmounts, it sets the title back to whatever it originally was. And we're just looking for changes in the title. Now this is a true side effect. It doesn't have anything else it's returning from this hook. And it's really, in my mind, kind of the perfect React hook. It does a simple thing and it sets things back to the way they were with the cleanup function when it is finished. So a nice little hook there that we call use title. And let's just apply it in the app.js and you can apply it throughout the rest of the project where you want to and you can trust that I will do the same as well. So we're going to import use title. And now that we have use title, this would be our main page. And so we just want to put the, the name of Dan's business, which is Dan D repairs. So we can just say use title and we'll pass in Dan D repairs. And that's really all you need to do to set the title of the page you're on. So we would have other ones like notes list, the uh, users list, things like that. You might want to start all of those with tech notes or something that indicates you're in the back end where employees log in, those protected pages. And you can do what you want. And of course, you can check the source code that I'm going to link to in the course resources for mine. But right now, let's pull up Chrome once again. And now you can see we've changed from React app at the top to Dandy Repairs. And so our use title hook is working. Okay, I thought I might get the chance to deploy everything today, but we're going to carry it over to one more lesson where we're going to deploy the back end code and then deploy the front end code and take everything online and make sure it's working. And of course, there's a few changes you need to make as you deploy your project as well. Our MernStack project is essentially complete and we're ready to deploy both the front end and back end code repositories. There's just a few setting changes that we need to make first. And we're going to start in the front end code base and that is from lesson 12, at least our starter code. So let's just change to lesson 13 here in the package JSON and we can save that change, but we need to add one more dependency. And I know you think this is fairly late in the game to do that, but you'll see why we're doing this one. Let's type npm i, and then we need the at symbol, and then f vilers slash disable dash react dash dev tools. And this dependency will do exactly what the name says. We're going to disable react dev tools for our deployment. Okay, now that we have added that, and I'll close the terminal, you can see we've got that new dependency right here. Now we're going to apply that in the index.js. So let's open up the source directory and go to the index.js file. I'll get rid of this extra line we have here between the imports. 
going to add this extra import here. This is import, and then it is disable React Dev Tools, and you can see it comes from at fviler slash disable React Dev Tools. Once we have that, we can put it into place. It doesn't go inside of the render, it can actually go above. We'll type if process.env. Node env, and then we'll say equals with three equal signs production. So this only happens in production mode. Then we will disable React Dev Tools. So we just call that right there. And that's all we need to do to implement that. But this will disable React Dev Tools in our production mode when we have deployed our application. So now to go with that change, let's go to the app directory and then we'll go to the store.js. And this is for Redux. And notice we have DevTools set to true here. Let's just change that to false inside of our store.js. And now this disables Redux DevTools. And finally, let's go inside the API directory to the API slice, and we need to change our base URL value. You can see we still have it set to localhost port 3500. Well, this is going to be HTTPS now, and we're going to host our application on render.com. And I can already just put in what the API address will be. So we're going to call it technotes-api, and then it will be at .onrender.com. And after that change, we are ready to deploy. The first step in deploying our code will be ensuring that it is on GitHub, and we need to do that with Git. So we're going to initialize a repository. If you already have a code repository, by the way, with Git and GitHub that you're doing with this project, you could skip this part, but I'm going to quickly show how I push the code to GitHub. So we'll have git init, and after we initialize a repository, I'm just going to add all of the code with git add and a period, or dot. We've added all the code now, so let's commit this. So we'll say git commit and dash m for message, and we'll just say ready to deploy. And after that, we need to have a repository on GitHub to push our code to. So let's go to GitHub, let's create a new repository, and we'll just call this repository Tech notes, and we'll scroll down and click Create Repository. After that, we get a page that tells us what we need to do to push the code. And we have an existing repository on our computer, so we can do this from the command line. We need these three lines. I can just click the little icon over here to copy all three. We can go back to VS Code now. And in VS Code, I'm going to expand this so we can see more of the terminal. And if I right click, it will paste all three in, and I'll just press enter. And we are pushing our code to GitHub, and it should now be there. So we can go back to GitHub, and I'll scroll up, and I'll click on Tech Notes. And here's our code. So it is now in my GitHub account. And then I can go to render.com, and that's where we're going to deploy our code. And now what I need to do is create an account if I don't have one. Now I already have, so I have a dashboard link here that's just ready to go. But you need to create a free account. It does not ask for any payment information, and that's one thing I like about this for students. You can just set up a free account without having to provide a credit card or anything like that. And after you do, you may have to confirm your email address. You may want to pause the video and do all of that to get your account set up. But then you should have access to a dashboard. So I click dashboard and I don't have anything deployed here yet. So now I have options, static sites and web services. We're going to do one of each today. Our React app is a static site. So I'm going to click new static site and it says connect a repository. So one thing you'll do when you set up your account is connect your render.com account to GitHub. And you can see mine's already connected over here. So you wanna make sure you do that. After you connect GitHub to render, and you could probably log in with that if I remember right, but double check that. Either way, once you have your GitHub connected, you can see your repositories here and you can see tech notes from my GitHub account is right here, so I just want to click Connect. Now I'm connecting the repository, and now I need to put in a name here. And so I'm going to do the same thing. I'll call it Tech Notes. And then it has a few other questions. 
I'm using the main branch of my code repository. Now here's where we need to put in the build command and render.com defaults to yarn. If you use yarn, you're probably already set up, but since I'm using npm, there's a change or two we need to make here. So instead of yarn build, it's going to be npm run build. And that goes along with the scripts in our package JSON. And after that, it says the publish directory. Well, that is the build directory for a React app, I believe. So we can just leave that where it is. And we're pretty much ready to go. I'll scroll down and we click create static site. Now this will start to show us how it builds the site. And this takes just a little while. So once it gets going, it shows in progress here. And you can watch everything that's happening here on the server. And this will take a while. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and jump to the end, but you can set and watch the entire thing for your application if you want to. Okay, I'm back and you can see it says your site is live and it did take a few minutes compared to where we were. And that's okay, even after it says your site is live, you might give it just a little bit of time and that's fine. But let's scroll the window back up and it gives us our URL right here, which is technotes.onrender.com. And we can copy it, or I could just right click and open in a new tab. Once we do that, we've got our Dandy Repairs web page. And the whole app is not going to work, just the public pages will for now. We haven't even deployed the back end. So we can see this, we can go to the login, at least look at the page. So it is deployed, it's just not going to work yet. Now we need to make a few settings changes to the back end code and deploy it. Now I've got the back end code base open and I'm of course, I have the lesson 12 code once again, so let's just change this to lesson 13 and save that file. But now let's jump to our allowed origins. And if I remember right, that's in the config directory. And there we go, alloweds.js. We want to make some changes here. Now, if Dan D, our stakeholder, had a URL like the dandrepairshop.com, of course, that's what we would use. And it would probably have the three W's and then not have the three W's as well. So we would want to provide both of those if it was available both ways. However, that's not what we have today. What we have was our tech notes, then dot on render dot com. So we'll go ahead and remove the dandy repair shop URL. And we can also remove local host. We do not want anybody else to be able to access this application from the local host dev environment on their computer. So we'll also save that. Now our allowed origins is really just one origin for this deployment. After that, let's look at the core's options. And this is a decision that needs to be made here. And do you want to leave the origin in, or essentially if it does not have an origin is what I should say, if, do you want to leave that in or not? Because that will leave it accessible to an application like Postman, something that's running from the desktop that does not have an origin URL. So you need to make that decision whether you want that in there or not. For today, for me, I'm just going to leave this in here, but you might want to remove it for deployment, especially if you were doing this for a customer. Okay, after that, the only other thing I want to highlight is we do have the .env file that should not be put to GitHub. You do never you never want to share your environment variables on GitHub. So that should be listed in your git ignore file. .env should definitely be in a .git ignore file before we do anything about pushing the code to GitHub. Okay, now that I've gone over that, let's go ahead and open up a terminal window again, and I'm going to initialize a git repository. So git init and once we have that initialized, I'll git add and dot just to add all of the code and then git commit dash m. And here I'm going to say ready to deploy back end. And now that I've committed all of the code, we're ready to go back to GitHub in our browser. So let's do that. And we're here at the tech notes repository. Now let's create another new repository for the back end code. So I can go to my repositories and there it has the new button as well. So I'll create a new one and I'm going to call this technotes-api. And now that that repository name is available, we'll scroll down and create that repository. It shouldn't take long. We once again get the code that we need to run from the command line to push our code to GitHub. So I'm going to copy that 
go back to VS Code, and in VS Code, I'm going to expand the terminal just so I can see everything. And when I right click, it puts all three lines here inside of the terminal. I just need to press Enter once, and it's going to push my code to GitHub. And it should be complete. We'll go back to Chrome, and let's see if we have the code inside of GitHub now at the technotes-api. There it is, and now we should be able to find it inside of our render.com account when we click new. So let's click new, and now this will be a web service. This is going to be a Node.js REST API. And you can see we have technotes-api available right here, so we will connect. And now let's provide a name here, and I will just say technotes-api as well. Looks like the Node environment, that seems fine. Your region may be different than mine. The branch will be main. And now we have a build command to put in. And for our node project here, this will be npm install. So this will install all of the dependencies that, is, that are needed. And then we have a script here. And instead of saying node server JS, we can just say npm start because we have the start script in our package JSON. From there, let's scroll down and you can see it has the current free plan highlighted and that's exactly what we want. So let's just create a web service. Once we do this, we'll be able to enter in our environment variables. And so as this deploys, we can see it's in progress. Let's click environment over here and we can add environment variables. You could also browse to your .env file and they will accept it that way. But I'm going to add them over here. And there's one extra one that we need to add. And that is the node version that we want to use. So I'm going to say node underscore version. Here I'm going to put 16.16.0 because that's the one we're using. After that, we need to go ahead and paste in the other environment variables we have. And that includes the database URI. That also includes the access token secret. So I'll bring that over. And then we can add one more. And that is going to be the refresh token secret. Now I will go ahead and cut away to enter my values so you don't see those and you can enter your values and come back. Okay, my values are now entered and I want to click save changes. And so those changes have now been saved. Let's look at the events tab here and you can see the deployment is changed because the environment was updated. So this is the deploy we want to watch right here. So I'll click deploy. Once again, this takes a while. This takes longer than the React app on the front end. So we'll just want to watch this. And of course, you can watch the entire thing. I'm going to cut away and come back. Okay, I am back and it has completed. And we can see the last few messages and that did take several minutes. It says build successful, but even after that, it was deploying and then it detected the node version that we put in with the environment variable and it started the service with npm start. And then we start to see things that we would normally see in the console as well. So let's scroll back up and let's look at the log, which would be the console for Node.js. And you can see the last several messages were also logged here in this console. Okay, now that we've got that, you still might want to give it a minute or two after it says it is up and running to go ahead and propagate out everywhere. But then we could go ahead and right click and we should see our splash page that we created if we launch this. And right now we still don't have the CSS. And if I reload, there we go. We've got the CSS now. So it was just getting ready to share everything. I don't like that full white page. I like the darker page myself. Okay, so now we know our Tech Notes API is up and running, and that means our front end should now be ready to interact with MongoDB and the back end that we have. So let's hit the employee login, and we'll go ahead and enter in Dan D, our stakeholder, and I'll enter in his password. If you have a different user, you can do that. And I'm going to tab on down and say trust this device as well and then sign in. We've got our spinner. I want to say never as far as saving the password for this, but everything looks like it's working as it should. Let's see if we can see the tech notes. We got those right away because we prefetched that data. We didn't even have to see a spinner to wait, and that's great. Now we can see the edit note. It seems to be working fine. So let's go back to the user list. You can see Dave is inactive on the user list and it has a different color rather than active. 
and everything seems to be working good here as well. We went to that edit user page already, so that's great. We could, of course, enter in a new note or try a new user, all of those things, but we've tested that out already. We won't spend time on that during the video. Everything seems to be good for the application, and it's nice and fast. I'm going to go ahead and log out, make sure that works too. Everything is good here. And with the deployment in place, we can bring up our user stories. I'm keeping track of this back in the front end code repository, by the way. And we have officially replaced the current sticky note system. And of course, we'd want to confirm that with our stakeholder. We did provide easy navigation and we had display current user and assigned role that was in place for a little while already we had notes can be deleted by managers or admins and that was definitely true we saw the trash can there available for dandy anyone can create a note and we had confirmed that with the employee account joe that we had created uh, employees can only view and edit their assigned notes that was true for joe as well but managers and admins can view edit, delete, do everything they should with the notes, and that is also true. Only managers and admins can see the user settings, so we could check that off. Only managers and admins can create new users. We can check that off, and desktop mode is most important, and that's essentially what we looked at with full screen, but it should be available in mobile. Let's go into Chrome, and we've got the web app open. I'll open up DevTools, and I need to click away. Yeah, Chrome has been a little buggy for me lately on the DevTools. I don't think that's anything to do with our app. Here we see it in an iPhone 6, 7, and 8. And now let's go ahead and look at maybe an iPad, if it fits in there. Yes, it looks great there too. Let's check maybe just an iPhone 6. And of course, the smallest would even be an SE. It looks like everything's fitting. Let's give one that's decent sized here. Let's get to 75% maybe. And then let's try the login. I'll once again, I'll log in as Mark, the manager. Sign in. We've got a little bit of a wait. And now we're logged in and we can view the tech notes. And of course, we don't see as many columns on the smaller mobile screen. After that, we can view, yes, we can edit the note. Let's go to users. The same here, everything looks good. There's our test user. Yes, everything is working and looking good in mobile. I think success, so we can go back and check off our last item. You might have noticed that I'm getting some console log messages as we run the app. And of course, when you deploy, you probably wanna go through your code and remove all of those. I did not do that. And that's just because it's tutorial mode. I leave a lot of those things in there to help out viewers and students. But you probably would want to remove all of the console log statements and notes like that before you deploy your application as well. Hey, success, we have checked off all the user stories and our app is functioning for our stakeholder. That's great. Now. What happens usually after you deploy an app and you meet all of those expectations, or hopefully do, they will want additional features. Now don't just say okay and do those. Of course, that's scope creep. That makes the project continue to go on, especially if you're a freelance developer. You've given your bid and you have met every expectation along the way. So you need to charge for those additional services. Don't sell yourself short. And a couple of things I could think of that might be wanted, one would be an archive for old tickets so that ticket list did not continue to grow and grow. And you might want to be able to search that archive as well. They might eventually want this to tie into some financial or billing software where they could bill each ticket directly from this application. And then also they might want to save drafts of notes as they edit a note. Say their token expires. It's been a week and they forgot to log back in during that week. Well, they'll get a notice. They won't be able to save that draft. So that's something else I would suggest. And you may think of many more things that you could add to this application. Again, just remember to don't say okay and just add the extra features without charging more. Don't sell yourself short on your effort. Congratulations though, you have completed the Mern Stack project. Remember to keep striving for progress over perfection. And a little progress every day will go a very long way. Please give this video a like if it's helped you. And thank you for watching and subscribing. You're helping my channel grow. Have a great day, and let's write more code together very soon.